Chair Tagliati, can you hear us? Testing, can you hear me? Do I need to speak up? No. I can hear you, Chair. This is Tina, the court reporter. Okay. Um, will you let me know today if, if my volume needs adjustment, particularly if I'm too loud? Okay, I will. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, if we're ready to begin. Um, first of all, I want to apologize to my fellow commissioners that I'm not there in person. I had an emergency. I can't hear you, Madam Chair. Okay, one second. Can you hear me now? No. Hmm. I can hear you. That is strange. Can you hear me now? No. Hmm. We can't hear you. We heard you just a moment ago, Madam Chair, but not the last two times. All right. Um, anyone who's not talking is muted. Can you hear me now? All right, let me log out and log back in. Sorry. Well, I can hear you. I wonder if it's just on their end because I can certainly hear you clearly. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm going to log out and log back in and see if that solves the problem. Okay. One moment. So Madam Court Reporter, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, how about members of the commission? I can't see them. No, Although, they're muted. Sorry. Yeah, they're muted. They also have no video on my feed. And nor mine. I see the boardroom in Carson. As do I. Uh, I think it's their issue. <laughs> okay, so Marie, both the court reporter and I can hear each other, see each other, and can't see you. We can only see Northern Nevada. You're also fine here in Carson City. Yeah, it's I think Jesus, Jesus is working on something down there. Okay.
you should get up soon and bring your truck over there. Get your front two tires. The system in Vegas is being restarted, okay. Chair Tagliati? Yes. Can you hear us now? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Awesome. Yes, we can. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so at this time, I would like to first um, apologize to my fellow uh, commissioners that I need to appear by Zoom today. I had an unexpected emergency that necessitated this Zoom appearance, and I certainly appreciate staff and your indulgence, so thank you for that. Um, good morning. Today is Thursday, May 19th, the time set uh, for the time and place for the regularly scheduled Nevada Commission meeting for Gaming Commission meeting for the month of May. Um, I'm going to be there in spirit while uh, you rise and join uh, Commissioner, uh, uh, Vice Chair, um, uh, Solis Rainey for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Secretary, has our agenda been posted in accordance with the open meeting law? Yes, it has. At this time, I would like to remind anyone coming to the podium to speak today that we ask that you speak directly into the microphone and speak as clearly as possible as this meeting is being transmitted electronically and being transcribed. Madam Secretary, if we could proceed with our first agenda item, public comments. This item is placed on the agenda to give the public an opportunity to comment on gaming related matters. We did receive one public comment via email from DG Swigert, and that comment has been provided to all commission members and will be attached to the disposition as part of the public record. Thank you. Anyone who wishes to address the commission today may do so at this time. Matters brought to our attention during public comment cannot be acted upon, but we are happy to hear comments of the public as well as from my fellow commissioners. Um, Comments by all will be limited to three minutes as a reasonable time, place, and manner restriction. If any of my fellow commissioners or myself ask questions of the public, the time needed to address those questions will not be held against those time constraints. I will first go to Carson City. Anyone wishing to make a public comment, please step forward to the podium. There is no one in Carson City. All right. Um, before we hear from anyone in Las Vegas, as a courtesy, I would ask Commissioner Cohen to uh, monitor the time as the reasonable time, place, and manner restriction. And um, if you could, please, ma'am, um, state your name and spell it for the record before you begin. 
Or sir. Okay. Uh, Mercedes Cabrera is going to speak in Spanish and I'm going to translate it in English. Okay. Uh, could, could, could we have yes. a full name? Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay, hold on. Uh, her name is Mercedes Cabrera, M-E-R-C-E-D-E, -E -E, and Cabrera is C-A-B-R-E-R-A. -R -R okay. Uh, buenos días, mi nombre es Mercedes Cabrera y trabajo en Green Valley Ranch Casino por 15 años. Soy kitchen worker. Tengo de comité 12 años y estoy luchando por mí y por mis compañeros porque queremos un contrato, buenos beneficios, porque no somos trabajadores de segunda clase. Queremos un retiro para retirarnos con dignidad. Necesitamos de su apoyo. Gracias. <coughs> Okay, my name is Mercedes Cabrera. I work at Green Valley Ranch Casino for 15 years as a kitchen worker. I have 12 years as a committee. I'm fighting for me, for my coworkers, because we want good contract. We, got, we want uh, good benefits because we are not second class workers. We want the pension to retire with dignity. We need your support. And then we have Benjamin Navarro as well. Thank you. Okay, if you could please spell your name. Okay. Uh, Benjamin Navarro is Benjamin B E N J A M I N. Navarro is N A R R O. Thank you. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Benjamin Navarro. Trabajo como kitchen worker en Sunset Station Casino por 24 años. Soy comité por 12 años y estoy aquí por la lucha para mis compañeros y para mí para que queremos un contrato con los beneficios igual en los casinos y el resto de la ciudad. No somos trabajadores de segunda mano. Necesitamos su apoyo. Por favor. Ok, my name is Benjamín Navarro. I am a kitchen worker at Santa Station Casino. I worked there for 24 years. I am a committee for 12 years. I am fighting for my coworkers and myself because we want a contract with the benefits the same as the rest of the city. We are not second class workers. We need your support. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to? Okay, sir, if you could please state your name yes. and spell it. Yes, I will. Um, my name is Ken Liu, K-E-N-L-I-U. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm here representing the Culinary Union today. You've just heard from two station casino workers that they want to have a union in their casinos. I just want to add for the record that in 2017, 78% of Green Valley Ranch workers voted yes for the union in 2019. 82% of workers at Sunset Station voted for the union. It is clear that they want to have a union, but the company is not respecting their votes. But primarily here, uh, I'm here to, to give you some additional update on one of the cases against station casinos pending before the National Labor Relations Board. On April 12th, NLRB Administrative Law Judge Jeffrey D. Whitkin issued a 138 decision with proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law against station casinos. Judge Whitkin's proposed remedy recommends that NRB order Red Rock Casino to recognize the culinary partners' unions and bargain good faith. An important part of Judge Whitkin's role in the case was to assess the credibility of witnesses who testified at trial, including several station casino executives. The judge found some of these executives to be not credible or reliable, even though they were testifying under oath. Here are some quotes from the judge's decision. As noted above, Chief Operating Officer Robert Finch was not a credible or reliable witness generally. Again, I discredit his testimony, both because it's contrary to the record as a whole and because of Finch's poor credibility generally. I discredit Fortino's and Nelson's testimony to the extent it indicates otherwise. Fortino here refers to the company's senior vice president of human resources, Phil Fortino, and Nelson refers to Rare Rock's general manager, Scott Nelson. To the extent Nelson's other testimony conflicts with the above findings, it is discredited as contrary to the weight of evidence. 
04. Fortino, Finch, Welch, and Cootie also specifically refused to admit that there was any discussion at the meeting regarding the underlying and bolded red points in the health insurance and retirement proposals about incentivizing employees not to vote for a union and taking away union power. Further, none of the four appear to be a credible or reliable witnesses on the subject generally. Here, Welch refers to Chief Legal Officer Jeffrey Welch, and Cootie is Chief Financial Officer Stephen Cootie. However, I discredit this testimony. As noted, Fortino and Finch were particularly poor witnesses. However, there are substantial reasons to question Welch's and Cootie's testimony regarding the overall increase in turnover from 2018 to 2019. As noted above, both provided highly questionable discredited testimony about other significant matters. Although station consent will ask the judge, the NRB, to review the judge's decision, the agency will only over, overturn his credibility findings if the clear preponderance of the evidence shows he was wrong. That, that concludes your three minutes. Okay. May I just say one concluding sentence? Uh, one concluding yes. sentence. Yes. One sentence. One sentence. I want to note that Robert Finch, Stephen Cody, and Jeffrey Welch all currently hold findings of suitability, which are revocable privileges issued by this body, the Nevada Gaming Commission. And as for Station Casino itself, the ability of a gaming license holder's executives to tell the truth certainly bears upon the company's suitability for licensing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else, Madam Secretary, present to make public comment? I do not see anyone else coming forward. All right, that will close our, our public comment section. Madam Secretary, the next item on our agenda is the approval of the prior month's disposition. Pursuant to NRS 241.035, this item is the consideration of the approval of the Nevada Gaming Commission disposition for April 2022. All right, uh, each of us has had the opportunity to review the disposition. If there are no comments or questions, I think it's in proper form for a motion. Thank you, Chair Tagliati. I move for approval of the prior month's disposition. Any discussion on the motion? There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 It appears that there are none opposed and all were in favor. Thank you. Um, so before I ask Madam Secretary to read in the first non uh, read in the um, non-restricted consent items, I uh, thought it would be helpful if we kind of set a, um, uh, in light of today's circumstances, an order for questions. So perhaps um, we, we do so by longevity on the commission. So I don't know, I believe that would be Commissioner Cohen first. Actually, uh, Vice or, Chair Solis Rainey has okay. me deep by a month. <laughs> okay. So as we go through today, rather, I would normally look to my right, look to my left, and I would I would move it around, but it's easier if we just go in order, and that would put um, Commissioner Keefer second to last and me last. Um, and so is that acceptable to you all? Just to kind of try to be a little more organized today? All right. Obviously, if you have follow up, feel free, but I'm just saying just to kind of get started on each item that we could kind of go in order that way with questions. So, um, so Madam Secretary, please read in the non restricted consent items. Your non items on non restricted consent agenda this morning are items 9, 10, 11, and 15. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval with the condition as noted on the agenda. For the record, item number four was heard by the Commission at their special meeting on May 12th. I believe we have a recusal and a disclosure on these items. All right, starting with Commissioner Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Regarding the uh, Morello transfers, uh, I believe they're items number nine and 10, nine and 10. Uh, as I've done in the past, I will be recusing based upon my prior firm representation of the entities. Okay, and so the record should reflect when you cast your vote on uh, any motion related to these consent, non-restricted consent items, you will not be voting on nine or 10, correct? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Brown? 
Thank you so much. Um, as to non-restricted consent items number nine and 10, MEI GSR Holdings LLC and Alex Morello are clients of Lewis Roca, the firm where I'm a partner in which matters I'm not personally involved. I have no pecuniary interest in the outcome of this, these agenda items and I don't believe the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in my position would be affected by the relationship described on the record. And I therefore intend to participate in both of those items. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, does anyone have any questions or comments on the um, non-restricted consent agenda items uh, listed by Madam Secretary? There being none, um, I think it's in proper form for a motion. Does anyone have a motion? Um, sure, Madam Secretary, uh, or I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I move for approval of non-restricted items number 9, 10, 11, and 15 as read into the record by uh, Secretary Bell and recommended by the Game Control Board. All right, is there any discussion on the motion? There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, and it appears there are none opposed um, and the record should reflect that Commissioner Cohen um, did not vote on items 9 and 10. Madam Secretary, please read in the restricted consent items. Your items on the restricted consent agenda this morning are items 5 through 8 and 10 through 20. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval with the conditions as noted on the agenda. I believe we have a disclosure on these items. Thank you. Um, I do have two disclosures in connection with restricted items number 10 and 11. Phyllis Gilland is an employee of Golden Entertainment, a client of Louis Roca, the firm where I am a partner in which matters I'm not personally involved. I have no pecuniary interest in the outcome of this agenda item. I do not believe the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in my position would be affected by the relationship described on the record, and I therefore intend to participate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, if are there any questions or comments on any of the um, matters, the items in the restricted consent? All right, there being none, I think it's proper for a motion. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I would move for approval of restricted items uh, five through eight and items number 10 through 20 is read into the record uh, by Secretary Bell and is recommended by the Gaming Control Board. All right, is there any discussion on the motion? There being no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, and it appears there are none opposed, all were in favor, thank you. All right, we're going to move now to the non-restricted items held out for discussion. Madam Secretary, I believe that uh, item number one, non-restricted number one, should be read. Done. Non-restricted number one are the applications of Excel Entertainment Inc. for registration as a publicly traded corporation and for a finding of suitability as sole member and manager of Excel Entertainment LLC. You also have the applications of Excel Entertainment LLC for registration as an intermediary company and for an acquisition of control and a finding of suitability as sole shareholder of Century Gaming Inc. Next are the applications of Century Gaming Inc. for a transfer of interest and the applications of Andrew Harry Rubenstein, Michael Joseph Marino, and Carl Ivor Peterson for a finding of suitability and or licensure as officers and or directors as noted on the agenda. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval with the limitations as noted on the agenda. All right, if um, we could have the first uh, person on behalf of this item step forward and state your name for the record. Sure, good morning, Chair Tagliati, Member Solis Rainey, Rainey uh, Members Cohen, Brown, Key Kepler, and Madam Secretary. I am Greg Gemignani with the law firm of Dickinson Wright, representing Excel Entertainment on the matters before you. Here with me today, we have Andy Rubenstein, President Chief Executive Officer, Carl Peterson, Chairman of the Board of Directors, Ken Rotman, member of the Board of Directors and Excel's largest shareholder, Dee Robinson, member of the Board of Directors and former member of the Illinois Gaming Board, Derek Harmer, General Counsel and CCO, Matt Ellis, Chief Financial Officer, Mark Phelan, Chief Revenue Officer, and Michael Marino, Chief Commercial Officer. Excel would like to make an affirmative presentation to tell you about the company and to provide you with an update uh, regarding activities uh, Excel's engaged in between the Gaming Control Board hearing on May 4th and this time. And at this time, I'd like to turn things over to Andy to begin the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Chair Pagliati, members of the commission and Madam Secretary. For the record, my name is Andrew Rubenstein. I am a founder and the CEO of Excel Entertainment. 
thank you for allowing me today to present to you about Excel. Joining me today, as, as stated, are members of our board of directors, our senior management team. We're here to both introduce our company and ourselves, as well as any questions that you may have. We really appreciate the opportunity to work with you as we pursue a gaming license in Nevada. We look forward to sharing more with you about us today and, and why we are excited about the opportunity to join the Nevada business community. We also plan on sharing some of the additional information on topics that came up during our May 4th hearing with the Nevada Gaming Control Board. We're pleased to see Chair Gibson, mem members Katsaros and Watkins also here again today. So to start, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Excel and how we operate in the communities where we work. Excel Entertainment was first licensed in Illinois in 2012. From the very beginning, we aim to create a culture of partnership where we work directly with our establishments and most of them are small business owners. In 2019, we became the only pure route gaming company listed publicly on a US stock exchange. This is a distinction we take great pride in, given the extra level of regulatory transparency it lends to, into our operations. Additionally, being public allows us efficient access to capital markets, which we've utilized while maintaining low debt levels. Keeping low leverage has always been an important principle of our company. Today, we are the leading route gaming company in the United States with more than 2,800 locations most of them being small businesses. These are largely single store family owned businesses looking for a deeply committed and knowledgeable partner to help them grow. We focus on this market because they much like us are entrepreneurs and we take great pride in helping them build their small businesses. We know that they have choices on who to partner with and we are extremely grateful that time and time again, they consistently choose Excel. We believe this is a testament to the value members of our team and our focus on the partnership. We're a company that's built on trust, integrity, and being a best in class partner. We see ourselves as good stewards of investors capital and a transparent and trusted gaming operator to our regulators. Supporting the local communities in which we operate is a cornerstone of our business. For example, we support military veterans in a variety of ways, whether it is by employing them or by supporting organizations that have helped serve America's veterans. In 2018, Excel began a partnership with Folds of Honor. It's a nonprofit organization that provides educational scholarships to the spouses and children of Americans fallen and disabled veterans. We are well aware that Nevada is very supportive of, of its military community. And we look forward to establishing relationships with Nellis and Creech Air Bases. This is the type of commitment and partnership that you can expect from Excel as a member of the Nevada business community. I wanna be sure to point out that none of this is possible without the Excel team of employees. We've created a culture of excellence and one that pr prioritizes integrity, safety, compliance, and accountability. I often say that the reason for our excess is because we have the best people. Over the past several years, we've had the opportunity to grow our presence nationally in states like Georgia, Iowa, and most recently, Nebraska. Leading up to the Century transaction, we've already received gaming licenses as a distributor in South Dakota and West Virginia and we are now waiting to be licensed in Louisiana. We are hopeful that we will soon be adding Montana and Nevada, which will put us in position to close the Century acquisition. Today, we're here to focus on how the, gaming, the Century gaming acquisition fits into Excel's partnership model. This is a merger that will benefit both companies as and, and will preserve all current jobs with the Century employees. As part of this merger, all existing Century management, as we recognize their expertise and strong relationship with the state of Nevada, will remain in place, including Steve Arnson, the CEO. 
In addition, Century's connection and commitment to local communities will also remain the same. What will change is Century's debt load, and it will be reduced substantially, thereby increasing its ability to invest and expand its operations in Nevada. Excel aims to become a partner to an existing business that is already held in high regard in Nevada. Together, we will leverage the vision, the values, and goals that both companies share. We look forward to helping Century continue its successful operations and its important role in Nevada for years to come. We would now like to discuss Excel's culture of compliance. I and all the senior management of Excel take compliance very seriously. I'm now going to hand the podium over to Derek Harmer, who is our expert in this area. Derek serves as both the general counsel and chief compliance officer of Excel. And in that role, he reports directly to me and, the and to the compliance committee of our board of directors. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Chair Tagliati, members of the commission, and Madam Secretary, thank you for allowing me to present to you today. I must admit, I stand a bit humbled standing before you in this room, as this room holds a special place in my career. This is the room where I took the oath of office as a Deputy Attorney General for the state of Nevada and learned the value of trust, transparency, and compliance as being a vital part of effective gaming regulation. Before discussing our compliance programs generally, I'd like to briefly outline some of the steps that we've taken since our hearing with the Gaming Control Board. In particular, we have accelerated our compliance initiatives as follows. First, we have retained Sandra Douglas Morgan and her partners at Covington and Burling to advise the company on corporate-wide matters and to provide a comprehensive review of the company's policies. We were originally introduced to Sandra last year when she joined Covington and Burling, a firm that we have a long-standing relationship with. We are excited to work with Sandra and the Covington team as we expand our US footprint. Second, we have engaged Dennis Nylander, who served as chairman of the Nevada Gaming Control Board for over 10 years, to serve as the chair of our Gaming Compliance Committee. Dennis has crossed paths with, with Carl, Sandra, Greg, and me over the years, and we're thrilled at the opportunity to be working with him again. We look forward to his leadership in shaping the company's compliance gaming program and its committee. Third, Dee Robinson, a current member of our board of directors and former board member of the Illinois Gaming Board has accepted our invitation to join Chairman Islander on our gaming compliance committee. And in furthering our commitment to Nevada, we are working with Greg Ferreira at UNLV's International Center for Gaming Regulation to implement a specialized training course for Excel that will focus on best practices for compliance, plans, audits, as well as vendor and business background checks. We've also begun researching third-party vendors to assist the company in performing background checks and to provide diligent services going forward. As we've heard loud and clear in the Game Control Board meeting, it's our responsibility to do our diligence, not rely on our regulator partners to do it for us. Last and certainly not least, we will continue to work with Greg and his team at Dickinson Wright to be our local counsel here in Nevada. As we move forward, it's important to note that our partnership involves not just local establishments, but also local, state, and federal agencies. Most importantly, our regulators, including the SEC. We made the decision to go public in 2019 to not only provide additional capital to fund the growth of our business, but also to provide an additional layer of transparency and access to our business. We solemnly undertake our obligation to adhere to all local, state, federal laws and regulations. We work very hard to maintain a compliance function that works productively with all of our stakeholders, including our regulatory agencies relevant to our business. We take this fiduciary duty very seriously. We're always looking for opportunities to improve and grow as I mentioned at the outset, since our last hearing, we've accelerated some of the items that were previously on our to-do list to illustrate that we heard you loud and clear on the steps that need to be taken to reach Nevada's gold standard of compliance. We 
are committed not only to being a good corporate citizen in Nevada, but also meeting and exceeding all of Nevada's regulatory requirements. I would now like to turn things over to Carl Peterson, our chairman of the board, and Ken Rodman, another board member, to provide some additional perspectives. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. It's nice to be back here. Uh, good morning. Uh, having been through this licensing process once before as part of Caesars and TPG and my role at TPG, I understand this rigorous process, take it very seriously, and I've always appreciated Nevada's exacting standards. I speak on behalf of our entire board when I state now our commitment to ensure that Excel will meet your standards for licensed gaming companies, and we recognize the value that that creates for licensees. We also know that this commitment requires a really a mindset of continuous improvement and a partnership mentality with our regulators. And while I believe that that has been present at Excel from day one, my role in that started with Excel um, a few years ago as part of the listing of the company on the New York Stock Exchange. As part of that listing, we sought to expand the skill set of the board who is overseeing the company in an important way because we help work for you to ensure uh, that the company's roles are being discharged um, well. And in particular, in particular, we proactively sought to add incremental gaming and regulatory expertise to our board. And so I personally would like to say thank you, Dee, uh, for joining us here today. I had a chance to meet her in early 2020. And from the moment I did, it was obvious that her expertise with small businesses, understanding their important roles in the community, and her regulatory expertise would be immediately beneficial to an important additions to our board. In that first breakfast, I recall she told me during her four year term at the IGB, she witnessed firsthand how Excel and Derek and Andy in particular demonstrated a high degree of integrity and they really set the standard for other gaming companies as they are always professional, knowledgeable, respectful, and responsive to any of their requests. She feels that Excel's leadership position directly resulted from their embodiment of those values. She also noted that the solid reputations of many other former IGB employees, both from law enforcement and legal departments, who are willing to join Excel for the same reason. She said that she too would proudly join our board and we are grateful that she made that decision. I look forward to working with her and her continued contributions and appreciate her willingness to join Dennis on the newly formed Gaming Compliance Committee as well. So in closing, I would like to reiterate my earlier comments and what Derek and Andy have said, Excel is committed at all levels of this organization to being a good Nevada corporate citizen as we strive to do in all markets where we operate. We fully expect to make all necessary investments in any uh, corporate governance decisions required to deliver on this process. And we really want to uphold century strong track record of positive relationships everywhere it operates. So I will now turn it over to Ken, who I've enjoyed working with closely for the last two and a half years. Thank you. Thank you. And it's Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> I know I used to say it that way too when I moved here. <laughs> Thank you. Madam Secretary, Madam Chair, members of the commission, very nice to see you, good morning. My name is Ken Rotman. I am stand before you in this capacity as a director of Excel. I am also the CEO of ClearVest Group Inc., which is the largest shareholder of Excel. I am the controlling shareholder of ClearVest as well. So I put a letter on record, I said in it, I hope you had an opportunity to review it. I just like to clarify a few of the points in that, in that letter. First, Clarivis has been involved in the gaming industry for 25 years across 34 different gaming assets in multiple jurisdictions, all of which have been vetted. We've been tremendously successful in the gaming industry, both for the states we operate with as well as for our shareholders. We do that by taking compliance exceptionally seriously. And we've also viewed our regulators as our partners. And we believe that our, the regulators in the states, particularly where we operate, are our partners and we're working with them on their casinos. The second point I'd like to bring up is that as a director in my personal capacity on the board of Excel, as well as a shareholder, we will continue to support all investments required to make compliance a priority and a culture of compliance develop at the company. And we'll do everything we can and I will support that. Also, I'd like to highlight Carl's comments on continuous improvement. 
getting up and up is not easily done. It is our target for a root operator to make an Excel exemplar in terms of dealing with the regulatory compliance. It won't happen on day one, but it will happen very shortly, I believe. The next point I'd like to make is, while it is true that some years ago there was a, a disagreement, which was at times animated between Excel and ClearVest, over the disagreement narrowed on when to go public and how to go public, and it was very much restricted to that point. We then met with the company and we changed the structure slightly to accommodate our needs and theirs, and we've moved forward at partners for the last three years. So the matter was resolved many years ago, and we continue to have a partnership attitude since then. The last point uh, I'd like to mention is that, uh, and I will talk about this later, but my family's had a uh, business relationship with the state of Nevada for well over 40 years. We have multiple operations in Nevada currently, right now in the defense contracting side here in Las Vegas. And we look forward to growing that relationship. But with respect to Excel, you have my full support that that company will ultimately become an exemplar for you within the root operator side of its compliance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, I know we've shared a lot of information with you today, and I hope this was helpful that you understand our business and our perspectives a little bit better. Our team looks forward to the opportunity to operate in Nevada and partner with business owners in this state. More than that, we're looking forward to becoming full members of the Nevada business community. Most importantly, we are excited to join the ranks of Nevada's gaming companies. We hope that it's clear, that it has been clear how seriously we take our compliance obligations and that we're continuing to improve our operations so that we not only meet, but exceed Nevada's standard, standard for licensure. Thank you again for your time and the opportunity to be here today. And I'm now happy to answer any questions that you may have. Commissioner Solis. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you, Chair uh, Tagliati. First of all, thank you all for being here. Um, I'll start off with uh, questions. Um, I appreciate all of the changes that you've made. I would like to hear a little bit more about this compliance committee. You said it was newly formed. Is this the first time in your company that you've had a compliance committee? So, um, no, we've had a compliance committee at the board level from the very beginning. Okay. Um, and I'll have Derek talk more about the specifics of the Nevada compliance committee. Come on. Sure, thank you for that question. So we've had a board level compliance committee since the inception of the company going public. In fact, even before that, when we were a private organization, we had a compliance committee that, that, that had members of the board on it. So it's always been a board level committee for us. Our gaming compliance committee, as we're currently constituting it, is going to be a committee that's going to report directly to that board level compliance committee, chaired by member by Chairman Islander. D. Robinson will also be on the committee, and we're also looking for additional members. How are you distinguishing the board level committee uh, that you've had with your new gaming compliance committee? So the gaming, the gaming compliance committee commissioner will be focused on those requirements that we need to meet under order of registration. The overall compliance committee is structured to also be um, to have oversight over SEC matters, sort of, sort of the larger compliance umbrella for the company. The gaming compliance committee will be more strictly targeted towards gaming matters in which the company operates. You've been operating in the gaming space though for quite a while. Um, what uh, what prompts this change? Obviously, we heard the reservations expressed at the board, and we share those. At sure. least, I, I shouldn't say we. I share those. Sure. Um, so, how did you address gaming compliance issues in the past? So. Commissioner, let me make sure I answer. I understand your question. How we, how the company has addressed gaming issues prior to the adoption of the Gaming Compliance Committee. Correct. So the board level gaming, the board level compliance committee, as one of the four committees of the board, was the place in which we dealt with gaming compliance matters. The structure and how we talked about issues and how the agenda, what was sort of worked through, is different than what will, what will be for the Gaming Compliance Committee, which will be much more structured and targeted on matters of due diligence, vendor relationships, suitability. The, the, the sort of standard fare for a gaming compliance committee for the state of Nevada. So we have 
had at the board level, a compliance committee that has been addressing and keeping an eye on gaming compliance matters in the jurisdictions where we operate. Thank you. Yeah, you heard the reservations that were expressed during the um, game control growth with respect to the manner in which you did or, or didn't do due diligence in the past, uh, the issues with respect to how you handle an anonymous notice that was uh, sent to you. You didn't address that today. I, I think, you know, obviously it's important to focus on the improvements that you've made, but I'd like to hear your perspective of why those things happened. What what worked or didn't work in your process that allowed those things to happen? Sure. So, 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 Commissioner, the easy, uh, sorry, not the easy, the the answer that is unfortunately not the best answer is is that we have been rely as part of our gaming compliance plan that we have in place. That's sort of the, the overarching plan. A measure of suit a requirement of suitability for us to have a relationship with a company was was dependent on whether they had a gaming license, and we stopped the the we did not take the diligence and the sort of vetting beyond that. And we know clearly in Nevada, we will have to do that. So that'll be a, a fundamental change for us as we look at having the ability to do our own background checks, to have vendors that can check open sources for us and give us information that we need to determine before an agency tells us we don't have to have a student association or somebody, that we look at the association, vet it through our committee, make a recommendation and stick with it. Have you reviewed your um, current contracts? to determine whether the language in there is appropriate to allow you to disassociate when needed. We have not reviewed all the contracts, Commissioner. We are, we are in the process of doing that. We're working with local counsel, Greg Yamignani, to he has the, the standard suitability language for us to be able to amend contracts, but it will certainly be in all contracts going. Now, um, that addresses the due diligence issues. Tell us what happened with um, the other issues with respect to you being on notice that employees that you were hiring in your company or had recently hired um, had had a prior history of sexual harassment. Sure. Commissioner, if I, if, I'm, if I may, the matter that was disclosed to us prior to the former employee being with, being with the company was not a matter of sexual harassment as it was an extramarital affair with a, with a, with a person in the workplace that was not in the direct reporting line of command. So it was a matter that was brought to our attention from the former employee and his spouse and communicates to us, this had happened, we're past this, we've reconciled and we're moving on. So it was not a matter of sexual harassment in the workplace. At least as, as it was explained to us. Well, and of course, at this point, we need to take your word for it because you didn't retain the letter, correct? Th that is correct, that is correct. And I, I'm, and you I understand that's a problem. I understand that is a fundamental problem, a unacceptable lapse in judgment on my part. And to Chair Gibson's comments in the board meeting, I'm a lawyer, I know better. In that instance, since the information had been previously disclosed to us, I made a, I made a decision that was I wish I had not made, which was that we didn't need the letter anymore because we already knew the information. Going forward, whether a letter, if, if information is provided to the company, about an employee, whether the whether the behavior occurred prior to employment or during employment, that information will be kept in that person's employee file for five years. In addition to any efforts the company took to verify its information or any investigations the company undertook to ascertain the facts. And uh, at least from the the way I interpreted the materials, it did seem to go beyond just an extramarital affair. However, um, you know that's at this point that's past us you determined that it was a baseless allegation but it seems that you determined that just based on on discussions with the individual that was involved is that correct that, that is correct that is correct i will say that that we, we in hindsight we should have taken it the next step and gone and done additional diligence All right and we'll do so in the future um one of the things with respect to that matter that concerned me um uh, more so than actually the manner in which you handled it is the way you addressed it when our agents were asking you about that. Okay. Um, you know, at least in the materials that we got, um, it seemed that you were giving conflicting information regarding the letter that was received, the contents of it, and also you were reluctant to provide details with respect to the letter and, and the alleged sexual harassment that was in there. So um, I'm confident that with some of the improvements that you made, that's something that won't happen in the future. Thank you. But I did want to reiterate that that is something that it will not be tolerated. 
I mean, our process only works if you cooperate with us. We we don't have the staff like other regulatory agencies have, and we have to we have to have a level of trust with the licensees that you're going to provide us information when we ask for it. And in a lot of instances, even before we ask for it, you need to self-report you know issues. Um, and certainly, by the time somebody's asking you about uh, an issue, we expect that you're going to give them your full cooperation. So. If we can move past this, uh, which at this point, you know, I, I still have some reservations, but I did want to reiterate that, um, you know, cooperation with the board is something that is extremely important uh, to, uh, to me and I believe to all of us. Um, now, with thank respect, you, you have our commitment. thank you. Um, I'm pleased that you've, you're past the issues with Claire Vest, and I think you have a good partner there. Um, we did receive the letter from Mr. Rotman and, um, you know, I, I'll leave that at this point. Um, Do you have any update with respect to the Illinois Gaming Board complaint on the DraftKings issue? No, no, Commissioner, we, we do not. Now, at this point, we are continuing the discovery process and availed ourselves of the of the hearing process in the state of Illinois to work through the areas in which we have disagreement as to how the matter was is being resolved or how the matter was uh, set forth in the complaint. I want to make it very clear here, and, I, and if it came across otherwise, I want to make it clear for the record that we, we, we respect the Illinois Gaming Board's position on this matter, and we're going to work productively with them, and they have a commitment to resolve it in, in a fashion that works for both of us. The, the, so we're in the beginning of that stage of the discovery process. When, when un, unfortunately, there are times where regulators and licensees don't always agree on the application of law, and we're in one of those times right now. And so we're working through the due process that we're afforded with the Illinois Gaming Board, and we are going to we have our commitment to resolve it in a way that is appropriate for both sides. Okay. And, uh, I don't know if you have any prior experience, but how long does that process generally take? Uh, Commissioner, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, so, so sometimes these things in Illinois have gone on for a couple of years. Uh, I, I, I suspect this will not be years, but it, it, I don't think it'll be months. All right, that's all the questions I have at this point, so I'm happy to pass it to my colleagues. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions uh, for you, Mr. Harmer, and, yes, and also uh, for Mr. Geminani. Um, Focusing on the questions that um, uh, Commissioner Solis Rainey asked. Um, first of all, I think it, it's a great move bringing former chair uh, Sandra Morgan, you know, into the fold. I think it's a wonderful move being former Gaming Control Board Chairman Dennis Nylander into the fold. So I think that'll help. I just want to make sure that you understand, and you know, we've read all the investigative materials, and and there were some rough spots, and uh, I'm not going to, you know, reiterate those rough spots. You know them better than anyone. Appreciate that. Um, we just want to make sure that Excel understands that in a corporate philosophy that what happens anywhere in the United United States reflects upon a Nevada licensee, so you can't operate in a fishbowl, so. You know, we need through your compliance committee, you know, they need to talk, whether it's an Illinois issue, an Iowa issue, they need to know and they need to know promptly. And I'm not going to suggest how promptly that's the function of a compliance committee. So I think you're, you're well on your way to a, a corporate adherence to regulation and a corporate adherence to policy. So, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. Time will tell. And I also think, you know, that assuming your applications go forward along with the acquisition of Century, Century, since you're keeping that management intact and they have a long history of compliance, I think that, you know, gives, gives me some comfort that, you know, these things, you know, hopefully are in the past and we're, we're looking beyond that. So, um, you know, with that, I just want you to hear that loud and clear from, from our side that you can't operate in a fishbowl and what affects you as a public company in other jurisdictions affects Nevada. What happens in Nevada affects the other jurisdictions. So I just have one question for your uh, local council, if that's okay. But sure. But, but thank you, Mr. Arner. I appreciate it. 
um, working. Do you know of anybody else on the compliance committee beside now? Um, uh, your, and, who, and, and, and Dennis, who else is on the compliance committee, if you're able to tell us? Uh, Commissioner Cohen, I think the committee is still being formed. Uh, the compliance plan, the gaming compliance plan is specific, is still being worked on and drafted. Uh, we do have some, some uh, uh, educational seminars set up with the International Center for Gaming Regulation at UNLV to go over best practices in multiple jurisdictions. And because, because Excel is in multiple jurisdictions, that compliance plan really has to address the varied issues that they have in multiple jurisdictions. But as a first step, moving into Nevada, which is the, the really the, the most regulated jurisdiction that they'll be in, uh, and the, you know, clearly the oldest and most established regulatory jurisdiction that they'll be in. Uh, the thought was to, to get uh, somebody of Dennis's caliber on the commission or on the, uh, the uh, committee immediately so that as we're forming this, that it's formed in a manner that's consistent with the, the, the most regulated jurisdiction that they're in, that's Nevada. And, and, and I, I think we all as, as commissioners appreciate that. And I just want to make sure that, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but you and Mr. Harmer, you know, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Nylander, that needs to be, you know, again, not a fishbowl. There needs to be communication between the different jurisdictions. So make that a, you know, I would appreciate you making that a priority in the way you put together the balance of your compliance I appreciate that, uh, Commissioner Cohen. Thank you very much. And it, and it really will be. It Thank was, you. It has to be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before you go, may I ask a clarifying question? I understood that at this point, the compliance committee, the gaming compliance committee that you formed is the members are Dennis Nylander as the chair, and then Ms. Robinson. Those are the only two members you identified. So far. So far. Um, former chair, uh, Sandra Douglas Morgan, is you've retained her for other purposes, but she's not on the compliance committee. Correct. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And whoever would like to step forward to answer these series of questions, it has to do with the document retention policy at the time. When I observed the presentation before the board, I heard some inconsistencies and I really just want to give you the opportunity to provide clarity for the record. Um, at the time that you received the anonymous letter and the information, what was the document retention policy? And it's a twofold question. And was there a different document retention policy for personnel issues, sexual harassment issues, or um, issues relating to inappropriate relationships at work, whether it's prior employer or current employer. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I welcome the opportunity to clear some of that up. Uh, last week was uh, confusing and I certainly wish it would have been different. As it relates to document retention, the company um, has had essentially a policy of, you know, we, we just keep everything that needs to be kept, right? Whether it's in hard copy or digital file. Personnel files are kept until until employees the entire the entire time they're with the company. So this was an area of us for us that was actually a first our first chance for us to sort of test our, our our harassment policy. And so the good news is is that we have a policy and a process that worked beautifully when they needed when it was tested. The matter was brought to our attention. It was investigated. It was communicated to our board. The um, former employee was put on administrative leave during dependency of the investigation. The company uh, within a week had concluded the investigation, identified that, that there was a violation of policy, and the employee was separated. And you're talking about the event at the in September? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yes. So I'm going back a little bit further. Okay. When you received anonymous information. Yes. When you heard information about inappropriate relationships at work. Yes. Former employer. Um, the document retention policy with the documentation received at that time, it's my understanding, and tell me if I'm wrong, that you made the unilateral decision not to retain that information. I, I did. And was anybody else involved in that decision making process? I'm trying to understand the checks and balances yes. in case, as counsel, I hold you to a higher standard, um, but we're not perfect, we all make mistakes. Was there anybody else involved in that decision or was it unilateral? It was not. not. I, I, made a, I made the decision on my own that since this was information that was already known to us, we didn't need the document, it was almost it was duplicative or superfluous. I understand there was a grave, grave mistake in judgment and that never happened again. And sir, uh, don't speak in absolutes because things happen. Okay. But just to give you the opportunity, was this an effort to cover something up and address liability issues, just to let you say this on the record? Sure, it, it was not. The company has 
It has never, to the best of my knowledge, ever destroyed a document in an effort to conceal its contents from an internal or external uh, source whatsoever. Thank you. I just wanted to give you that opportunity because it, my antenna went up when I watched the presentation and I just wanted you to have that chance to, to tell me face to face that that's not what happened here. And I very much appreciate that opportunity. Yeah. And I'm also troubled by the fact that I believe there was a meeting after you received some information where you met with Mr. Hammer and Mr. Marino to discuss the March 2020 allegations. And is it fair to say like there was no documentation generated as a result of that meeting? I know there were phone calls from the wife. We had some issues. Sure. Uh, that, that was correct. You know, at times we're, we can be fairly informal in our discussions and it was, a, it was a rather informal discussion at the time. Uh, COVID had, had already kicked in. We had essentially um, furloughed a number of our employees and there was only a key group of us that were sort of in the office at the same time. And so when the matter was brought to our attention, we reached out to both individuals and um, asked them about it, asked them about the matter and felt comfortable given their level of credibility and the explanation provided that, that this is something that we could work through that the one matter we thought at the time was was not um, an allegation that would rise to the level of providing, putting the company at any risk, and that the other matter related to a consensual relationship was not one that would, again, in hindsight, have thought differently about it, but would put the company at risk going. So I am troubled by um, the analysis when you talk about consensual relationship, but I wanted clarification from you about mm -hmm. the direct line of reporting to. Was this person a subordinate, but not a subordinate? of Mr. Hammer directly. I'm trying to understand the relationship between the two so I can get over um, why it's troubling me. The way it was explained to us that there was not a direct reporting relationship between the two people. But was she a subordinate? Um, Commissioner, I honestly do not know. Okay, and, and the reason that troubles me, um, I don't want you know, splitting hairs and having a fine line of demarcation saying, well, she's not directly under his command, but maybe as a subordinate, he might have influence and could advance her career um, or could help her or give her special treatment. And the problem I see with that is liability from other people who may be believe a meritocracy is appropriate and it creates liability. And so um, to say that she doesn't directly report to him and it's consensual, is problematic. So I just wanted to make sure uh, in my mind that as you sit here today, that you might see some issues in the deficiencies in that logic and the analysis. I 100% agree with you in the deficiencies of that logic at the time when I made the decision, that was the calculus that went into making that decision. It was clearly not the best way to handle it. And going forward, you can expect more out of me. No, and I do really appreciate what you've done to prepare in a very short gap of time between the board presentation, the presentation with us to assuage all of us, I think, to uh, help us understand and appreciate that you took this seriously. Um, but it wasn't just one lapse, there were a couple that related to issues that make me uncomfortable in terms of liability, judgment, um, and your lawyer. And so again, I hold you to a higher standard because people look to you for advice and counsel. And so I, I'm comfortable that you have absolutely no issues understanding the issues that occurred, um, the fail safes that were not in place to protect maybe a lapse in judgment from you. So checks and balances, it seems like you have that in place now. And uh, I don't like to speak in absolutes, but I have a feeling we won't have this conversation with you in the future. I also do not like to speak in absolutes. I appreciate you reminding me of that. That said, I hope we never have this conversation again. And then um, is Mr. Rubenstein current on payments under the marital settlement agreement to Lindsay Rubenstein? Just wanted that on the record. Thank you, sir. Please repeat the question. Um, are you current on the under the marital settlement agreement payments to Lindsay? I am ahead of schedule on the payments. Good, I like to hear that. Thank you. And then Mr. Marino, just curious about the horses. Is, is anybody here to talk about that? Thank you. Just, it's an interesting hobby. I don't know how you got involved. Uh, how many horses in your horse breeding? Oh, my, yeah, Mr. M Michael Marino, Chief Commercial Officer for the record. Mm -hmm. uh, my father's been a horse owner and trainer at Finger Lakes Gaming and Racetrack in upstate New York, Farmington, New York, uh, for many years. And so I've, uh, I've invested in horses with him uh, over the years, sometimes to bail him out, <laughs> sometimes for, uh, for personal gain. Um, but yeah, it's just a side business that I've worked in with him. Okay, and how many horses? Uh, over the years, 
10 to 12 at different times. Uh, right now we have none. We are, I'm actually out of a business we've. Okay. I was just interested how you were involved in that. Thank you. And then um, has Excel paid IGI the $1.6 billion settlement arising from the lawsuit? Could anyone speak to that, please? Commissioner, we have made that payment. Excellent. Thank you for reporting that. Welcome. And just a final question about the interest rate on the um, 550 um, million of availability under the senior secured credit facility. The, does the rate vary for each of the distinct tranches? Because I think there was like a revolving credit facility line for the 100 to the 150, and then there's a 350 million term loan, and then the 4 million delay draw loan, uh, term loan. Is that, are there different variable interest rates? Can you just, just briefly? Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. Matthew Ellis, Chief Financial Officer, for the record. The interest rate on all three tranches is identical. Okay. Same rates. Just wanted to verify. Thank you. I have no further questions. I appreciate the presentation. Commissioner Keycapper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Um, the um, I think the legal department at Excel. Um, how, how large is your legal department? Do you have <laughs> the legal department at Excel currently? We have uh, three in-house lawyers that currently are, are on staff. Is that Kevin? And we have another lawyer that works uh, part time uh, that commutes in the office. So that would be four. Yeah, really four. So, and you handle almost all things internally as it relates to personnel matters, or do you have outside counsel that you use for, for employment? Thanks for asking that question. Yeah, we have outside counsel that we rely on in when these matters uh, pop up. And so, unfortunately, we've had to use them a few times in my career at the company, but uh, we have great counsel and they, they provide great guidance as these matters to work through. And then do they provide um, sexual harassment training and uh, issues related to um, sexual harassment for employees? So they don't, but we have a, a annual sexual harassment training program that we do for all employees of the company. That's an online course that all employees have to take and certify that they have taken it before they can be released off the hook of the many emails they get reminding them to do it. But all in all, everyone's very good about it. And we have a very comprehensive see something, say something culture that both Andy and I uh, talk about in our quarterly meetings with our employees in our remote offices, as well as during our town hall meetings. So everyone in our organization is well aware that when something happens, you need to say something. And we have processes that have been tested and they work. And when you received this anonymous letter, it didn't occur to you to reach out to outside counsel and, and talk about potential exposure that the company may have? Yeah, it, 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 it didn't. It didn't. You know, when it came in, um, we looked at it, we read it, we thought we needed that conversation and do our own diligence on it. And we, we did not reach out to outside counsel. That is something that we, in hindsight, should have done. Appreciate that. Um, as it relates to, to um, let me start with the compliance. Mm -hmm. So um, during the um, board hearing, uh, talked about some of the reshuffling that was being done. Um, for the board, for the compliance committee members, are the individuals that you um, referenced um, during the board hearing no longer going to be a part of the compliance committee? So, Commissioner, uh, if you're talking about um, Member Phillips, yes, yeah, she will. She is continuing to be a member of the compliance committee and continuing to be its chair. Okay. So, I think the the demarcation point here is we're going, we, we still have our board level compliance committee, which is the oversight of all compliance matters for the company. And then we'll have the gaming compliance committee that will be focused on gaming related matters for the jurisdictions which we operate. All right, and then that's the committee that um, that's Nylander will chair. Correct. Um, can you expand a little bit more on what Tane Covington to, to do for you? And is that gonna be an ongoing relationship or is that a one-time for you? Sure. So we've we've enjoyed a, a, a good relationship with Covington over the years as they've helped us with other matters. And when Sandra it was introduced to us, uh, we were excited to be able to work with her again. Right now they have we've provided them all of our corporate policies and asked them to do a comprehensive review of all those policies from a from a different set of eyes to give us some guidance on what they need to look like as we continue to grow our business and have them govern more than just one jurisdiction, which is where this all started for us in Illinois. Okay. Um as it relates to um, due diligence, the uh, over what period of time was Mr. Dublino an employee of Excel? Oh, Commissioner, that's a good question. Um, 
I have to go back and look at, at our notes to be exact on the date of employment. I, I want I want to, I know it was after he received his terminal handler's license for the state of Illinois, which is a requirement for us to have to extend him an offer of employment. How many um, terminal handlers would you have had at that time? Company probably had a couple hundred employees at that time, and we required most people to uh, apply for a terminal handler's license when they were coming into the company it was, a, it was a condition of employment. So we wanted to do two things. We would do our own background checks through our ADP service that is our backbone for onboarding employees. Everyone, would, every employee would go through a full background check through ADP and also go through a drug test. And as a second layer of vetting, we would require people to go and apply for their terminal handlers license for Illinois to be able to get a deeper background check because of course the state of Illinois has, has access to resources that we as a citizen don't have access to. I'm sorry, can you expand on what is the ADP um, process? So it, it's, it's, a, it's a third party vendor that processes payroll and hey, they have other functions that are modules within, within the backbone of the system. And so within that, one of the modules within that system is a background check. And so we submit the social security number and the date of birth and full name of an individual that's gonna be onboarded. And they get a full background check that checks civil court record, civil court records, criminal court records, bankruptcies, um, you know, assessor's office, recorders, sort of does a full blanket open source search on that person before they can become an employee at the company. They have to pass that background check. And that wouldn't ping him, it wouldn't have pinged him in, in I mean, the guy was on the front page of the Sun Times, right? Yeah. Um, it, I, I guess, how did you not know that you had someone before you who had previously operated a legal operation? Yeah, it, candidly, Commissioner, we, we knew that was his history because he, he was someone that had been a cooperating witness with the federal authorities and knew that his background relative to some of his activities after he came forward uh, certainly were known to us and known to the general public. And so we made it a condition of employment for him that regardless of whatever had happened and how you had got to the point that you did, we were going to require you be licensed by the Illinois Gaming Board before you could be offered an, a uh, job with our organization. And that, and that sort of level of scrutiny and sort of giving us the comfort that if Illinois was going to license him, that is someone that we could do business with. Because in our industry, prior to it being legalized, there was a gray market that operated for a number of years. So a lot of those people that were in that marketplace, including terminal operators, crossed over and became licensed as regulated entities in the state of Illinois. It, it, it strikes me as odd to make a choice that this is that this is someone you wanted working for you, right? And it didn't work out, right? He stole from you, yeah, or allegedly stole from you. Allegedly. Um, I don't know, it piqued my interest in particular because a lot of this stuff happened walking distance from where I grew up. The great Italian ice gene is on Roosevelt. Stop by and visit. Um, <laughs> I just, uh, it, 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 as a part of the vetting process of your employees, uh, this was this one was just glaring, right? Yeah. And um, are there are there similar similarly situated people still working for the company who had operated in this gray area that now continue to uh, service terminals in Illinois? Not that not that I can not that I can think of at this moment. I mean, our our vetting process now is is much more deliberate. We, we've, you know, as a company, we've grown a great deal in the last 10 years, matured as an organization, have better processes in place than we did when we first started, and have continued to grow and improve. So given the commitments I've made to you today and our board chair and our CEO have made to you today about our compliance processes going forward, that vetting will be much more robust, less reliant on regulators and more reliant on our own investigation. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so unless anyone else has any other questions, I'm just going to... Madam Chair, I just have a couple of quick follow-up questions um, okay. that weren't raised. If somebody could just briefly address. Um, it's my understanding, based on my review of the financial statements, that um, Excel is not compliant with Sarbanes-Oxley at this time because of the exclusion in the Jobs Act. Are there mechanisms in place that are going to ensure that the 2023 compliance deadline um, is going to be met, that and on track, and just wanted to verify I'll that. that speak to it, but yeah. Thank you. I'm happy to speak to that. Yeah, we are working with our external auditors, KPMG, on that, as well as our audit committee of the board. Um, never want to get out of promise, but we are, we take that seriously, and we are working to address those weaknesses. Okay, and so you think you'll be compliant by 2023 by the deadline? I would hope so, yes. Okay. Um, 
So right. you're working on it? Yes, Okay. very much. So. And then I don't know who, who the right person is for this, uh, just quick line of questions about the purchase agreement and then the one year um, after the March 2nd, 21, 2021 date, um, the outside closing date, is it 90 days after March 2nd, 2021? So is it June 2nd, 2022? Do your homework, Commissioner. That I believe it's I believe it's uh, June June 2nd. Okay, it is the, June 2nd. Is the outside date? Yes. I just want to confirm. And I know there's an interplay right now between the Montana Gaming Control Division. Is there a date set for that? Is that underway? Because I, I don't know if there's going to be a delay with the Louisiana Gaming Control. I'm hearing if that's been set yet and if you need another option and extension. So appreciate that uh, question and inquiry. The good news is that we've been working directly with council in Louisiana and found out to our to our pleasant surprise that the matter does not need to go before the gaming control board. The chairman can approve that vendor permit on, on, his, on, on his own motion. And so those reports have been drafted and approved at the staff level. They've made their way up to the attorney general's office. I believe this week they're being reviewed. And I've been told, and I'm going to hold them to it, that they're ahead of schedule and that should not impact Excellent. the closing. I was worried. Subject to us being approved here. I was worried about your outside date and whether or not you needed to exercise another option. I, I think for the first exercise of the option, it, it's a non-monetary issue, but I didn't know if there was a, a need for a further extension if you would get dinged and have to pay for that. Yeah, th there's nothing in the in the agreement that, that spells that out. Okay. And, and just to address your point about Montana, Mon we've been working cooperatively, cooperatively with Montana throughout, and they have essentially given us a conditional go forward approval. Um, I think they were quite frankly waiting to see what happens here as Understood. some regulators often do. Because we're the gold standard. You are the gold standard. And and also that uh, we have three post-closing conditions we have to satisfy as part of that approval. So I, I think we're in good shape. Thank you for being so prepared for the presentation, for answering all of my questions. I know I was all over the place, but it was so much material and it was very interesting to me. I had lots of questions. So thank you for indulging me. Well, we appreciate the opportunity to address you today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so um, I, I guess my turn. Um, I, I would simply note that that many of the um, matters of interest or concern have been uh, addressed as far as I'm concerned by my uh, fellow commissioners' questions. Um, I echo Vice Chair Solis Rainey's comments about the record retention and cooperation concerns. Um, I mean, I. I get that hindsight's always 2020 and and um, but just just from never mind the gaming standpoint, just litigation standpoint, not not the best way to have handled that, but I, I certainly appreciate um, the acceptance of responsibility and acknowledgement that if it could be done over again, that would be a, a different outcome. Um, I guess there was a comment that um, that I'm interested in following up on a little bit, and that comment was that you know that there's a commitment to work with um, the IGB to resolve the matter in something that works for both of you. And um, I guess I guess my question would be: Was that alluding to a possible settlement or resolution? you know, maybe $5 million just doesn't work for both of you or, you know, the liability aspect of it and the actual um, finding of a violation of some kind that doesn't work. I, I guess I would ask what, what, what do you envision when you make a comment like that, um, that, that would work for both of you? Maybe not, you can't speak for them, but you could certainly speak for you. Appreciate the question, uh, Chair Tagliati. Maybe I was a little bit loose with my words in that, in that comment, and so I didn't mean to be. We have, we have a fundamental disagreement as to the application of the law in the area in which they've alleged we have misconduct. That, that, that body of law has, has morphed over the last 10 years. There have been policies that have been set by the gaming board that have permitted conduct between local establishment and terminal operators as far as what services can be shared, how they can co-promote, operate, what, what costs can be shared, and it's, an, it's, it's been evolving over the years. And so when the matter is brought to our attention, after we provided a copy of the agreement to the gaming board, had it vetted by outside counsel, who was a former general counsel of the Illinois Gaming Board, and found out that the, that the operation of the agreement was not comfortable for the IGB, we terminated it that day. And so we, we understand and respect their position, we really, we truly do, and we respect the partnership that we have with them as our home regulator. Uh, that said, 
we just have a fundamental disagreement as to the application of that that law to what we have alleged to have done and we think that the fine is 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 so out of uh the the, the, the fine is not connected to the conduct that we have been alleged to have committed the alleged twenty one thousand dollars collected that didn't benefit you words Cor correct or the paid out excuse dollars. me paid out as an inter yeah, intermediate 000. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm just talking over you. I apologize. It's a bit of a delay. The twenty thousand dollars that that payments from DraftKings that were earmarked right. for establishment owners that went through the company because it already had a payment system in place with each location. So the, the money passed through like similar uh, business lines that we have in Illinois. So we're, we're we're admittedly confused as to the size of the fine relative to the conduct at issue. We will continue to work with the gaming board. We have outside counsel. We we are we want to resolve the matter, and we are in the very infancy. We are in the infancy of discovery, and hoping that as that moves forward, perhaps there's opportunities for common ground to be discussed with the or with the game board and us, and that perhaps we can resolve it short of taking the litigation all the way to the end of the earth. Okay, so so when you made that reference, um, you you're telling us. That you your company has a commitment to try to work to a, a resolution whether they they agree with something that you would accept or not you're going to you're going to make those efforts um throughout the, the process is that what you're telling us i am telling you that yes okay um okay i appreciate that thank you um i, I was just going to ask you know can you can you describe for us kind of the the breakdown of women and minorities in the management of your company. I don't need specific numbers. I'm not asking that. I'm just asking generally. Anyone that you would define in management, would you say there's, you're comfortable that there's a, um, um, percentage there that you could even ballpark for me? It's just not, I'm not asking anything I, specific. Yeah, I think I think the ballpark is 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 somewhere between sixty five to thirty five percent. Okay. As far as uh, women and men in 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 leadership and management roles in the organization, maybe maybe even closer to sixty forty. Okay. Um, I'm, I was just curious. I um, have no way of knowing that, and I didn't see it in any of the materials, and I and I I was just curious, and I appreciate you ballparking that for me. Um, I don't have any additional questions beyond what's already been asked today. And so I would just ask any of my fellow commissioners if they have anything additional as a result of any of, of their colleagues or my questions, feel free to uh, ask now. Chair Tagliati, if I may, just one follow-up issue. Sure. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on a comment, uh, response that you gave to Commissioner Keekeffer's uh, question. Um, with respect to Mr. Dublino, I didn't get uh, from the materials what I think I got from your um, response was that you you were aware of Mr. Dublino's background and his prior involvement or I don't know if you call it being pipe bomb and involvement, but his prior involvement with the, with the Chicago mob, yet you wanted to hire him, but you made it a condition that he be licensed? Yes. And so the position we took at that moment was that if the only gaming board was going to be okay giving him a license and for doing a background check and, and, and going through its probity, would that be a gating item for us to be able to have him be extended an offer of employment for our company? So again, it's, it's, it's the, it's the uh, thought process that we had back then, which is relying on our regulator to do a large part of the diligence for us at the time. And since it was a publicly known matter and was not something that he was shying away from in his involvement prior to and after with federal authorities. We made it a condition of employment that if the gaming board thought it was okay if you'd have a relationship with us as an organization and it provided you a license, that that would be a approval. It would be okay for us to move forward. Well, I appreciate your candor with that. Uh, frankly, it makes me question the judgment a little bit. Um, understand. It seems like you were looking for cover from the IGB. Uh, you, you wanted to hire him, but you wanted them to kind of bless it by the licensing. Um, that's going forward. I mean, that's not an acceptable process. Um, I understand. You know, you if you had concerns about him, you know, going forward and making a decision based on your own concerns, 
I think is would would have been more appropriate. So I agree with you 100. percent Thank you. I don't have anything further. And if I may, I just want to add one comment to uh, Commissioner Solisrani. <clears throat> you, you, there's a lot of blemishes in the application process, but what that particular issue with Dublino and the comments that you know that we've heard regarding Dublino are very troublesome. I don't think anybody can ever take safe harbor in, in having actual knowledge of an issue and then looking for cover. Agreed. You know, so I, I think that's a very serious judgmental issue, you know, that has to be resolved going forward. If, if you harbor doubts, if you have information, don't hire, don't, don't look for cover because it's come back to haunt you at some point, you know, down the road. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, at least after viewing the process that a limited license is on the table. Yes, we hear that loud and clear and we are, we are confident that our improved diligence processes and the formation of our committee will help us in our evaluation of what is an appropriate and suitable relationship for the company to be participating in. And sir, it's my understanding that, that you're not taking the position that regulatory approval is per se free pass and that you don't have to do any due diligence. And, I am not taking that position. And you were aware of his history and for whatever reason, this is a business judgment decision you make internally, you wanted to do business with him and notwithstanding his full disclosure about his past and cooperation with the government. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily you were seeking cover, but if the regulators were willing, notwithstanding his past and cooperation with the government to give him a license that you would only under those conditions be willing to move forward with him because it's a rigorous process there as well, correct? Commissioner, you said it much better than I did. Okay. Yes, correct. So I understand your process. You're not trying to skirt your due diligence obligations, and I think you've taken steps going forward to deal with it. I, I understand, but I think the point is maybe you shouldn't have hired him because he had too many issues. But we can't second guess everything. That's just not how things work. But I do appreciate that you're taking it seriously <laughs> and moving forward. This should not be an issue. Thank you. And, and if I, I might, oh, just sure. to clarify, I, I, I'd, I'd heard you say that it wasn't specific to him. Right, that you were you required everybody to get this license. We did at that time. All right, so it wasn't. Um, okay. Yeah, we weren't looking. We weren't looking for additional cover as much as we were looking for additional resources to check backgrounds because we had limited. We have limited resources to background check through open sources. We thought that the deeper dive that the Illinois Gaming Board and its its resources could take on background checks would be a second layer of protection for the company that we were dealing with suitable people. Okay. And if I might add, if, if I'm at a chair, Tagliati, well, yes. I wanted to add, I, I forget, forgive me for not bringing it up when I spoke to you about uh, the company's uh, gender mix and its leadership management team. We, we recently uh, kicked off a program, an executive development program in which the two candidates that have started the program for us are both female. And we are looking for them to grow with the organization get an MBA and, and, and participate in senior leadership going forward. So we started a training ground for people, younger people in the company and the first two candidates are women. Okay, thank you for um, bringing that to my attention and I, I appreciate that. Um, I think uh, before, unless there are any additional questions on the substance of the presentation or the uh, matters that have uh, been discussed or subject of the materials, I believe um, Commissioner Keefer does have something to add for the record before we proceed to anyone making a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. I've, um, during the course of the hearing, I realized I probably should have made a disclosure earlier in the uh, before we started the hearing. I want to disclose that I'm an employee of the law firm Donald Carano, and Donald Carano does re represent Claire Best in um, in matters not related specific to this application, um, and. Clarivest itself is not um, um, subject to this application. Mr. Rupert, not to speak, I felt like I should be um, completely forthcoming about um, that relationship. I don't think that the independence and judgment of a person would be affected by this relationship. So I'm going to vote on it. I'll make sure I can. Thank you. Thank you. And, sh and Chair, if I may, I just have a quick spinoff question relating to the diversity um, inquiries that you've posed today. Um, Please. Does Excel have a DEI or ESG committee in place? Is that something that's been formalized internally? 
We have we do not have those committees in place currently, but we have talked about it. In fact, uh, during our last nominating and governance committee meeting at the board level, uh, we did talk about both those topics and sort of speeding up our process, getting ready because certainly they will be required as part of our SOX compliance going forward. But we are that's on our radar, and we're already already have walking down the path of sort of getting that sorted out. Thank you. And separate apart from requirement, I think as a community leader that people look up to, I think it's important to formulate that internally uh, to normalize that thinking. Agreed. So if you train people to have diversity um, and you have a team that thinks differently, so we don't all think the same, I think it's good for checks and balances. Thank you. So thank you for um, confirming. Thank you, Chair. I have nothing further. Anyone else? All right. Uh, it appears that this matter is in proper form for a motion. Does anyone have a motion? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I would move for approval of non-restricted agenda, agenda item number one, as recommended as recommended by the Gaming Control Board, is read into the record by Madam Secretary, and that would include the two-year limitation to expire right. at midnight of, of the May 2024 uh, Nevada Gaming Commission meeting. All right, uh, that is the motion from Commissioner Cohen. Do we have any discussion on the motion? Chair, I would I just say I appreciate um, appreciate the work done um, between the board meeting and now um, to really shore up the compliance piece of this. That was what troubled me most after that hearing, um, and that work probably uh, so some yeah, that's the beginning. All right, um, I'm sorry. Sorry, I would just echo that. Um, you, I'm prepared to support it with a limitation only because of the changes that you've made. Uh, I think you're bringing some good people on board. Um, that helps me get over the reservations that I had coming into uh, the meeting. So I appreciate you taking those efforts and I hope you, um, you know, go forward with the plan that you've presented to us and move forward in a positive manner. Thank you. All right, um, at this time, all in favor of Commissioner Cohen's motion, say aye. 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 All right. It appears that all are in favor and none are opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Secretary, please read in non-restricted number two. Non-restricted number two is the application of Excel Entertainment Inc. for a continuous or delayed public offering and the application of United Coin Machine Company doing business as Century Gaming Technologies to guarantee securities and hypothecate assets in conjunction with a continuous or delayed public offering. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval. Hello, Chair Tagliati, members Solis Rainey, Cohen, Brown, and Key Keffer. I'm Greg Gibignani from the law firm of Dickinson Wright here on behalf of Excel Entertainment in support of this, uh, this application for a delayed, uh, continuous and delayed public offering. And I think we've gone through a lot of the uh, basics on this uh, or with the company. So um, if you have any questions about this particular application, happy to take those questions. Does anyone have any just, questions? Just a three-year delayed public offering. Straightforward. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Anyone else? And uh, Commissioner Keekeffer, are you going to um, incorporate herein by reference your previous disclosure? Please, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. So uh, at this time, if there are no additional questions or comments, is there a motion to be made? Thank you, Chair Tagliati. I'm prepared to make a motion on this. Uh, I would move for approval of non-restricted item number two is read into the record by Secretary Bell and recommended by the Game Control Board. Any discussion on the motion? No. All right, there being none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All right, it is Mr. Gemini. I think you've done a Thank good you, job. Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. None, none were opposed. Thank you. All right, Madam Secretary, please read in non-restricted number three. Non-restricted number three are the applications of Claire Vest Group Inc. for registration as a publicly traded corporation and for finding a suitability as a beneficial owner of Excel Entertainment Inc. There's also the applications of Kenneth Rice Rotman for finding a suitability as beneficial owner, controlling beneficial owner, and as an officer and director as noted on the agenda. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval. I believe we have a recusal and a disclosure on this item. All right, starting with Commissioner Keekeffer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, related to 
previous statement, I'm a employee of the law firm McDonald Carano. Um, the applicant in this matter um, is a client and represented by um, counsel from my employing law firm. And due to the nature of this relationship, it feels appropriate for me to make this disclosure and accuse from participating. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. I have a disclosure to make. Claire Vest Group Inc. is an adverse contract party in an open matter handled by the firm where I'm a partner, Louis Roca, in which matters I'm not personally involved and I have no pecuniary interest in the outcome of this agenda item. I do not believe the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in my position would be affected by the relationship described on the record, and I therefore intend to participate. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, it's still morning, right? Yes. Good morning. Uh, could you state your, your name, your appearance, and who's going to be addressing us today? Uh, Dennis Gutwald with the law firm of McDonald Carano. With me is Ken Rotman of Clara Vest. And with your permission, I'll have him tell you a little bit about the company and himself, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Nice to talk to you again. This time I'm speaking to you as the CEO of ClareVest and the controlling shareholder. I'm grateful for the opportunity to present to you what my company does. As I've noted, we've been in the gaming industry for 25 years and over a large number of gaming assets in a variety of jurisdictions and countries. If it's, uh, uh, I just want to, I was advised to take your temperature about how deep I go in and how much time I take. Um, I would, suggest that you give us um, presentation light <laughs> and we can ask you questions. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so I'll start off. Uh, I'll start off in uh, terms of the board. Nice to see you. I'll start off uh, just as you know, I'll start up something unusual, which is for a private equity firm. I always like to start our presentations by what is our core purpose and our, our mission and vision and values. So our purpose is really to help entrepreneurs uh, build strategically significant businesses and take them to the different level. And in so doing, we create value for all stakeholders, we create employment, we foster progress and efficiency, we contribute to economic growth, and we support the communities in which we live. We have a demonstrated track record of doing all of those things. That is why Clarivis exists. In the process, you know, we do make money for all of our stakeholders, but that is the core purpose. We were founded by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. I like to tell people like what at the end of the day does Clarivus do? I like to say we finance the American dream. That's what our, our, our belief in that. My family came over as uh, poor immigrants escaping persecution in Europe. The ones who didn't make it over were slaughtered. The ones who did I saw a great opportunity, uh, had the opportunity to get employment, own property. And from that, we've been uh, great recipients of being in North America and Canada and the United States. Um, my father, about 40 odd years ago, uh, was, he was an oil and gas guy, but he got into the gold business and he helped originally take a stake in Gold Strike, which is located just in the north of the state and helped develop that and create one of the largest gold companies in the world called Barrick, American Barrick. So we've got a long, long relationship with Nevada over many years. Our values, partnership, integrity, long-term open-mindedness and tenacity. That's what we built our firm around. Our track record is top quartile, if not top decile, over an extended period of time. I believe we've been able to achieve that because it's not just about the money, it's a role we fill, and it's the values that we as a firm have in how we treat each other, how we treat our regulators, and how we treat our operating partners. The most important one for me is we guard our reputation as our greatest asset. I've been at Clarevist for, oh geez, uh, more than 25 years. Uh, and I'll probably be there for another 20 plus years. I'm 55. So uh, I will keep it light. Uh, you know, we started, I joined the firm in 1994. The firm started in 1987. Uh, it had, a, it was a great idea that had a little bit of a rocky start. I was lucky enough to uh, join with some several other people who've been my partner, some of them for 25 years, some for 24 years, some for 20 plus years. But as a group of young, committed individuals, we've been able to build our firm over the past several decades. Today, we have, as a general partner, uh, not other people's money, our money, just about a billion dollars. Uh, and that's, you know, the vast majority of that is retained earnings. Do we just keep investing in ourselves? We also manage several billion dollars of some institutional capital to allow us to punch above our weight. Our focus is on... Uh, really focusing on industry first. If it's industry, company management, timing, and price, we focus on trying to get into the right industry. Gaming is one of those industries. We are 
regarded as one of the better investors in the gaming industry. Our track record is uh, flawless in terms of we've never lost money in the gaming industry. Um, and we've had some tremendous successes, which are well known. On the, uh, on the keep it light, uh, you know, so we have uh, investments in Canada. We've been regulated by Alberta, British Columbia, New Brunswick, and Ontario. We built the largest gaming company in Western Canada and ultimately sold that to some Australians. Uh, we've been uh, operating in Illinois, Indiana, uh, licensed Pennsylvania. We own a casino in Delaware now, and we also operate in New Jersey through the Meadowlands Casino, where we clear half of the sports bets for the state of New Jersey. Uh, internationally, we operate in India, and we operate in Chile, which is a very tightly regulated regime, which would rival your level of, of discipline. Uh, and we're in the United Kingdom, where we have a, a software platform. Uh, we have the pending licenses, Nevada, Louisiana, Montana, South Dakota, and Malta, which we expect to get, but we've never been turned down for a gaming license. I personally have never been turned down for a suitability uh, requirements. Uh, keeping it light, our track record is good. Moving on to page eight. Now, uh, in terms of the gaming industry, we've invested in 12 mature casinos. We've built nine casinos. We call those greenfield projects. We've done 10 redevelopments. We essentially bought a casino and substantially rebuilt it. We have uh, an association with Fund VGT Operator Excel talked about, and we've got two online platforms, one in India and one a software platform out of the United Kingdom in the sports betting space. Gaming is represented anywhere between 29 and 40% of our investing activity across funds. So it is a core part of what we do. We have a team of 24 investment professionals. We do a background check on everybody at ClearVest, right from the receptionist, right up. We do a background checks on everybody we do business with. Uh, we've not done people, business with people because they have DUI charges. So we take it ultimately very, very seriously. Right. Um, I'm not uh, given the time constraints, and I know that you have these materials, unless the commission would like me to. I don't plan on doing a page flip through all of the different gaming assets and the 34 different properties and the, and the number of different investments. I'm certainly happy to take any questions with respect to any of the activities. We like the gaming industry. We are proud to be a part of it. As I mentioned to the board in the 1990s, uh, when we first decided to get into it, there was a, an animated discussion of my board, which revolved, involved one or two people resigning about whether it was the kind of business we wanted to be in. And uh, one of the directors uh, finished, you know, won the day when he had admitted that he had a family member who had a gambling problem. And as a result, he thought it was extraordinarily important that we bring reputable people into the industry to work in tightly regulated environments and bring credibility to the industry in order to help the states not only achieve their objectives in terms of safety of the industry, but also their financial objectives, but also to serve in the communities. I'm also very proud to say that the shareholders of Clarevest have been very philanthropic and we plan on continuing to do so, support the communities. With that, I'm happy to take questions on any particular single investment we've done, any jurisdiction that we've been involved in, our thoughts on sports betting versus ground-based gaming or anything in the middle. And thank you very much for your time. Thank well, you. before we begin, I would like to note that we always appreciate having your materials presented to us in advance. Um, I know the commissioners and I take the time to go through all of it before you get here. And so we really do appreciate um, having those materials submitted to us. At this time, I'm going to open it up to um, Commissioner Solis, uh, Vice Chair Solis Rainey to start, and then we'll kind of work our way down the dais there. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Tagliati. Uh, I actually don't have any questions. The materials are very thorough and I thought it was a very clean application. So uh, thank you for your presentation and the materials. Uh, thank you very much. I have no issues with the application. I fully support it. Thank you very much. And I do very much appreciate the materials. I personally like the human capital page on page 10. You can take pictures. I can count the diversity. I don't have to ask you about that. I get it. Um, and I'm impressed that Clearvest declines about 90% of the opportunity that it bets. Yes. And I, I think to be that discerning is very telling about your an incredible IRR. So I have no areas of concern and I'm prepared to uh, support the application. Thank, Thank you for you. your time and for the presentation. It's very polished. Um, I too have no concerns about the application. Um, having um, observed the investigators um, presentation at Rump, 
Um, I know that they had no concerns and everything is very thorough. And so at this time, I believe it's in proper form for a motion. Chair, I'm prepared to move for approval of non-restricted item number three as recommended by the Gaming Control Board and as read into the record by Madam Secretary. Is there any discussion on the motion to be had? There being no discussion, but at this time, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, it appears that the four of us have voted in favor of the motion and uh, the record should reflect Commissioner Keekhever re recused from this matter and did not uh, participate in the discussion or vote. Thank you very much, sir, for your presentation and materials. Um, Thank and you we very appreciate much. it. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll wait for Commissioner Keekhever to come back. Thank you. Cleared out the room. How's that? I'm going to order pizza. Oh, here we go. All right. Um, if the commissioners are ready to proceed now, we have um, Madam Secretary, if you could please read in non-restricted number five. Non-restricted number five are the applications of Interblock Luxury Gaming Products DD doing business as Interblock DD for a transfer of interest and to convert to a limited liability company as noted on the agenda. You also have the applications of IBOCM Boat Co for registration as a holding company and for a funding of suitability as a member of Interblock Luxury Gaming Products Limited doing business as Interblock DOO. Next are the applications of Interblock Interblock Luxury Gaming Products Limited doing business as Interblock DOO for registration as a private investment company, licensure as sole member of Interblock USA LC, and as a manufacturer, distributor, and an operator of a slot machine route. Lastly, you have the applications of Matthew Charles Wilson, Jordan Lewis Cruz, David Benjamin Quick, and John Joseph Connolly IV for finding of suitability and or licensure as a shareholder, officer, director, and or manager as noted on the agenda. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval with the condition as noted on the agenda. I believe we have a recusal and a disclosure on this item. All right, Commissioner Keekeffer, when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I to disclose that um, I'm an employee of the law firm McDonald Carano, McDonald Carano, um, and its attorneys represent Interblock and uh, Based on this pre existing relationship, I believe that I need to disclose and recuse on this matter. Thank you. Okay, thank you. At this time, um, I normally, when Ms. Ogerberg is uh, representing an applicant, I normally make a disclosure that based upon my private mediation practice, I am occasionally uh, engaged uh, by a client of um, a lawyer at Greenberg Traurig, um, not Ms. Ogerberg ever. Um, and no gaming matters ever. Um, but I make this disclosure in an abundance of caution. I have no pecuniary interest in this matter. Um, I'm always paid by the client and not the um, law firm um, when I'm retained for that work. Um, but I do not believe that the independence uh, and judgment of a reasonable person in my uh, position would be um, influenced by the matter that I disclosed and therefore I intend to participate in discussion and voting on this matter. Thank you. So at this time, uh, if you could state your appearance and um, begin. Certainly, good afternoon, Chair Taziati, Commissioners, Madam Secretary. For the record, I am Eric Okerberg. I'm outside Nevada Gaming Council to Oak Tree. Here with me today are the applicants and controlling persons, Jordan Cruz, Matt Wilson, and David Quick. And also here on behalf of Interblock, our Interblock's Outside Gaming Council, A.G. Burnett, the CEO, John Connolly, the CFO, Heather Rollo, 
and the general counsel, Matt Heinhold. If acceptable, I would like to proceed with providing an affirmative presentation similar to the one that we provided at the Nevada Gaming Control Board. And that would consist of uh, first me providing an overview of the regulatory structure that's being presented. Then I would turn it over to Mr. Wilson and to Mr. Quick to provide uh, some background for you on both Oak Tree and the transaction in Interblock. And then each of the three individuals as new applicants would come up and provide a little bit about themselves. Okay, uh, right. for, just before you start for the record, um, I, we have been presented materials on your presentation and those have been scanned and emailed to me and I have them available um, right here on my other device. So uh, for the record, Wonderful. I the benefit of those. Wonderful, thank you very much. And we would ask that those be treated as confidential and not be made part of the public record. With that, I would like to start with the regulatory overview. Uh, we are before you today pursuant to applications that have been filed under regulation 15C. 15C requires that a private investment company meet three criteria. First, 100% of the economic securities need to be held by a private investment fund that has an investment manager with at least 1 million in assets under management. Second, 100% of the voting securities must be held by the controlling persons or key executives who are from that investment manager. And then lastly, the entity must not be a publicly traded corporation. In this case before you, if I ask you to turn to page one in your slide deck, you will see the post-closing structure. In the middle of the organizational structure, you will see Interblock DD to be known as Interblock DOO. That in this case is the private investment company. And if you look on the left-hand side, you will see an entity that is labeled as non-VOTCO. That is OCM, Luxembourg, Baccarat, Bitco. That entity holds 100% of the non-voting economic securities. And in the simplified structure above that, you will see Oak Tree Special Situations Fund 2. That's the private investment fund. And then at the very top, Oak Tree Capital Management is the fund manager. Then if you look on the right-hand side of the chart, you will see the vote co. That's IBOCM vote co. That entity is before you today for an approval. And then the three individuals who are equal managers are the people uh, that are before you today as the controlling executives. So that would be Jordan Cruz and Matt Wilson, who are both co-portfolio managers of Special Situations Fund, and David Quick, who is the assistant portfolio manager and a managing director for Oak Tree Special Situations Fund. Those criteria, plus the fact that Interblock is not a publicly traded corporation, meet the requirements of Regulation 15C.010. And additionally, I would note for the record that pursuant to 15C.050, subsection 1C, we have provided a non-interference letter in a form that was appropriate to the board from Oak Tree Capital Management, and that has already been re reviewed. With those elements, we do think that this is for proper consideration for the commission before you in the regulatory structure. If there are any questions on the structure, I'm happy to answer those. Otherwise, I can certainly turn it over to Mr. Wilson to start to talk to you about Oak Tree. Anyone have any questions about structure? There being none, uh, sir. Thank you ready. very much, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Erica. Uh, good afternoon, I believe it is actually, uh, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Matthew Wilson. I am the co-portfolio manager and co-head of our special situations group at Oak Tree Capital Management in Los Angeles. Um, if you'd indulge me, and I duly note the uh, Fres Light concept, I don't intend to flip any slides today. Uh, we provided you a deck for your leisure. I thought I would just talk for a couple of minutes about Oak Tree and what we do and the values we espouse. Uh, Oak Tree was started nearly 30 years ago in 1995. Um, right now in Beverly Hills, we have our uh, biannual global conference going on with uh, several hundred of our limited partners from around the world. Uh, we manage about $166 billion of capital for our clients, uh, blue chip universities, uh, all of the state pensions you can think of, uh, sovereign wealth funds, high net worth individuals, the list goes on. But it is a very uh, significant uh, group of clients that we're very proud of. It's been a long time building our business together. And we've done so because we bring a high level of integrity and sophistication to everything we do at Oak Tree and a high level of discipline to how we deploy and manage our clients' capital. Uh, today, we have 1,000 employees, uh, 44 portfolio managers like myself and my partner, Jordan Cruz who had our strategies. On average, we have two and a half decades of experience. That's the same for Jordan and Nate. Uh, right now, we are raising our fourth institutional fund in the last eight years. We're very excited about what we see in the markets today. 
but more importantly, we're excited how we do it at Oak Tree. It's, it's, a different, it's a difference in how we do it than other firms, given our size and our scale. We're well aware that we are in the public, public eye on a very regular basis, and we take our responsibility and how we invest in what we do in all facets very seriously. In terms of our investment philosophy, I'll just talk a couple of minutes about how we do things. You know, we don't aim to be the highest return fund in the world. We try to be in the top quartile of SL, and we often are, but we believe in an emphasis on consistency and risk control. At the end of the day, our clients entrust us with $166 billion of their money because we manage risk and we manage it very well. When we have markets like right now where volatility is very high, where there's a lot of fear, we tend to do better. But we also are very careful in markets like the last 10 years where things are going up to the right every day. Our chairman likes to say, if we avoid the losers, the winners will take care of themselves. Nothing can better define the strategy at Oak Tree and how we go about risk management. We benefit by using specialization. My partner, David Quick, spends an inordinate amount of his time working on gaming deals and looking at things in the gaming industry. We believe it's a very attractive sector for us. We have two investments, including this one, once approved, in our current portfolio, and we certainly intend to do more in our next fund. In terms of what we think about ourselves culturally, you know, and I, I said this in my, my hearing two weeks ago, all of our best businesses have great cultures. They've got great leaders. They've got people with integrity, and that's the case at Oak Tree. We have a culture of winning because we have a culture of humility. We have a culture of being focused on what matters uh, and being focused on the big picture and the small details at the same time. When I think about uh, some of the questions this board has posed today on ESG and DNI, you know, we're on the vanguard with that. At our size and scale and our reputation in the marketplace, we have to be out there doing this. We've had ESG as part of our diligence and governance process for many years. We use a qualitative and a quantitative measure when we look at companies to evaluate them on an ESG scale because we want to be looked at when, we, when, we're, when we're tested by our clients, particularly our European clients. We want to be able to prove to them that we've looked at this and taken it seriously and have a real process in place. It's not good enough to say you are. It's, you have to show that you've done the work. In terms of DNI, Jordan and I have been on the council since it was formed several years ago. You know, for us, we talk a lot about our industry and what it looks like and what it could look like. And to develop into something that it could look like, you have to go back and go deep and think differently. You know, we tried for years to try to recruit folks out of the investment banking programs into our, into our funds. It wasn't that successful. So about two years ago, we got together with two of our partners in the industry and created a partnership with the historical black colleges and universities where we, Oak Tree and two of our partners, committed partners capital of $90 million to create a feeder into our firms. So that we're going down the level. We're going down to the schools and trying to get people interested before they begin their careers so they can see a path to something to do it. And it's working. It's going to take time. I mean, these things don't change overnight. The world doesn't change overnight. But we believe, we believe we're taking the right steps right now in doing that. We have a commitment to do that across the board for underrepresented groups. The team Jordan and I managed today has 28 people. This year, we hired three, three new hires, all of which were underrepresented groups. And again, every year will be different, but we're making a commitment to try to make it work every year and grow our business in that way. At the end of the day, we're very excited to be here. This is the end, of, end hopefully, of a, a long journey to get this approval. Uh, but the beginning of a very successful investment, and we're very excited for this to go forward. With that, I'll pause and answer any questions you may have. Commissioner Solis Rainey, start with you. Thank you, Chair Togliati. Um, I just had a quick question. You you touched on it, and I commend your efforts um, with respect to diversity. But um, and I see you have a. It looks like you have a good diversity and inclusion plan. Could you add any numbers to that? I mean, what's it look like now? Yeah, you know, I don't have, I'd love to get you exact stats as we track this very carefully. I mean, the firm actually is very diverse right now. I mean, in terms of our, in terms of what we, when we look at ourselves and we track this on a very granular level, um, the firm on, on, is 50 50 female male. It's, it's very close. To investment professional size where it begins to deviate, right? We're doing better every year in terms of our hiring. And, and, and it's not just hiring, it's, it's hiring and then keeping folks, you know, where we want to keep them. And, and again, giving people the opportunity to move up. Um, we can always do better. Um, I wish I wish I could give you the exact stats. I don't want to shoot from the hip here, but as a follow-up, I'd be happy to send that. No, no problem. Thank you so much. Uh, and I neglected neglected to thank you for being here. We appreciate your patience and um, the presentation. I didn't have any other questions. I the materials were pretty clear. Um, the earlier version of the materials that we we received um, dated May fourth, and I didn't really see too many changes in this version. No, there were no changes in this version. Okay. And we still do have Mr. Quick up and talk about inner block as well. Yeah, no, no problem. I didn't have any other questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have no reservations on the application. Uh, the NGC regulation 15C.010 
sub one, A, B, and C have been met as far as we're concerned. Uh, with that I have no reservations on uh, on recommending approval on this matter. Thank you. Thank you so much for appearing before us. I commend you on being forward thinking. And, and I, I noted something you said, you know, there's DEI, but the, the trend in that direction is DEI with a little D, which is the belonging. And when you mentioned retention, it's not enough just to bring someone in um, for the DEI initiatives, but the retention and the belonging, I think. And so I think it was an astute observation by you that's not lost on me, so. Yeah, listen, we, tr we, we track it very closely and, and there's a lot we do on exit interviews when we have these, particularly with regrettable losses, right? You want to know why? You know, what can we do better to learn from that next time and try to save someone if they if they really not made that choice? But, but it's absolutely the most important. So. Thank you for the materials and the polished presentation. I have no areas of concern. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I additionally have no areas of concern. Um, I think the the agents noted at the time of the investigation, rump the that there's zero derogatory information on individuals in this matter, and it's all pretty um, clean. So at this time, if nobody else has any additional comments or questions, all right, there being none, it appears to be in proper form for a motion. Chair Togliati, I didn't have any questions, but I would like to see the other individuals, if we may. Oh yeah. Um, I guess I misunderstood what we what you said when you said all the application um, materials. I, I should probably have the other individuals come forward because I know you have what one, two, three, four, four, three more. Certainly. I think if it's acceptable, what we'll do is have each of the individuals come up and provide a little bit of their background for just you. Just briefly, I'd like to do just you know, get eyes on them. You have one appearing by Zoom. No. No. We do not chair Tagliati. That was just at the board meeting. Okay. Uh, I just have a note that that Mr. Uh, that Jordan Cruz might appear by Zoom, but you're saying Jordan Cruz is physically present. He is. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank Please. you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'll be very brief here. Uh, Matthew Wilson again, for the record, uh, originally from Cleveland, Ohio. I grew up in the Midwest. Uh, attended the University of Virginia undergrad. Uh, went to New York City after college to start my career in investment banking at Merrill Lynch. Uh, I done, then joined a private equity fund. The world melted down after the first internet blow up in 2000. I'm sure many of you remember that well. Uh, I, I decided to take flip a coin and see if I got into business school. I did. Uh, I attended the Harvard Business School for two years and then came out, thought the recession would be over. It wasn't, uh, but I did okay and found a private equity job and then joined Oakview 15 years ago and have now run the group of Jordan for eight years. I also would like to say for the record, I live in Manhattan Beach, uh, have three beautiful children and a wife of almost 20 years. <laughs> Mr. Cruz, leading by example. <laughs> exactly. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Jordan Cruz. Uh, I was born in Chicago, Illinois. I grew up in Lincolnshire, Illinois, suburb of Chicago. I also attended the University of Virginia, although slightly earlier than Matt, uh, graduating in 1994. Uh, I then attended uh, Northwestern University School of Law, graduating in 1997. I practiced law at Kirkland and Ellis in Chicago for three and a half years. And then I got a great opportunity to join Oak Tree in 2001 and just celebrated my 21st anniversary there. Uh, so basically I've had two real jobs in my life. Um, uh, I've been partners with Matt for almost 15 years now and uh, we were named co-portfolio managers of this strategy in 2014. So I've been running the strategy with him since then. I'm also married. I'm gonna celebrate my 25th anniversary this year. My lovely wife, Jackie, we have three great kids, sons. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now I'll have Mr. Quick come up. Good afternoon. Thank you all for having us. Uh, David Quick, for the record. Uh, I'm going to show these guys up to start with. I have a lovely wife and three children. <laughs> and uh, I was born in a small town in Michigan, Grand Haven, and went to the University of Michigan, moved out to Los Angeles to work at an investment bank for two years, uh, UBS Investment Bank, and then have been at Oak Tree for almost 18 years this summer. And as Matt mentioned, cover all of the Thank you. And then uh, he is no stranger to the commission, but Mr. Connolly is also an applicant, can certainly uh, provide an update to you if you'd like. Anyone? Come on up. Come on up. You're here. Well done, <laughs> um, hi, thank you for having me. Uh, commission, uh, John Connolly, for the record, CEO of Interblock. I've been in gaming for approximately 32 years. Um, I also have a beautiful wife and three children and outnumbered four to one 
in my house, but I have a male dog for the record. So that's, <laughs> that's important to me. Um, anyway, so thank you for the opportunity to have us very excited about the ability of Interblock um, to go to the next chapter in our evolution as a company, global company. <clears throat> Employ several people in Nevada, been here since 2004, looking to hire many more and continue the growth of the company uh, in the future and excited about have uh, have Oak Tree as a partner uh, for, uh, for our future plans. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything we didn't else? have a further affirmative presentation unless there were any particular areas that you wanted to cover. We're of course happy to answer any questions. I don't have any questions. Um, I, you know, the applications were very clean for all the individuals. I just wanted to kind of see who was who. Um, and uh, I appreciate you all being here with us today. Uh, Commissioner Cohen. I have no issues with any applications. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I also appreciate uh, your appearances today. I am, um, and also have no additional questions. If there are no additional questions or comments, um, I think Commissioner Brown is the only one I haven't cross-referenced yet. <laughs> and you have nothing else? I have no questions, comments, or areas concern, and I'm prepared to make a motion unless there's anything else. Okay, um, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Chair Tagliati. I move for approval of non-restricted item number five as recommended by the Gaming Control Board and is read into the record by Madam Secretary. Right, at this time, is there any discussion on uh, Commissioner Brown's motion? All right, there being none, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 And it appears there are none opposed and um, we had one uh, recusal on this matter. Commissioner Key Capper did not participate in, I mean, uh, excuse me, um, am I miss, mucking up my, my recusals for you, Ben? No, I thank you, Madam Chair. I'm recused on this one. And yeah, so you did not vote and did not participate. Um, so um, if there's nothing else, congratulations and thank you for your appearances today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Madam Secretary, if you could please read in non-restricted number seven. I believe we're on number, number six. Six? Yes. Yeah, six. Sorry about that. I have my notes here. Um, do we have a disclosure on, we have two disclosures on six, correct? We have a recusal and a disclosure. So non-restricted okay. number six are the applications of Kenneth Joseph Austin Pawski for licensure as a key executive and key employee of Circus and El Dorado Joint Venture LLC. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval and we do have a recusal and a disclosure. Okay. Um, I'm starting with Mr. Keekeffer, please, Commissioner. Thank you, appreciate it. I need to disclose for the record that I'm a an employee of the law firm Donald Carano. The applicant in this matter is represented by um, an attorney from the firm and based on some pre existing relationship, I to both disclose and excuse myself from considering this matter before us today. Thank you. Okay, so just, just so you know, Commissioner, every, every once in a while, and I don't know if this will be a problem for the audio for the um, recording, you cut in and out, and I don't know if it's your mic, because all day today I've heard every word of everybody else. Um, just the last few times you've spoken, it's in and out, in and out. Um, just so you know. If I speak a little bit more loudly, yes. is that better? Perfect. Perfect. My apologies, Madam Chair. Um, it's not, no problem. Uh, Commissioner Brown, your disclosure? Thank you very much. I do have a disclosure to make for non-restricted item number six. Circus and El Dorado Joint Venture DBA Silver Legacy Resort and Casino is an affiliate of clients, City Center Land LLC, Mandalay Corp and Mandalay Resort Group. Circus Circus Casino Inc. DBA Circus Circus Hotel and Casino Reno also is an affiliate of the City Center Land Mandalay Corp and Mandalay Resort Group. They're all clients of Lewis Roca, the firm where I am a partner in which matters I'm not personally involved. I have no pecuniary interest in the outcome of this agenda item and I do not believe in independence of judgment of a reasonable person in my position would be affected by the relationship described on the record and I therefore I intend, intend to participate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 
Good afternoon. Um, Good afternoon, hear from Madam you. Chair. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission, members of the board, Madam Secretary, my name is A.G. Burnett with the law firm of McDonald Carano. With me here today uh, for your uh, evaluation and hopeful approval is Mr. Ken Ostenpowski. Mr. Ostenpowski is a senior executive with Caesars. And although the titles are fairly long, the long and short of it is he, he runs the row in Reno. Um, Mr. Ostenpowski gave a good record of his background at the board, and he's happy to do the same for you today, should you wish. Otherwise, we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. I'll turn it over to Mr. Ostenpowski. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, members of the commission, members of the board. It's an honor to be here today. It truly is. Um, I uh, uh, started my gaming career uh, in uh, Nevada, um, working for the Lady Luck in the finance department. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll go back a little bit. Uh, I started my career, grew up in uh, Buffalo, New York, um, started my career working for a CPA firm uh, where I received my license in New York. Um, one of our clients was the Lady Luck, uh, and I was part of the initial public offering team uh, and was hired when the aisle uh, acquired them. Um, the aisle then sold that property and moved me out of Nevada into Mississippi, Louisiana, Iowa, Missouri, and while in Missouri, acquired by the El Dorado Corporation. Um, uh, continue to do my best. They offered me opportunities in Ohio, then to uh, Denver and Blackhawk, uh, Colorado. And while there, during the acquisition of Caesars, they offered me to come out and get back to Nevada, where I'm thrilled. Um, special place in my heart. My youngest daughter was born right here in Las Vegas. So uh, happy to and thrilled to be back here today. Um, love running the row. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So, uh, Vice Chair. So let's bring you. Thank you. Um, if you could maybe just give us a, a quick update on how the properties are doing. I was there last weekend and it seemed pretty busy. Yes, thank you. Uh, we couldn't be more happy. You know, the, uh, you know, we've really made an effort to try to bring fun and make people, you know, when they come to visit us, they, they try to forget their challenges. And we've really made a focus on trying to bring fun back and, and make feel people comfortable. We take a lot of pride in, in treating everyone like family. Um, and by doing that, um, it's, we ended up in, in great efforts. Uh, we found that both uh, entertainment wise, hotel wise, and um, gaming wise, um, we're getting, we're, we're, we're uh, doing very well. So I, ha I have no complaints as far as how business levels are concerned. As far as the team is concerned, uh, I'm very blessed with a wonderful team. Many of them have been here many, many years. Um, they gave me the opportunity to learn a lot from them. Um, and so it's uh, uh, in both the team standpoint, as well as uh, the business standpoint, everything is running great. Thank you very much for that update and thank you for being here today. Um, your background looked very clean. You've moved around a lot, but it looks like, you know, you've just been moving for additional opportunities for the company. And I appreciated, I think during the board meeting, you commented you'd stayed in um, Missouri for a while to let your kids all finish school. I thought that was a great commitment to your family as well. Yeah, I had four wonderful children. Uh, one was a lieutenant in the army. One decided to enter the gaming industry and tour in school and, um, you know, I was offered three opportunities actually for with, within the company to move and become general manager out of finance into that. But I really wanted to make sure my kids had some stability during um, their high school years. Thank you for that. And uh, oh, I have a great wife too. So. <laughs> You're about to get in trouble. <laughs> I, also, I have a, a, a female lab of 15 years who uh, helped me. <laughs> she won't hold it again. She's the lab. <laughs> the wife, I'm not sure. Um, well, thank you for your presentation. I don't have any other questions. Your background is very clean and uh, we're happy to have somebody of your experience back in Nevada. You know, wish you were in Las Vegas, but hey, you know, I'll have to do. Commissioner Cohen? I have zero issues with your application. Thank you, sir. Just some quick questions about uh, the lien issues that arose. Um, yes. Just for clarity of record, was your wife in, in charge of the finances? Were you involved or your ex-wife? I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's, it's those years of moving, we moved every basically two years were a bit surreal. And, and frankly, to be honest with you, I didn't realize they were even liens. I mean, I got a bill back when I moved from, from Nevada originally to uh, Mississippi and, and not even realizing they were liens. I'm like, oh, I owe this. Okay, let's pay it. I like to think that I made those payments very quickly as soon as I know that. 
and similarly um, uh, with the one in I, I think it was Mississippi. Um, you know, in today's world, I uh, um, with electronics and not things getting lost in the mail <laughs> as you move four young children from place to place to place. They're all grown now, so um, no reason to be to get lost in the shuffle. So it was strictly you have no oversight. issues since you've had no issues since no that was issues since so. And then the row employees about. 1,800 full-time employees and 355 part-time employees. That's is correct. there an issue now in terms of retention or are you low on the employee side? Do you need more? How's that going? Yeah, so uh, hiring continues to be a challenge. You know, we would, uh, we, we put in referral programs, uh, retention programs. Um, uh, we've just hired a new uh, uh, vice president of human resources to work on that. We've added lots, lots and lots and lots of uh, employee uh, uh events, experiences, letting them know and let them know that they're part of our family. So um, it, it's a fascinating place because there is so much long-term activity. It's just that small percentage that continues to turn. And, um, but that all being said, it, it, I would like to say the labor market is strong, but it's still a challenge to today. And how many vacancies are there approximately that you're trying to fill at this time? We probably approximately around 300 vacancies. So substantial. It, it is substantial and it, particularly, you know, in, in areas the, the market's changed a lot. Housing, it's not an anomaly, though. Uh, yeah, housing is a challenge up in, in Reno. Our valley is getting full, and so it's a challenge. Thank you. I have no areas of concern. Um, I have no areas of concern. I would um, note that during the presentation of the investigation materials, it was commented on that you are well-respected everywhere you've worked, which I think is a commentary on your um certainly uh, speaks well of you and your suitability and i have no concerns so unless anybody else has any additional questions it would appear that it is proper for a motion there appearing Thank to be you, no Daddy. go ahead um i would move for approval of non-restricted item number six as read into the record by um madam secretary and recommended by the game control any discussion on the motion there being none, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, it appears that there are uh, none opposed. Thank you, uh, sir, and congratulations. We appreciate your patience and appearance today. And the record Thank should you reflect. Very much. Thank, you all. Thank you. Commissioner Key Keffer did not participate in the discussion or vote on this matter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, if none of my fellow commissioners need a, at some point, we're going to have to take a comfort break. I'm going to rely on any one of you to tell me in between items when that will be. If we could take a break after the next item, that would be great. Okay, perfect. Uh, Madam Secretary, please read in non-restricted number seven. Non-restricted number seven is the application of Sean Joseph McBurney for licensure as a key executive and or key employee of Desert Palace LLC, Corner Investment Company LLC, Flamingo Las Vegas Operating Company LLC, Harris Las Vegas LLC, Paris Las Vegas Operating Company LLC, Parball Nuco LLC, Rio Properties LLC, PHWLV LLC, and LV Nuco LLC as noted on the agenda. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval and I believe we have disclosures on this item. All right, I will start with Commissioner Keefer first. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, I need to disclose that I'm an employee of the law firm McDonald Carano. McDonald Carano does provide um, various legal services for Caesars Entertainment, uh, but not related to this matter or the applications before us. Um, and I don't believe that the independence of judgment of a reasonable person would be affected by um, this relationship. Therefore, I will be prepared to vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also previously disclosed um, that when Ms. Ogerberg appears, I normally make a disclosure, although I don't believe it's a conflict, I do so in an abundance of caution that she is a member of the Greenberg Trout Firm, which is a big law firm. Occasionally I have um, uh, opportunities to work with different attorneys from different firms, um, Greenberg being one of them. In my mediation practice, I am uh, ordinarily paid by the client. It's never a gaming case, nor do I uh, have gaming clients, um, but I make this, um, I have no pecuniary interest in this matter. I do not believe the independence and judgment of a reasonable person in my position would be affected by the uh, information I disclose and therefore I intend to participate um, and vote on this item. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon again, Chair Tagliati, Commissioners, Madam Secretary. For the record, Erica Okerberg. Here with me today is the applicant, Mr. McBurney. 
Mr. McBurney is before you in connection with his roles as regional president of Las Vegas for Caesars, as well as property roles for general manager of Caesars Palace in the Cromwell. As I indicated at the board meeting, he has been with Caesars in various roles and had a successful career for nearly 16 years, uh, but he has never before been licensed by the commission. So as usual, we'd like to ask him to provide a little bit of his background for you, as well as his current job duties and responsibilities. Mr. McBurney. Good afternoon, Chair Togliotti, commissioners, Madam Secretary, members of the board. It is really a privilege for me to be here today in consideration of my licensure. I've lived in Las Vegas for 16 years. I've worked for Caesars Entertainment the entire time. I'm originally from Southeast Ohio. I went to college at a small engineering school in Flint, Michigan, Kettering University, formerly GMI. I worked for General Motors throughout my time in college. I graduated as a mechanical engineer and stayed on with General Motors at their Detroit Hamtramck assembly plant. I then went to Stanford Business School in the second year of business school. Harris Entertainment was doing on-campus recruiting. That's where I learned about the industry. That's where I learned about the company. I was hired into their President's Associates program, which is effectively an onboarding program for people that are exiting business school. They have a desire to work in the industry, but haven't done so. My first real job at Harris was managing a six-person junior host team at Harris Las Vegas. I then moved into gaming operations as the director of uh, slot performance for Harris, Flamingo, and O'Shea's. I then moved back into casino marketing, run, running the casino marketing teams for those properties. When Harris acquired Planet Hollywood, I moved over to Bally's Paris and Planet Hollywood to run casino marketing there, and then moved over to run VIP marketing for the western half of the country. And after that, I moved into general management as the AGM for Bally's Paris and Planet Hollywood, then the general manager for Caesars Palace, and I've been in my current role since February of 2021. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm going to start with uh, Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair uh, Solis Rainey. Thank you. So how have we avoided, or how have you avoided being before us before? But the roles didn't require it. And I think the, the position of the prior leadership at Caesars, just those that were required to go through for licensure went through for licensure. How long were you general manager at Caesars? I was general manager at Caesars Palace for approximately six or seven years. Um, I didn't have any substantive questions. Your application was very clean. Um, looks like you have a, a big job. Um, I'd be interested in you giving us just kind of a brief overview how you split your time among sure. properties. You know, we have a very unique operating philosophy on how we operate and market the nine properties in Las Vegas. It's very coordinated and it's very aligned. So my time is effectively evenly spread across all the properties as the leadership team at each of the property, we create the operating plans that then goes to those property operators to execute against those and run the business on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Thank you so much. I don't have anything further. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, Mr. McBurney. Afternoon. Um, I have absolutely no issues with your application. I did want to state one, you won't remember this, but I met you in 2014, give or take in a meeting in Gary Selesner's office. Mm -hmm. He popped in for something unrelated to why I was meeting with Mr. Selesner. And to show you the way things are, are, are meant to be, at the conclusion of the introduction, he just says, he's gonna be my successor. <laughs> this was eight years ago when he said he would be president of Caesars. And of course, this was before all, you know, all the mergers. So you know, good for you, and I'm happy to support your application. Thank you very much, very humbling. Thank you for appearing before us today, and thank you for your time. Can you talk to me a little bit about um, your foundation and board work with Dignity Health and St. Rose and how that interest came about? Sure. A friend of mine, uh, Larry Bernard, was the CEO of, actually at the time he was the CEO of UMC. And it was, I believe it was 2014, where we hosted the Survivor's Dinner for UMC, which is one of the most uh, powerful experiences you, you, can, you can have. He was the CEO at the time, and we... Uh, became friends. He then moved to Dignity Health and asked if I would join the foundation board. And I'm currently on the community board. Um, you know, as a community board member, it's our responsibility to provide the perspective of the community to uh, Dignity and ensure that they're uh, delivering the right qualities of care and to help them with their mission, which is to improve the health care of those that, those that uh, they serve. You know, we have 20,000 team members in Southern Nevada. And so they, Dignity does a lot for our team members and it's a great honor and responsibility to help support those that support us. Well, congratulations on your trajectory. Thank you. um, I didn't know you before, but I'm proud of you anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Um, 
Commissioner Keycapper, you're. Yeah, I have no matter. I have no questions, Madam Chair. Thank you for appearing. Thank you. All right. Um, I also don't have any uh, um, concerns or questions for you related to this uh, item, and I believe unless there's something additional that someone has to add, um, that it's right for a motion. Madam Chair, I would move for approval of non-restricted agenda item number seven as read into the record by Madam Secretary and recommended by the Gaming Control Board. Any discussion on the motion? There being none at this time, uh, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All right, well, it appears uh, it's unanimous and there are none opposed. Thank you very much for your patience and your appearance today uh, and congratulations. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, as requested, uh, we're going to take a um, uh, five. 10 minute, five, five. five minute break. Yeah. Five minute break. I only ask because there might be some pizza coming, so we might need another quick five minute break. So I don't want to make the breaks too long. That's fine. Sorry, and thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Okay, five minute break. Thank you.
Chair, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. You guys ready? We are good to go. Okay. Um, so just to make sure we're, we're on number eight, correct? That is correct. All right. Um, Madam Secretary, please read in non-restricted number eight. Non-restricted number eight is the application of Genting Burhat for a continuous or delayed public offering. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval. I believe we have a disclosure on this item. Okay, uh, I would, uh, I think I'm the only one, correct, on this item. Yeah. So when Ms. Uh, Okerberg um, represents an applicant, I always make the same disclosure. I would incorporate here in reference the disclosure I made 20 minutes ago um, on the previous application and ask you to proceed. Wonderful, good afternoon again, Chair Tagliati, Commissioners, Madam Secretary. For the record, Erica Oberberg. I am outside gaming counsel to the company. Here with me today is the General Counsel and SVP of Government Affairs, Gerald Gardner for Resorts World. Uh, as I did at the board meeting, I'd like to make just a few introductory <coughs> remarks regarding the shelf. First, Ginting Burhead has had a shelf since 2016, which makes this the second renewal. There are no immediate plans to use the shelf, though of course we will keep the board and commission updated if there are any changes. Genting Burhead does meet the requirements of Regulation 16.115. They have a class of securities on the Bursa Malaysia Stock Exchange that exceeds 10 million in shareholder equity, and they have filed all required reports within the timing required. With that, I would like to ask Mr. Gardner to provide an update on Resorts World if that's acceptable. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair Tagliati, very nice to see you, members of the commission, members of the board, Madam Secretary, thank you for allowing me to appear in lieu of uh, our CFO from Genting Berhad in Malaysia, uh, Ms. Wang Yi Fun, who was here in March before you, I believe. Uh, in that time, uh, in the past two months, Resorts World Las Vegas uh, has enjoyed a pretty exciting few months as we've seen the, the city in general, the strip in general, uh, come out of the last COVID variant. Uh, we are seeing, uh, uh, as we approach our one year anniversary, believe it or not, uh, June of this year, we are seeing uh, great performance at the hotel and the casino in our food and beverage uh, operations. Um, and uh, in fact, are seeing sellout weekends just about every weekend since we last appeared in front of you in March. Um, so, um, we have some exciting things going on in the, in the next few weeks. We have Carrie Underwood uh, uh, on uh, site uh, this week through the end of, uh, of this week, uh, performing in our theater. Uh, we have uh, Katie Perry coming back at the end of May and will be performing through June. Uh, we have a, a top ranked boxing uh, working in partnership with ESPN uh, with a title fight uh, this Saturday at Resorts with Las Vegas. So we're very excited about the entertainment and, um, and the performance in general, 100% sold out across all three of our brands, uh, Hilton, Conrad, and Crockford's. And so we're looking forward to a, a very, very exciting summer. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I hope that was light enough. I was trying to be ultra light um, and happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, we appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. I don't have any um, substantive questions. Thank you for that update. That's uh, That was gonna be my only question is uh, I'd like hearing how the property is doing and I'm happy that it's doing as well as um, we had hoped uh, since you're, you're, I think somebody was before us a few months ago. Uh, and it's good to put a face with the name. Thank you. Thank you. No question. I have nothing uh, on this application. Nice to see you again, Mr. Gardner. Um, uh, you know, I fully support this application. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And this is the, the company's third shelf approval, correct? For a three year period? Yes, yep. that is correct. Okay, that's straightforward. I have no questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you for appearing in person. My pleasure. Thank you. No questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. So, um, putting a name with the face. Um, I've known I've known you since we were DAs in the 90s, and uh, both of our faces have changed quite a bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> boy, um, you have all gray hair. <laughs> I do. I do, in fact. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, that's funny. Okay, well, I... Um, <laughs> and that, that has nothing to do with my beautiful wife or my three kids. <laughs> well played. Um, but we both went in very different directions uh, for many, many years, and now here we are at, um, kind of come full circle, so that's very interesting. But um, enough about uh, that. I have no questions about uh, the item. Um, and unless there's any additional comments or questions, I would um, say that it's proper for a motion. Um, just a quick uh, question, Ms. Silkelberg. That we have a order, but it doesn't say, it says draft one dated 413, but it references a revised order registration dated May 9th, or I'm sorry, May 20th. Yes, that is that correct. We have reviewed one. it and we do believe it's improper. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to make a motion unless anyone has anything. I would move for approval of non-restricted item number eight as read into the record by Secretary Bell and recommended by the Game Control. Any discussion on the motion? All right, there being none, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, it appears there are none opposed. Thank you. Thank you for your patience today, Mr. Gardner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Secretary, please read in non-restricted number 12. Non-restricted 12 are the applications of Phyllis Ann Gillen for a finding of suitability and or licensure as an officer, director, manager, and or key executive of Golden Entertainment Inc., Golden Casinos Nevada LLC, Golden Holdings Inc., 77 Golden Gaming LLC, Golden Gaming LLC, Stratosphere Gaming LLC, Aquarius Gaming LLC, Arizona Charlie's LLC, Fresca LLC, Colorado Bell Gaming LLC, and Edgewater Gaming LLC, as noted on the agenda, the recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval. Good morning, um, Madam Chair, Commissioners, um, Board, and Secretary Bell. Thank you, Phyllis Gilland, General Counsel, Compliance Officer, and um, Secretary for Golden Entertainment. Uh, I am happy to give you a bit of background or go straight to questions, whatever you would like. If I may, just briefly, just for consistency of the record, I made a prior disclosure that you're an employee of Golden Entertainment, and um, it's a client of Louis Roca, the firm where I'm a partner, but it's not connected with anything that's here today. And I have no pecuniary interest in the outcome of this agenda item. And I don't believe independence of judgment of a reasonable person in my position would be affected by the relationship described on the record. And therefore, I, therefore, I tend to participate today. Thank you. Just for consistency purposes. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'd like to hear just a quick presentation, if you don't mind. Sure, absolutely. Um, I have a handsome husband and three stepkids. <laughs> Start there. Uh, <laughs> somebody had to go that way. Um, uh, graduated from Allegheny College back in the medieval days and um, <laughs> went straight to KPMG, where I did uh, mergers and acquisitions and finance. I took a law school during the day and accounting at night. I was crazy and um, went from uh, KPMG into a, um, a smaller company, um, went from KPMG to Principal Financial Group where I was general counsel for Principal International when I left, did a lot of mergers and acquisitions internationally, um, went to back to the construction, a national construction company, back to Principal Financial Group, and then um, uh, back to the construction company, was, fun days. Uh, that company, um, the material owner passed away. We began to sell off the divisions of that company. One of them was here in Las Vegas. I came out to Las Vegas um, with somewhat full intentions to retire. I had done a lot of work with Goldman Sachs. They were acquiring Colorado Icons, um, American Casinos at the time, which was the Stratosphere, two Arizona Charlies, and the Aquarius in Laughlin and um, decided to be general counsel for them for a little while and uh, Golden acquired them in 2000, October 2017 and I am still here. When you were at KPMG, were you an accountant or? I was on the tax side. I was on the tax side. Mm -hmm. okay. I noticed your undergraduate was in political science. Yes. Okay. That's why I took accounting at night. <laughs> I had good advice somewhere along the way that it was smart to do something besides just law in school. So political science was back then the standard to law school. How, uh, how large was Carson Taylor Construction in uh, April 20, uh, 2007, I believe, when it filed chapter um, seven? That was when the uh, uh, senior person passed away. We were right around a billion dollars. 
in Parson 2000. Taylor was here. It was here in town. The whole company was right around a billion dollars. Right. I'm asking in, in 2007, how large of a company was it when it was chapter seven? Um, most of the work had died off at that point. So it wasn't very large at all at that point. And uh, tell me a little bit about how your compliance uh, function is structured. I know you've appeared, we're very familiar with you having appeared in different matters, but I don't know that much about the company structure. Um, compliance is, reports up to me and obviously to the board, compliance committee and to the board. Um, we have a top-down compliance uh, atmosphere. It's very important. Um, it's very important to me. So I have a uh, compliance um, VP who works under me. He has responsibility. We all have responsibility for AML, compliance, investigations, background checks, everything you can think of. So we have um, we have a centralized system. Everything goes through the central uh, corporate offices. And we have uh, regional people in each office that manage the uh, various casinos and taverns. When you say in each office, do each you mean casino, in each, each gaming property? Each okay. gaming property. How large is your compliance staff? Um, I have nine people right now and looking for more. And those are all um, housed at the corporate level? Uh, some are housed at Stratosphere and some are housed at Aquarius. Okay. All right. I don't have any further questions. Thank you so much for appearing. Commissioner Cohen. I hate to say this, but I don't have any questions. <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> Thank Mr. You. Brown. <laughs> Thank you for appearing today. Um, how did you migrate from the financial and construction industry into the gaming industry? I don't quite understand how that happened. You know, all of the industries that I have been in have been very regulated. As an international um, GC, I worked a lot in antitrust and every, I did, I had offices in eight countries and we did business in about 12. So it was very regulated. So it, it sounds, sort of as a departure, but it really wasn't because of the regulatory requirements. So my background is very regulated. Insurance was regulated, um, banking was regulated, the construction uh, very regulated on different manner, but so it was regulatory brought me that direction. So a natural fit for you. Yeah, I mean, obviously had to learn the business side. I take really pride in learning the business side because I don't think you can be a general counsel and be very effective or compliance or backgrounds or litigation if you don't understand how the business works. So, you know, obviously a little bit of a curve there. No, I appreciate that. And um, I understand that the Colorado Bell Hotel and Casino Laughlin, they're still closed. They have been closed since March of 2020. Can you tell me what the landscape looks like in Laughlin right now? Um, the two properties are doing a very, very well. Um, we are we have the same problems everybody else does with finding people and and particularly um, guest room attendants and uh, people to uh, uh, for restaurants etc. So for right now that landscape is um, under consideration. We've made an uh, indication to try and decide what that would be by 2024. Thank you. And then if you could just briefly tell us about your work with the Global Gaming Women Education Fund, I thought. <laughs> Sounded interesting. I wanted to hear. Thank you. Yes. About 12 years ago, Patty Becker, who has a little bit of experience with the board, and I were doing some work together. Steve uh, Ducharme was our independent committee member, and so I met Patty through her husband. And Patty said, you know what we need to do? We need to put this group together and um, make it called Global Gaming Women. And I said, sure. And it's 16 years later, basically, and that is now global. Um, Patty uh, started that along with myself, um, Christy Eichelman from GLI and some other people. And we, I was president of that organization for about three years. Uh, Christy Eichelman was president from GLI and Cassie Stratford now is president from Boyd. So still, still involved, uh, Virginia McDowell from Isle. We have met lots and lots of people and we've, we've helped lots and lots of women. It's been a very rewarding experience. I would never have anticipated it because you kind of get into your own head and your career goes. And you, so it was very rewarding to have people say, wow, thanks for providing that opportunity. We don't know how you did it. You know, this is great. So it's been a very rewarding part of um, things that I've been involved in. I'm, I have a big interest in education and we provide a lot of education for a lot of people. We took a little downtime during COVID, but we're back and running. Well, I commend you for your involvement with that. Thank it's you. important for the community. And I appreciate your time. And good for me. Thank you. I have no further questions.
Commissioner Kiefer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no questions. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I also have no additional questions beyond what's been asked, and I appreciate your patience today and your appearance. Um, no at this, appreciate it. thank you. At this time, um, it appears ripe for a motion. Chair, I'm prepared to move forward for approval of the non-restricted item number 12 as recommended by the Gaming Control Board and is read into the record by Madam Secretary. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the motion? There being none, all in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. And it appears there's none opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Madam Secretary, please read in non-restricted number 13. Non-restricted number 13 is the application of Jacobs Entertainment Inc. for the pledge as noted on the agenda. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval. I believe we have Mr. Kramer um, participating via Zoom. Yes, we should. There he is. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the commission and Madam Secretary. Um, my name is Erin Elliott with the law firm Brownstein Hyatt Farber Schreck and appearing with me today via Zoom is Brett Kramer. Um, he is the CFO of Jacobs Entertainment um, who I'm appearing on behalf of today. Um, Jacobs Entertainment recently entered into a credit agreement whereby it pledged its interest in the Nevada licensees. And as you know, that uh, pledge, those pledges are not effective without commission approval. And that's why we're here today. Um, Mr. Kramer and I can help answer any questions you may have um, on the application or about Jacobs operations in general. Good hey, Hi, um, thank you. Uh, I just had time. a quick, go, ahead. go ahead. I just had a quick question with the timeline. You had some exciting um, plans for the Reno real estate development, and I just wonder what the timeline was on that. Sure, Mr. Kramer can speak to that. Sure. Yeah, th this is a, a pretty long range uh, experience for us. We started this back in 2016, I believe, and we've uh, acquired uh, 42 properties over that time under Jacobs Entertainment and another 18 properties uh, through related entity. Um, we've been working on them systematically since then. We got slowed down a little bit by COVID, but um, we're, making, we're making progress. Our first uh, housing uh, units that we put together was Renova Flats, and we opened that slightly uh, before COVID hit. And then we broke ground on another 60 unit apartment building uh, complex uh, actually about a week ago, with an expectation of opening that in fall of 2023. And in the meantime, we're also developing this uh, Reno's Neon Line District uh, for festival grounds and outdoor entertainment and a live work play environment um, that Mr. Jacobs with his urban development background has envisioned. And uh, we're excited to uh, be working on that and moving through that over the next uh, couple of years. Thank you. Is the Re Reno Neon Line District something you're working on just on your own with your company, or is this something you're collaborating with other operators? Um, we are doing some of it ourselves, and we are also uh, looking for other developers as well. So we've, we've listed a couple properties uh, to, to look for other developers because we can't obviously bring all of that to fruition fast enough to, to develop the area. Okay. Thank you so much. I don't have any further questions. Mr. Cohen? I have, I have no question. Brown, Commissioner Brown? Just for clarity of the record, uh, so the maturity date on the five-year credit agreement with the three lending institutions, Capital One, Credit Suisse, and Western Alliance Bank um, is February 4th, 2027. I believe that's correct. Yes. And the credit line's increasing from 50 to 80 million. That's correct. All right, and then JEI increased its issued notes from 385 to the 500 million, is that accurate? That's correct. All right, and um, you're intending to use it for um, liquidity to develop the area and sands, is that also accurate? Yes. Okay, I, you know, it's straightforward. I have no questions, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner yeah. Keycapper. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is pretty straightforward, but since you're here, I'm going to take the opportunity. Um, so what is the status of the renovations at the Sands? How far along are you in terms of turning over those rooms? 
It, it is a process. Uh, we've, we've got three towers here. We've completed uh, one of the towers. Uh, we're working on the second tower right now. It's probably going to be another, it'll be uh, probably March, April of, of next year when we complete all of that. And then we, depending on the costs and, and where we are with, with uh, the costs of uh, getting this done, we may go further into the third, third tower as well. Okay, can you tell me a little bit about the acquisition of the gold and silver? They have a non-restricted um, license um, in a grandfather location. Um, it's right across the street from another unrestricted licensee that you have. So um, tell me about your plans for the gold and silver. Yeah, uh, right now that uh, property was acquired by our parent company, um, Jacobs Investments Inc. Um, that will be operated by the current owner for uh, likely a couple of years. And then at that time, it's likely that JEI would, would become the operator of, of that entity. Um, Mr. Jacobs has, uh, has this vision of a, of a non-smoking uh, casino environment to try out. So that's kind of what he's envisioning for, for that property, but it's, it also fits in with us expanding the area um, and, and with the Reno's uh, district. So the, the plan would be to develop a new um, a, a new casino on that location. No, no, I think that, we, I think license. he will. I think he he will he will improve it, but he will probably maintain it as it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Council and Mr. Kramer. Uh, I have no additional questions. Um, I believe it's pretty straightforward. And unless there's something else, I'm going to. Uh, I think it's in proper form for a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move that uh, we approve non-restricted item number 13 as recommended by the board and read into the record by Madam Secretary. Any discussion on the motion? There being none uh, at this time, all in favor say aye. Aye. Did everybody else vote? <laughs> I'm just checking. Okay, um, and I also <clears throat> am in favor of the motion. So there appears to be none, none opposed. Um, Thank you for your patience today and your appearance in answering our questions. Great Thank much. you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Madam Secretary, if you could please read in non-restricted number 14. Non-restricted number 14 are the applications of Elko Resorts Operator LLC and Wendover Resorts Operator LLC for the pledges and to grant possessory security interest as noted on the agenda. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval with the conditions as noted on the agenda. And I believe we have a recusal on this item. Thank you, I do have to recuse. My esteemed partner, Mr. Light, good to see you. Um, we work together at the law firm of Blues Roca, so I will be recusing myself and stepping out. Thank you. All right, um, there being no additional um, disclosures or recusals at this time, um, counsel, if you could um, address who's with you there today and, and advise us of any information you want us to know. Uh, certainly. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Togliati, members of the Commission, Madam Secretary. For the record, my name is Glenn Light with the law firm Lewis Roker, and I'm accompanied at the podium by Eric Person, who is the president of the Wendover and Alco Properties, and Corey Hatton, who is the treasurer. Also in attendance is Justin Bautram, who is chief operating officer. Uh, so by way of background, in September of 2021, Maverick Gaming, which uh, serves as a landlord for the Wendover and Alco licensees, refinanced its existing debt. Uh, the refinance was secured by a pledge of the membership interests of the four licensees, and that's why we're here today to uh, request the approval of those pledges. Um, Mr. Hatton is here to answer any questions that you have regarding the pledge, but uh, that's, that's our affirmative presentation. Excuse me. I'm going to start with uh, Commissioner Solis Rainey. Uh, thank you. I didn't have any questions regarding the pledge. Um, I did have a follow-up question. Is um, Mr. Beltram or Ms. McCabe here? Yes, Mr. Beltram is. I just had a quick follow-up question, Mr. Beltram. When we were uh, you were before us last month, I had a question regarding your um, bankroll issues, and I believe I, I asked if. Um, there had been a month when your bankroll had fallen below the minimum requirement and you indicated it had not? 
I just want to make sure I understood that correctly. What, what was the bank, the minimum bank fraud requirement? I had asked about your um, bank fraud monitoring, mm -hmm. um, and I asked Ms. McCabe if that was an issue with whether they were um, whether that you had the appropriate amount or whether it was a reporting issue. And she indicated that you were not reporting it properly, but the funds were there. Mm -hmm. And then you followed up with that and said that 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 was the case that it had never fallen. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood. It seemed inconsistent with kind of where we were, so uh, yeah. I wanted to make sure that I understood that properly. Yeah, it was. It was more. It was an issue of the reporting and the paperwork as opposed to the funds. We've always had funds within our accounts. So. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. And like I said, it just seemed inconsistent with some. So I, I wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Um, I don't have any further questions. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I have no questions regarding the uh, the issue of the pledge, and I'm, I appreciate you clearing up uh, uh, Vice Chair's comments regarding the bankroll requirement because that was a concern that I also had. Commissioner Keekepper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no questions about the applications in front of us. Thank you. Okay, so Council, you've had an opportunity, um, obviously, to go through the conditions that were uh, recommended by the board. Um, do you have anything to comment on there or elaborate on? Uh, no, so by way of an update, um, you know, two of the commission, uh, two of the conditions require that we um, file a compliance plan, and and we have done that. It's still it it was in draft format. Game and Control Board is reviewing um, as as we speak, and then for the uh, uh, revolving fund, you know, as soon as that condition goes into effect, we will go ahead and and fund that. Okay. Um, does does anybody have any questions about the conditions or the comments of council before I call for a motion? Okay. Um, at this time, does anyone have a motion or do you have a motion? It appears one of you might do that now. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I would move for for uh, approval of non-restricted agenda item number fourteen as read into the record by Madam Secretary and recommended by the Gaming Control Board. All right, is there any discussion on the motion? There being none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All right, it appears um, that the motion is granted and there were none opposed. Thank you very much for your patience and appearances today and answering our questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'll wait for Commissioner Brown to come back and then I'll call number 16. Non-restricted number 16 is the application of United Coin Machine Company doing business at Century Gaming Technologies, doing business at Moulin Rouge Hotel and Casino for a non-restricted gaming license. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval with the condition as noted on the agenda. I believe we have a disclosure on this item. Yes, thank you so much. Um, RAH Capital, the owner of the land, retained the applicant and is a client of Lewis Roca, the firm where I'm a partner, in which matters I'm not personally involved. I have no pecuniary interest in the outcome of this agenda item, and I do not believe the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in my position would be affected by the relationship described on the record, and I therefore intend to participate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, if you yeah. could please state your appearance. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Debbie Cornine. I am the Director of Compliance for Century Gaming, and I am here today uh, regarding the application for um, the, uh, the application that was filed simply to retain the property's non restricted grandfathered rights at the uh, property formerly known as the Moulin Rouge. Uh, this is a standard application that we have filed numerous times before and have completed uh, what we refer to as a one day operation um, to retain those grandfathered rights for um, our client, RAH Capital, um, in regard to this matter. And also um, appearing with me today is Mr. Glenlight. If you have any questions regarding the operation itself, I think that it would be um, in um, the best interest of our for Mr. Light to answer those questions. And for the record, Mr. Light does not represent the applicant, correct? He, uh, no, I, I, no, I'm sorry, he does not represent. We are the applicant. He represents the um, the um, operator in this. I just want to make sure my disclosure is accurate. Yes, so no, run into I'm sorry. Uh, Center Gaming is the applicant. Thank you. My apologies. No need to apologize. Thank you. I just had a quick question. Uh, the that property had um, 
had burnt down. Is this uh, one day operation going to be in a tent? It will be in a trailer. In a trailer. Actually, yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Typically, we use a, a large um, construction type trailer okay. for these operations when there is no building or tent available. And there's going to be like Sentry Gaming staff. It will be completely operated by Sentry Gaming with Sentry Gaming staff and security over it. Um, and I had a question regarding plans for the property, and I don't know if that's more appropriate to ask of Mr. Light. That would be Mr. Light. Sure. As you know, that property has just a rich history with it being on the National Register of Historic Places, and it was very central to racial integration and such. So I was just wondering if there was any plans for the property. Yeah, so uh, for the record, uh, Glenn Light with the law firm Lewis Roker. Uh, I represent RAH Capital, which uh, acquired, the, acquired the land. Um, RAH is uh, very um, familiar with the uh, historic nature of that property, and uh, that will certainly be taken into account when they um, uh, develop their plans. They are currently working with an architect to come up with those plans, but uh, the importance of the um, of the property will certainly be reflected uh, within those plans. Okay, thank you so much. I don't have any further questions. Commissioner Cohen. I have no questions. Commissioner Brown? Nothing, thank you. Um, Commissioner Keith Pepper? No questions, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, well, um, I appreciate, again, I've been saying this a lot today because it's true. We do appreciate your patience uh, and your appearance today to answer questions and update us on the status of the property. Um, I was going to ask that very question myself, so thank you for, for doing that. Um, and it would appear that this matter is uh, ripe for a motion. Thank you, Chair Tagliati. I would move for approval of non-restricted item number 16 as read into the record by Secretary Bell and recommended by the Game Director. Board. Any discussion on the motion? All right, there being no discussion on the motion, um, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All right, uh, it appears that uh, all were in favor and none were opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Secretary, um, please read in non-restricted number 17. Non-restricted number 17 are the applications of IAC Interactive Corp for registration as a publicly traded corporation and for a finding of suitability as a beneficial owner of MGM Resorts International. You also have the applications of Barry Charles Diller and Joseph Michael Levin for finding of suitability as a beneficial owner and controlling beneficial owner as an officer and or director as noted on the agenda. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval. Okay. Hey. Good afternoon. Um, okay. Go ahead. Oh, good afternoon, Chair Tagliati, Commissioners, uh, Secretary Bell. For the record, Sean McGinnis with Butler Snow on behalf of MGM Resorts International, which is a component of this application. I'll, I'll be introducing the MGM parties who are here. Uh, in the audience, we have Barry Diller, who's the director of, of MGM Resorts International, and Joseph Levin, who's also a director. Also in attendance is John McManus, Executive Vice President and General Counsel and Secretary of MGM Resorts International. Also in attendance is Pat Madamba, Senior Vice President Legal Counsel for MGM Resorts International. And we also have Harry Jackson, who's a partner at Fox Rothschild, who's outside counsel for MGM Resorts International and has been involved with Mr. Diller and Mr. Levin's applications on a multi-jurisdictional basis. And those are the MGM appearances. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Tagliati, members of the commission members of the board, Secretary Bell, Marin Perry, for the record, I'm with the law firm of Ballard Spar, and I represent IAC Interactive Corp, which is the applicant for registration as a publicly traded company. As far as our, those we have in appearance today, we also have applications for Mr. Barry Diller and Mr. Joey Levin, um, but in different capacities, Mr. Diller is making application as beneficial owner and controlling beneficial owner, as well as chairman and senior executive, and Mr. Levin as chief executive officer and director. And uh, with me also in the audience is Michael Fabius, who works with IAC and is with my office in, um, in Philadelphia and also handles multi-jurisdictional aspects of the application. Um, we are prepared to 
proceed with either the individual or corporate portions. Um, Mr. Levin does have a, a brief affirmative presentation if you would like it. I recognize you had likely had the opportunity to review um, the information from the board in March and will follow your lead. Okay, go ahead and make your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll try to do this quickly as I know uh, that you've all seen the materials. Uh, IEC is in the business of Sir, building. state your name for the record. Oh, sorry. My name is Joseph Levin, uh, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm chief executive officer of IEC and uh, director of MGM. Uh, I've been with IEC for almost 20 years and uh, uh, with MGM since we got involved in the business recently. I, uh, IEC is in the business of building businesses. We have we started out. Uh, if we go back to the beginning, which was before my time, um, well, uh, Mr. Diller bought a business called Silver King, which was a collection of broadcast antennas, and started in the media business and evolved that media business over time into a collection of internet businesses. And uh, ultimately, we've we've done a, a number of consumer internet businesses. And the one thing that we've done that's somewhat unique for uh, businesses like ours or publicly traded companies is that we significantly frequently uh, spin off businesses at IC. And so we've we've created, built a lot of businesses, some from scratch, some by buying businesses and putting things together. And ultimately we've given uh, many businesses to our shareholders directly. Um, uh, the getting involved in MGM is, is new for us and uh, exciting venture for us. We saw a great opportunity uh, when others didn't, which is something that IEC is, is proud to try and do often in our past. And uh, we saw a fantastic business in the um, uh, resorts and casino business and an incredible uh, opportunity uh, online there too, which is something that we're familiar with. And that's what brought us here and into MGM. I could go on for a while about the various businesses in IAC currently in our, in our past, but that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, please have um, Mr. Levin expand about the number of employees um, maybe the DEI initiatives to the extent they exist, and also curious about whether or not um, you have a percentage of people working remotely. If you could just touch on those while you're up here. Sure. Yep. We have about 13,000 employees um, all over the country and all over the world. Uh, most of them, almost all of them were in offices two years ago. Uh, it's a little more than two years ago now. And uh, at the moment, very few of them are in offices, uh, but we do uh, have have, we have started to bring people back and the uh, presence in offices continues to grow. Uh, DEI is uh, certainly very important to us. One of the things that we've done uh, to try and advance the agenda of getting, we've done a decent job, I think a pretty good job of uh, gender diversity in IAC in the, throughout the organization, including in the executive ranks. At, we have a lot of different businesses in IAC and at, at uh, any given point, it could be 50-50 male, female CEOs or go in one direction or the other in terms of uh, leadership. Um, where we've really, though, uh, uh, had to work significantly harder is in terms of uh, uh, people from underrepresented communities and backgrounds. And so what we've done is we've created the, we've funded the IAC fellowship, $25 million to uh, start to, um, help kids through the educational process, then get them uh, into employment where we uh, will give them internships, we'll give them mentors. And then for any kids in that program who ultimately come to work for IC, we pay off all their student loans. Thank you. If I may just quickly note for the record, I saw that some materials were just distributed and the final slide does actually provide some additional information about the fellows program and the um, and the diversity numbers, which I know were requested at the board meeting. And um, we did provide copies of those to Secretary Bell. I understand that a digital copy, copy was given to Chair Togliatti. We'll ask that those please be considered a confidential submission. Ms. Perry, thank you for the, uh, we do have the materials and thank you for them. But if I could just suggest in the future, if you can make them a little bit bigger, it's really hard for old eyes to try to read <laughs> this fine print. Um, so perfect. It just would be Happy helpful. To. Thank you.
Okay. Um, at this time, do you wish to, does, would it be the preference of uh, the commissioners to have the full presentation, including by the individuals um, in their, as to their individual uh, capacity versus breaking it up in far, as far as questions? What, does anyone have a particular preference, um, members of the commission? Madam Chair, on this matter, I, I think we'd like to hear from all the participants before it, it'll, it's opened up for questions. Yes, agreed. Ogana Brown. Okay. So if we could hear from... Yep. Came all the way over here. We should hear everybody. Sorry. No, no problem. Okay. Are you here to protect well, me? I just <laughs> meant, were we going to break it up corporate or an individual questioning versus just one, all, all in one? So that's what I was getting at. Not that we weren't going to hear from them. So, Ms. Okay. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. I'm Barry Diller. No? No, go ahead. Uh, oh. No, nothing to be sorry about. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Please proceed. Thank you. All right. I'm Barry Diller, and uh, I've had a rather lengthy career in both entertainment and media, uh, which began really at the ABC television network and then went on to Paramount Pictures and Fox uh, and Fox Broadcasting. And then in, uh, uh, I think, yes, probably it was 19, 1990, uh, I left Fox and decided that I would start a new venture uh, with kind of unknown possibilities, which was what excited me kind of. And uh, so we started with a tiny little thing called Silver King Communications, which Mr. Levin talked about. And over the 20 some odd years, uh, We've gone through many, many different revolutions. It's kind of an, uh, uh, it's kind of a conglomerate, which is at the same time an anti-conglomerate. We like spitting out our businesses when they get to a sufficient level of independence. And uh, we uh, very rarely have made investments, minority investments in companies. But uh, when we saw the opportunity for MGM, and I knew nothing about gaming or anything relative to it, my history is really media and the internet, but I became very intrigued I, with two things. First was uh, the possibilities of things that we had experience in, which is uh, internet that we could uh, bring to them uh, uh, really expertise and experience that they did not have and enhance the, what we thought was going to be increasing world of online uh, gaming. And second, because I was astounded at the infrastructure in Las Vegas, uh, you know, just to me, the idea that uh, this was created and no one will, I think, ever create it again. And then MGM played such a big part of it. And uh, we decided that we would uh, join with MGM. And, uh, uh, and as I said before, play a role, I think, in interactivity, but also, uh, be part of the innovation of the future of the city and uh, of the other properties that we have around the world. With that, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions you may have. I would be remiss if I didn't have you talk about your wife, who is a fashion powerhouse. She is. Everyone's that. talking about wives today, so I'd like to hear. What would you like to know? Just, you know, does she give you insights about your business ventures? What's your? I, I'm not so sure. She gives me commands. <laughs> I'm not so sure about the inside part. Everything with my wife is an insight. She is you know, certainly an icon, but she's uh, uh, she's a remarkable woman, and uh, and she's now more than anything because she was in the fashion business for so long, still in it. But her real interests now are helping women, and uh, she spends a great deal of time and part of our family resources in that regard. And you work together on the foundation with that work. Oh yes. That's wonderful. So, I mean, you're, you're very forward thinking, you're visionary, and I appreciate you coming before us. I don't have Thank any you. questions for you at this time, but Thank you. I know that we're doing presentations, so we'll just stop. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I think, I think we'll get uh, Mr. Levin up for, that means for his, right? well, they may have so questions have for you. We'll have a Q&A we'll for you, but oh. not, not, just, not just yet. We're doing the introductions. You did right. your bio, and Mr. Levin's going to do his. And, Get to some questions. Okay. Okay. Here I am again. Thank you all. Joey Levin. Uh, I uh, grew up in the suburbs of Chicago 
Illinois. I um, went to school for, for business and engineering. Uh, I was a systems engineer, which is a, a interesting form of engineering, but ta taught me a lot about how things work. I went from there to San, uh, to, to uh, San Francisco, where I briefly did uh, investment banking and then uh, learned about IAC, which was then USA Networks, uh, and saw what they were doing in terms of really actually the internet. So this was in 2003 when the internet was not very popular. It was post internet bubble. And the uh, IAC was saying, again, USA Networks then at the time was saying, we're going to go very big in the internet when everybody was getting out of the internet. And I found that very intriguing and joined IAC. 20 years ago, and I've had a number of different roles in the company throughout, but the most most fascinating and exciting thing to me is how frequently the company changes and how we've gotten involved in so many different businesses and learned so many different businesses. And uh, in 20 years, I've been through three name changes and the makeup of the company has turned over probably three or four times, but always with uh, uh, thinking about what's next and how the world's changing and innovating. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I also am married with three kids. Thank you. <laughs> and I believe that 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 concludes their, their introductions. So we're here to answer any questions on, I believe at this point, either the entity or the individuals. Hey, who would like to start? Uh, I think I'll start if I may. Okay. Um, first, some general comments on IAC and the participation, you know, in, in this uh, <clears throat> application. Uh, I think, you know, it, it, it's a wonderful fit. I truly believe the IAC investment in MGM, you know, slash, and, you know, you, you know, you, Mr. Dillard, you're truly a visionary. I mean, you know, I've watched QVC. I see the commercials. I, I you know, I, I followed, you know, this, the, the stock over the years. And, and, you know, you and Mr. Levin bring great things to the table. No, no questions about that. We as regulators could only look at certain things. And what happened was at the uh, Gaming Control Board hearing uh, a couple months ago, it, it went wonderfully well, truly did. And unbeknownst to anyone, and, and I absolutely agree, sir, and to your counsel and to all the people here representing the various entities that you had no knowledge of any particular investigation at the time you know, this was brought forward. But since that time, some things have happened. Uh, we don't have access to a lot of the things, but we certainly had access to the uh, Wall Street Journal article. Your cooperation with your counsel's cooperation at an interview that was had. But other than that, all we could do is ask questions. And that is our job as regulators, the way I see it, to, to find out as much as we can about what happened. I have no reason to suggest that anything you're about to tell us today is anything but the truth, but I still need to ask the questions and then you know, we'll proceed to deliberations. So, uh, and again, some of the questions I may ask may not be able to be answered by you because you wouldn't know. So if your counsel you know, wants to answer it, so be it, or, or you know. Okay. So let, let's start with, the acquisition of the stock. Yes. Now, and again, I'm relying upon the interview of you with gaming. Yes. And the Wall Street Journal, which I really don't like to do, but that's the way this news broke. The stock options were purchased on Friday, I believe January 14th. Correct. Those stock options were called leaps. Yes. They're basically to expire a year. Yes. January of 2023. The leaps that you purchased, and again, I'm going to get technical and I'm, I'm going to try and not get real technical because as you said in your statement, you don't really get into not my tradings and, and derivatives. So basically the agreement you had with Mr. Geffen and your stepson was going to be a 50-50 purchase of these LEAP options. Yes. And that occurred on January 14th. 
and I'm going to ask you a series of questions, just moving us forward, please. January 14th was a Friday. Saturday and Sunday, of course, the markets are closed. Monday too. Monday was Martin Luther King Day. Markets are closed. Prior to the market opening, uh, it was announced that Microvision had entered into a merger agreement or, or uh, you know, buyout of Activision. And that, in fact, triggered a whole lot of, for the luckiest people in the world, I can't believe it, lightning in a bottle, and all the different things you said. And I have no reason to believe anything you said is, is untrue. But nevertheless, again, as regulators, I need to focus on that trade. Sure. Because to the naked eye, yes. and I think you said it was just dumb luck in one of your statements, uh, the right place at the right time. Type of actually, that was, I think, a comment that came from the journal, and I didn't really say that exactly. But what I did say was that it was definitely an absolute coincidence. I was struck kind of dumb that morning when Mr. Geffen said to me, turn on CNBC, I think it was. And uh, I turned it on and saw that it had been, Microsoft had uh, made an uh, announcement of an, the acquisition. Uh, and I recognize that such a neat coincidence is people are gonna look at it. And I thought immediately that they would, but since neither me, Mr. Geffen, nor Mr. von Furstenberg had any knowledge of any kind uh, that they would go through the process and that would be that. And I think it probably uh, would not have stirred up anything except that the it's unfortunate the journal and uh, I'm pretty sure the Department of Justice, uh, whatever happened uh, eventuated into the story that made it somewhat newsworthy and were somewhat newsworthy characters. So, yeah. uh, I, I recognize all that, and as I said at that at that moment, I said, "Let's be certain that we keep all the records, uh, so that whenever this is investigated, which it surely will be, that the uh, the facts can be known." Which is, we had no knowledge. And, and I'm not questioning that for purposes today. I'm just trying to get a factual background sure. as to how it happened, and then some questions. So the trades were done, and it, do you know, sir? Were the options purchased in any way, shape, or form by IAC? No, no, no. Okay. It's purely personal. Okay. And the stock options, however, were done, and, and for the words purely personal, I'll assume it's, maybe it's in a family trust or one of your many corporations. So, but anyway, the, the acquisition of the options was 50 50, you and your stepson, and the other 50, meaning David Geffen through a David Geffen entity. Yes. Okay. Now, let's go back in time a little bit. You, you, um, as of the 14th, when these options were purchased, you yourself have, have testified in front of the Gaming Control Board uh, that you had absolutely no prior knowledge of anything to do with the potential acquisition by anyone in your acquisition of the options. That's correct. Now, Let's go back in time just a little bit before that. There was something in the Wall Street Journal and you alluded to in your statement before the gaming control board that a meeting or I don't even want to elevate it to a meeting, a, a, a brunch that was attended by your son-in-law yes, 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 yes. and his wife. Yes. And a Mr. Uh, and the CEO uh, of Activision, yes. And, and the CEO of Activision. So again, just help me with this. Yes. I'm not the brightest guy. Please. So on Friday, the 14th, you buy. Sometime prior to, to that, there was a, a meeting and you, and you testified that you had no prior knowledge of the meeting between your, your uh, stepson and Mr. No. Kotick. No, no, the meeting actually was because uh, my son and his wife are involved in a, a program called Th a Thrift Savings Plan which is to give equity to people who don't have it. And, uh, and, uh, and my son, Alexander, felt that Mr. Kotick, who has uh, got a lot of political relationships, could help because this is something that's almost, I think it's probably 
very soon to be uh, 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 to be brought forth in a bill. So that was the actual purpose of uh, I think it was a I think it was a breakfast. Yeah, right. And that again, that's what you testified to. It could have been a breakfast. It could have been later in the day. You weren't sure. But again, breakfast. whatever it was, but three people attended that. Yes. And it's been further your testimony that to the best of your knowledge, nothing was discussed or relayed to you regarding a potential no. acquisition. No. Four days, five days later. No, 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 no. I mean, the sequence of events is just this all happened within three days, basically. Sorry. I guess in a way, two business days. Uh, and uh, uh, when Mr. Geffen called and said to me he thought this was a good idea, I told it to uh, Alexander Furstenberg, and they quickly made an arrangement to buy these these options. It was it was truly one note. And uh, I, I mean, I I guess the editorial comment I'd make is it seems true. You kind of Credibility uh, would be questioned that would we really, if we had actually known of something like that? First of all, we wouldn't, we never have in our lifetimes, but would we do it on the eve knowing that there was a transaction that was gonna be announced the next day? Seems unlikely, but anyway, I'm, that's an editorial comment. The facts, no, and, the and facts will obtain. And it's a perfect editorial comment, what you just said, a person of your means and of your you know, years of success you wouldn't jeopardize it at this point in your life. So I'm, I'm I did taking, say I didn't wait until I was 80 years old to commit a fraud. So, so I am taking all these things at face value. The question as we as regulators have are the issues that have arisen as a result of the lightning in the bottle trade. So what we have is a meeting with your with your stepson and his wife, yes. Kotick, the president of the company that is being sold yes. a couple of days before. Let's forward on to Friday. You, you, you make a large sum 50-50 with, with, with Mr. Geffen uh, through various entities. Yes. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, holidays, barbecues. Tuesday morning, turn on CNBC. So that in and of itself has to at least raise an issue sure. with we as regulators about what happened. We're not here to judge you, sir, on whether something happened that you're you're not telling us accurately or it's being shaded. That's not my line of questioning. What my line of questioning is is just to show that you know what you've stated is accurate. You had no independent knowledge of a takeover, but nevertheless, this timeline is troublesome to anyone who would view it. Of course. We and, and that's that. why I'm asking. No, questions. I understand that. And we recognize that. I recognized it at the time. And uh, I doesn't, you know, actually, I said, wouldn't, why don't we just give this back? Uh, just because who, we don't need these resources, neither Mr. Geffen nor I nor my son. Uh, and uh, obviously, you couldn't do that. But in other words, I, I, I just... <laughs> felt this is one of those situations that people are going to say, oh my God. But in fact, since we had, you know, it's binary, we either did or did not have any knowledge that any uh, acquisition or any activity was going to take place with Activision. And, and I appreciate that comment. And again, why we're here is we don't know what the future may bring. I have no clue. I have no idea what's going on, nor am I going to ask what's going on. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to... There are... I, 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 I no, don't even I want to know. This. There are no other facts. No, no so, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what the future may bring regarding you know anything down the road. No one knows. And because of that, it's raised an issue, at least in my mind, of how do we handle this application? Because I believe that but for this lightning in a bottle trade of you and your son-in-law and Mr. Geffen, you are an absolute perfect fit for MGM. So how do we reconcile the fact that, that we as regulators have a limited amount of knowledge? We have the same knowledge um, that you know you just testified to here. This is, we didn't know, we wouldn't have done it. We're not stupid. 
I didn't go 80 years, you know, trying to do it. I don't need the money. In fact, if I could, I give it back. It's, you know, I, I get all that and I'm taking that as truth. But again, what does the future bring? And I can't answer that. So then the question for this regulating body is how do we reconcile that to make sure everybody walks out of here with what they need to be? You need certainty that your investment is safe in MGM. MGM needs certainty that you as a, as a member of the board of directors will be serving you know, for the rest of your life and all is merry. So how do we reconcile that? And I can may see- I, May I, Commissioner? Yes, sir, Mr. Madam. First, with respect to this, this particular matter that we're talking about, it is at the moment merely an investigative matter. There's not been an allegation of wrongdoing. Um, there's been no finding of wrongdoing. You have a process. I mean, we talk all the time about Nevada being the gold standard. It is the most mature regular juris jurisdiction in the United States. You have the ability, if something is awry here, because the record before you at the moment is a clean report of a person that's lived 80 years in exemplary life. And the report, I haven't seen the report, but I would assume it's a testament to a remar remarkable and exemplary life. This was an intervening event. It's an unfortunate intervening event. But at the moment, it's not really right for anyone's consideration until you get further down the road. If hypothetically you get further down the road and there's something that causes you concern or you know ultimately there's some adverse finding, the system's already set up to deal with that. The, the system through an order to show cause, through a disciplinary action, it, it, it's you have a system in place. It works. It's worked for decades in this in, in, in this state. And it's been the model of regulatory system for many other jurisdictions around the United States. So to suggest at the moment that, yes, it causes you concern. It causes Mr. concern, clearly. But you have a process in place at a moment when this becomes ripe for that, if it ever becomes ripe for that. But that isn't here. So, for example, we had folks at the beginning of this, the, 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 this hearing that received a limited license. And a limited license is typically for someone that's committed a bad act or bad acts or has engaged in some course of conduct that will cause you pause. And it's something that actually happened. You saw it, it was there, it was right in front of you. And it didn't, it didn't raise to the level of, we have to find this person unsuitable, but we wanna take a look and we wanna monitor these people. We wanna give them an opportunity to rehabilitate, them, rehabilitate themselves. We wanna give them an opportunity to implement remedial measures. There's nothing here at the moment that is an act of wrongdoing, a finding of wrongdoing. There's no allegation before you of a wrongdoing. There's no conduct to remediate. So I suggest to you that you can find Mr. Diller suitable. You can place a condition in terms of continue to keep you apprised. I mean, we came at Miller, Mr. Diller's request. We immediately came to not only this jurisdiction, with jurisdictions around the United States and said, hey, there's something you should know. And we gave you that. And every single time a production has been made, we've let you know and we've let other regulators know. So I, I think Mr. Diller would agree. Yes, of course, we're gonna continue to keep you apprised. And if it's some date in the future, there becomes a real issue before you. This system works. You have the ability either for an order to show cause or for a disciplinary complaint to deal with it. But the record before you today is one of an exemplary man that's been guided by ethics, ethical conduct. I have a that's dog been a, a dog as well. But you know, look, I think you can get through it here, and I think we'll get through it in other jurisdictions. And someday in the future, if we have to, we'll be back before you to talk about if something bad happens, but at the moment, there's nothing bad before you. Mr. Medema, in, in brief response to your statements, uh, I hear loud and clear what you're saying. I, and I can only speak for myself, I'm not talking about denial. Don't for one second think that I will, I'm gonna make a motion for denial. 
I, I didn't believe you were. Okay. Uh, what I was suggesting, though, is that what we should have here, hopefully, with all due respect, we should have is a finding of suitability without limitation. Um, I'd like now to hear from my fellow colleagues. If I may briefly. Sure. Um, I do appreciate Mr. Diller being so forthcoming. It's my understanding that he's been nothing but cooperative with the process the second any investigation occurred. Um, and that uh, clearly there's a duty to keep us all apprised. So I don't see, I think it's superfluous to have a, an additional condition for that. And because of the course of dealing we've observed to date has been just that second anything occurred in terms of any issues, mm -hmm. you reported it. And so I don't have any questions or concerns about that. Of course, we were all interested in the article and I, I appreciate the line of questioning to put these things on the record because this is the gold standard, but uh, in terms of denial, there's nothing before me that's right. There's no evidence before me. There's no record before me for, for that type of thinking or that rationale. And coincidences occur all the time. And to the extent there's anything that's found, you will bring it to our attention. And to the extent we need to do something, we'll deal with that accordingly. But you're right, the record before us is just that. And I look at the four corners of the record and um, anything else that we've you know come to learn um, as a result. But uh, you've been cooperative, Mr. Diller. Uh, You've been, you know, disclosing information. You've been candid. So I, I think not to say it was overkill, but it wasn't necessary for me any, anyway, because I wasn't thinking that. So I, I, I apologize. No, you don't need to. And you're advocating and I appreciate that. But um, the record before us doesn't warrant that concern on Thank my you. part at Thank this you. time. And so I am, I appreciate the statements. I appreciate your cooperation with, uh, my fellow commissioner and answering these questions and being so candid. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, with respect to um, Mr. Diller, I don't think we can ignore the intervening event. Um, I do think that it bears on, um, you know, what we do in terms of either issuing, I, I'm also not leaning towards denial, but I think it does bear on what we do in terms of, you know, some type of limitation to allow this process to work. I don't think that, calls into question, you know, his um, veracity of what he's telling us. He has been extremely forthcoming. He has cooperated. But this is just something that's unknown to us at this point. And while, you know, it, it's there may not be accusations, there's certainly the facts suggest, the facts that we know suggest that you know, maybe there was more to it. It could be a coincidence. It could not. I mean, like he said, he either knew it or he didn't. I don't know. I don't know where the answer is, um, but I don't think it's something we can ignore. I did have a question with respect to um, the old IAC, new IAC litigation. Is that resolved? What are, what are you referring to? I, I'm sorry, Mr. Diller, it didn't bear specifically to you. There was litigation involving um, the when the company separated from old IAC to new IAC. I'm not is really this, familiar with that. I'm going to ask uh, Mike Babius to come up because he's helped report on the different litigation okay. too, various jurisdictions. Are you, are, you, are you perhaps, this is Michael Fabius for the record, Alex Barr, are you, are you perhaps asking about the uh, tender litigation? No, no, not that one. No, it was the shareholder action that was brought in Delaware by David Newton against IAC and old IAC. It's the motion to dismiss is still pending. It is still pending, okay. Wasn't that filed on September 24th, 2020? Or am I, do I have the date wrong? December 15th, Dece Yeah, I have, okay, it was so, sometime ago. six months ago. That's why okay. I thought maybe yeah. we had a resolution by now. All right. No, nothing new on it. Okay, well, it happens. They have a heavy workload. Um, I didn't have any additional questions with respect to the, rec the information that we have. I appreciate the diversity uh, numbers that you gave us. Um, Again, um, I, it, the ongoing investigation gives me pause. I realize it's an ongoing investigation and I, I do feel that um, it's something we need to consider. I'd like to just defer and see what my colleagues. Uh, Vice Chair uh, Solis Rainey, if I, if I may just sort of respond to your, 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 your question about that or your comment or your concern, which I understand is a, is a valid concern. So it certainly is something that needs to be monitored. But I guess what I would, submit and, and maybe 
taking a step back from just this specific instance, because this specific instance still is just like Mr. Damba mentioned, you know, there's there's no allegation of wrongdoing. The subpoenas basically are saying it's a fact finding gathering. So there isn't a there isn't an indication that there's anything that's happened. But let's sort of look at a, maybe a subpoena in another setting. And I can I'm aware of like three or four other instances <laughs> involving other companies. Uh, that are licensed with other executives that have been found suitable and licensed before you in the recent past where there have been subpoenas that have been issued based upon whether a merger transaction or some other transactions and what happens in that setting is they as licensees individuals that are found suitable reach out to gcb staff and and say we we've received the, these subpoenas this is where we are in the process this is what this allegation is what information do you need sharing the information and having a continual dialogue. And that's what a licensee, someone who's been found suitable, is expected to do in Nevada. And that's what and that's what they do. And as it gets monitored, again, if something comes up, then then there's the means and the processes in place that, that the board has through uh, NRS 463.310 and, and Reg 7 to move forward to a, address something that could be a concern. And, and I, I think Oh, I just want to sort of point that out that here we have an instance where there really isn't anything where there's like something. It's not like there's a criminal charge out or there's a pending action over here. Or there's litigation where you don't know how it's going to play out and it's actively in place. This is a, in theory, investigative, investigative fact finding measure at the moment. So I don't think it's necessarily appropriate to limit it based upon the nature that it is just that. That it is just a fact-finding gathering. There's, there's not anything beyond that. If, if it was something beyond that, then I, then I could really clearly see that, that a limitation would be something that, that you would be interested in. But I just want to sort of make that distinction in, in response to it and thinking about what you were mentioning. No problem. I, I mean, I appreciate you trying to clarify that. I always, I understand the difference between um, a burden that an existing licensee has and an applicant. And the timing of this is unfortunate, but and I do still feel that having some kind of limitation to allow this process to work through would be appropriate. Um, you know, that's one opinion. My colleagues may differ, but that's where I'm at. Well, and just for the record, um, you know, council hasn't mentioned um, in in both of their um, I don't know how else, arguments uh, just now that the you know the any limitation being discussed keeps the burden on the applicant and not on the commission in the event something unexpected happens. I would just point that out. Um, but it, rather than continue to argue uh, at this point, can we have a, uh, I will be happy to entertain uh, closing comments by council uh, after all the questions have been asked by uh, the commissioners, if that's okay. So commissioner Keekever. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I don't have any specific um, questions, I think, as it relates to the matter. I think for Mr. Ladamba, I mean, are you are you suggesting that um, we shouldn't be able to, that we should not be able to consider the, the suggestions that are that are being made or that? No, not at all. Um, you don't think that they're all. reflective of his reputation and that it's my job to weigh his reputation as a commissioner in terms of his suitability? I, I believe you 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 should weigh all of the facts, including this particular matter. I'm simply indicating that at the moment, there is no allegation of wrongdoing. And with respect to the limitation, the limitation is typically put in place so someone can demonstrate to you that they're remediating their prior conduct gave you pause. And that's not what we, there's nothing at the moment here to remediate. There's no bad act that's been found that someone has to demonstrate rehabilitation. So that's why I'm suggesting that the limitation is, an appro is, is an appropriate and that there is the ability through the order to show cause process, a disciplinary complaint or what have you, that if this ever does come ripe for something like that, you have a system in place that through the decades has demonstrated that it works. You are the gold standard. I think you should trust in your system. I trust in your system. I've done this for over 30 years. Your system's remarkable. I do not see the limitation as appropriate because there's nothing to fix here. I'm sure I don't have any specific questions as it relates to the application um, that's, that's before us. I'll, I'll have comments when.
Okay, does anyone else have any additional questions before? Um, if I may, Madam Chair. Sure. Thank you. I think maybe we're conflating appropriateness with necessity. Um, and that is for each and every commissioner here to weigh for him and herself. And in my mind, it's superfluous and not necessary, but that's just for me. Um, and, and I still need to go back when my fellow commissioner was asking questions about a motion to dismiss. There are two separate ones. And so the one to which I was referring related to the June 24th, 2020 shareholder class action derivative suit um, that was filed in Del Delaware, and that's the David Newman litigation. And there was a September 24th, 2020 motion to dismiss filed by the defendants. That's separate and apart from my fellow commissioner's inquiry regarding the December 15th, 2021 um, dismissal motion. And so I just wanted to check, and that relates to the January 7th, 2021 litigation. So those are two different lawsuits pending concurrently, I understand. And this is just based on my material. So am I understanding that there are two different suits that were commenced at different times um, with two pending motions to dismiss with no outcome for either one, even though one of them was filed back on September 24th, 2020 in relation to the June 24th, 2020 litigation commenced by Mr. Newman. Unfortunately, I don't have the dates of filing on my summary page. Okay. Can you tell me the name of? Sure. So on the June 24th, and... 2020, the shareholder class action derivative suit lawsuit was filed in Delaware okay. by David Newman against IAC, old IAC, Mr. Diller and Mr. Levin and the board of directors of old IAC. And there was a September 24th, 2020 dismissal motion filed. And it's been quite some time. And while I appreciate federal courts or Delaware court, um, state court might have taken it under submission, I don't have um, the adjudication of that motion. We'll, we'll follow up with any sure. more current information. Absolutely. Our, 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 under, our latest information is that the, the motions to dismiss are still pending. Uh, the, following the September 24th uh, motion to dismiss that you're thinking of. The 2020, or, correct? Sorry, tw September 24th, 2020 okay. motion. The plaintiffs had refiled uh, complaints that then put, uh, prompted new motions to dismiss, which is what's part of what's protracted. The so are they two concurrently running actions? Have they been ad administered together? They can follow up. It's not important. I just want to make sure that we were, that we were talking about two different motions okay. and we just, I just don't want to cause confusion on the record. So if you could just, absolutely. Uh, after this, I just wanted to, to verify. Of course. Thank you. And then whose idea was it to buy shares in the public market that is very innovative, forward thinking? It's not something I see every day um, with a gigantic deal like this. So the shares were purchased on the public market. Could anyone speak to that? What are you talking about? Yeah. Oh, our, yes, we purchased the shares. But whose idea was that? That's not something that's traditionally done. I, I don't know. Again. The microphone. Somewhere. To the microphone, please. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Uh, all the ideas, it's hard to remember where they originate, but they get a lot of debate and uh, back and forth, and we need to convince each other and ourselves to do this. Uh, but at the time, it was um, uh, in very early COVID, and I see, obviously, the first thing we did was make sure our employees and our customers and everybody was fine. But the next thing we did after that was being uh, well capitalized as we were. So this is an opportunity and we look for opportunities. And in uh, at that moment in time, there weren't a lot of boards meeting to to figure out how to tell a company. And so really the only thing available to us to take advantage of those moments was uh, uh, buying shares in the yeah, public market. All of the shares. And that's 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 yep. why we did it that way. In two different tranches over yep. time. Yeah, thank you. Any additional questions? All right. Um, so I had mentioned earlier that I would be, you know, happy to let you um, continue counts as far as counsel's concerned. Did you have someone else chair, that wished chair, to speak? Chair, yes, Chair Todd. Okay. If, if it's all right, we have we have one little final, just a final little uh, comment on on some of the discussion we've been having, and I appreciate that that you referenced the term about the burden because clearly a, an applicant before the gaming commission, the burden is on the applicant to prove suitability. But I think we need to also remember, I think that, that even after an applicant is licensed, found suitable, then that person becomes a licensee. There still is an ongoing existing burden. The burden is still there. 
The burden is to remain suitable and to conduct yourself in a manner that's consistent with the Gaming Control Act and the regulations. And I would submit that what we've seen in this unique situation, because the timing is odd, because we have the unanimous recommendation for approval for the board and then this intervening event. But what happened in that intervening event is Mr. Diller did what you would expect someone who had already been licensed or found suitable to do. He actually did that. He actually reached out proactively and has reached out and we, we immediately got with the Gaming Control Board and the other regulators. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear, uh, Chair, because you mentioned the burden and, and it, it's clear to me that there's also a burden on, on a licensee even after you move forward. So the burden always remains on Mr. Diller's side, Mr. Levin's side or any licensee side. And that was kind of my point when I was explaining the instances of the other executives that I know of and other transactions that have received subpoenas, they're doing that because they understand that they have a burden as a licensee to, to continue to, to be suitable, to continue to show their suitability uh, to move forward. So I just want to make that clear. Sure. And before you uh, continue, before you continue, I'd like the uh, Deputy uh, Attorney General to comment on the differences in the burden between when there's a limitation and when there's not, when there's approval for suitability and when there's a condition, just so that we can kind of, instead of speaking in these generalities, have something a little more specific for my commissioners and myself. Not my commissioners, the commissioners and myself. Yes, Chair, uh, NRS 463-220, or I'm sorry, NRS 463-220, 170 subsection one, the burden is on the applicant to prove qualifications. Um, if there is a limitation on the applicant or on the license, then that applicant is still required to continue to prove their qualifications. Um, if there is no limitation, then it is presumed that the applicant has already proven their qualifications and has been found suitable going forward. And then if the board is to initiate any disciplinary proceedings, order to show cause or whatnot, then the board the burden then turns on to the board to um, show that there is something going on there that warrants discipline. Okay. Hope that answered your question. Yes. Um, the other thing I wanted to make clear is, is I respectfully to council, there was this, you know, and, and I think, um, Commissioner Brown kind of commented that there's been a conflation between appropriate or necessary, or maybe that's what she was talking about, maybe not, but, but the commission can limit and or condition a license as it deems necessary in the public interest, not just to remediate something that is a known issue, correct? correct. That, that, is, that is fair, you have, you have, you have discretion. Yeah. Okay, I just and, want to- and, sure and before that we- I just want to also want to just mention that uh, Mr. McManus would like to make uh, a comment when 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 that's appropriate. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, members of the Commission, John McManus, I'm the Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary of MGM Resorts. Just wanted to uh, make a few comments for your consideration before you uh, make whatever motion you plan to make. And I would uh, suggest that uh, I, I fully agree that uh, the commission has discretion to condition or limit licenses. That's not really the, the question, or I think what council was trying to suggest. Uh, the, the question is what's the right thing to do in this case? And I think everybody recognizes that this is a difficult and unusual situation where you have an intervening leak of an investigation uh, at the late stage that occurred here. I would, uh, I would go back to the comments about the maturity and the stability of this jurisdiction and its ability to uh, process things and get to the right place ultimately to protect the public. Much like the state of Delaware is for corporate law, Nevada has become that for gaming law and gaming regulation. Other jurisdictions might not agree that this is the gold standard and some of them might have a chip on their shoulder and suggest otherwise. But over time, this has become a predictable uh, environment for uh, gaming licensees to thrive. And in fact, when many companies and individuals come from elsewhere, whether it's from overseas or from other jurisdictions, they come to Nevada 
to establish themselves because this is where if you've been licensed here, you are showing the rest of the world that you're okay and that you were able to withstand the scrutiny. Uh, I think in this case, if we take what I'll call a, a sort of a more cautious approach of issuing a limited license, it might send a different message about the stability of the environment here and what uh, a licensee or an applicant can expect when they come to the jurisdiction. I think that the comments about the processes and the established sort of body of regula regulation and enforcement here speak volumes. That, that when something bad happens here, it's quickly dealt with. And I think we need to go back no further than a few years with uh, the situation with Mr. Wynn. That only took a Wall Street Journal article and allegations, and within a few days, he was out of the company. This case is much simpler. As Mr. Diller mentioned, this is binary. It either happened or it didn't. Right now, all we have is an investigation. If some of the feared uh, situations occur in the future, it's likely going to be very clear cut that there is some evidence that contradicts what he has told you, what he has told others, and then the actions will be very clear and there will be you know, an easy path to resolve it. But in the meantime, if we limit the license on what's otherwise a clear record, it will send a message that there's not sort of a certainty of process or that there's some risk that the overall situation or system might not be as effective as, as I believe that it is. Because had this happened the week after he had appeared before the commission, I still think you're protected. You're protected either way. The reality is we could talk about legal burdens and provisions of statutes and regulations. As a licensee, we always have the burden to prove our good character. That never really changes. Once you get into a situation where you're accused of wrongdoing, you're not, it's not like criminal court. You're not taking the fifth. You're not doing anything else. You're coming forward and establishing why you should keep your privileged license. And that's what Mr. Diller would do in that circumstance. And you have adequate remedy should that happen. So I ask that you consider acting on his 50 year business record and his reputation and grant him an unconditioned and unlimited license. Thank you for your consideration. Is there any other comments that any lawyer would like to make or either applicant or representative of IAC? I'll just hop back in and say, no. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just wanna check with, um, you know, I, I understand our, our diligent and, and committed court reporter might need a, sh a little break. And so I have no idea how long the comments or uh, discussion of the commissioners are going to take. So let me check with her and make sure she doesn't need Two minutes. Are you okay? Yes, after this item, it'd be nice to take a little break. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sure. I don't blame you. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so, um, excuse me one second. One moment, there we go. So at this time, I guess I would defer to my um, fellow, my colleagues on the commission, as far as any additional follow-up questions you may have um, or commentary um, that you wish to make on the record before I um, potentially uh, deem it appropriate for to call for a motion. If I may, I'd like to respond to some of the comments. Um, they're all well taken. No one's wrong here. No one has said anything incorrect. I understand, you know, Mr. McManus, I understand Mr. McGinnis, Mr. McGammon, Mr. Diller, Mr. Levin, uh, Mr. Perry. Um, the question is finding something. At no point have I ever said denial. At no point have I ever said you're not suitable. The question is, what do we do with an uncertainty? I know what the, the answer of your counsel is, let's worry about that 
you know, when the time comes. So anything that this commission does is not presently against you, Mr. Giller, or Mr. certainly not Mr. Levin because he wasn't involved in the transaction or your, or your stepson or, or Mr. Geffen. Again, it's dealing with an imperfect record before us. And, and, and I compliment you all for the way you have treated this and kept the board as well apprised as you can once, once it broke. So the question is, how do we deal with it? I, you know, I, I would like to hear what my other fellow commissioners think about a limitation or non-limitation, and then, then we can have a motion. Chair, do we do that before a motion is made or, I mean, generally we del deliberate after a motion? Um, I, I guess I would, is there anything, um, I'd ask the Deputy Attorney General, is there anything uh, improper about a preliminary discussion before a motion versus after the motion? No, Chair, there's nothing preventing you from having a preliminary discussion before a motion is made. Because okay. there's a potential for competing motions without, without knowing what other commissioners uh, are thinking. So it would seem to me that Commissioners Cohen's suggestion to have a preliminary discussion uh, might be uh, helpful for whoever wants to hear from others. Perfect, thank you. I just didn't wanna jump the gun. Um, again, uh, I, I'm very well aware of the record. I'm aware of uh, Mr. Dillard's um, reputation, a great businessman. My suggestion of a limitation is not in any way to impugn his character, uh, but it's to maintain the status quo. I think this is very different than other cases where things come up. Obviously, we have a process to deal with um, issues that come up after somebody's license, but there's a very, there's a very real difference in the standard that applies. And I feel that I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't, knowing what we know at this point, which is that we don't know the answer. It, it, it is binary, but it's going to be one way or the other. And if it goes one way, we wouldn't, that would definitely affect his, um, my um, opinion of his suitability. If it went the other way, obviously, then I would have no problem with the suitability. So I'm not prepared to, uh, to support a motion without a limitation. Um, and it's for those reasons. It has nothing to do with his character. Uh, it's the unknown, and it could very well be just horrible timing and circumstances. Um, but time will tell, and I'd like to have that limitation in place to allow us to uh, deal with this in a manner that maintains the burden on the applicant and not on not on the commissioner. Commissioner Kika, do you have anything to add in the discussion at the request of Ms. Uh, Commissioner Cohen? Oops, excuse me. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate it, Madam Chair. I find myself um, somewhat constrained in uh, just by our, our, our statutes and our regulations over um, the problems that, that I have. Um, look, I think IAC is an incredible partner for MGM, um, and I think uh, Mr. Levins and Miller's experience um, brings a lot to um, one of our most significant companies. Um, so I understand um, the value that uh, brings um, to the board, both of them bring to the board. And uh, so when I look at applications, um, you know, IAC is a um, register regi its registration as a publicly traded company, uh, beneficial um, ownership, and um, frankly, Mr. Diller, Mr. Um, Levin's um, applications for suitability individually as beneficial owners, I don't really have an issue with. Um, the, the application as it relates to serving as a director is where I get a little hung up. Um, the suggestion, right, through the, uh, through the Activision situation is that, um, is that the applicant um, used non-public information. There is no such suggestion. Uh, the, there's no let's, allegation, there's no suggestion, let's, let's, there's no anything other than the, uh, the odd timing of events. It, it, okay, no facts. Fair. fair, bad timing of events. Um, that there is, an, there is a review of the timing of those events to see whether perhaps um, something inappropriate had, had taken place. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to have the review. Right? Um, and, you know, from a position of a board, 
that's it, it, there's incredible access to non-public information. That's that's just the only um, hiccup that I have. Um, I certainly don't think that it or that um, a, a report in the Wall Street Journal um, with without any um, follow-up facts behind it would warrant a, a finding of unsuitability. That's 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 not what we should do. Um, and so the question is whether the, um, in my mind, whether this, um, you know, this circumstance as it is before us um, reflects on um, your reputation in a way that undermines the, the public policy of the state, right? And if, if I have to weigh that um, as compared to your entire life of in, in business, it doesn't do that for me. Um, but I think I'm, I'm I'm with my um, the Commissioner Solis Rainey in that I'd also just like to see what happens. And um, a, uh, a limitation is something that um, that I'm comfortable with. Um, and in, in the end, you, you know, just the way you act, the, your actions since this has come out indicates that you want to have it all, everything revealed so that um, this can be resolved as quickly as possible because you're confident that nothing nothing bad happened. And I, um, so your, your actions support that. So um, I hope that this would be short lived and um, at the time of limitation ends, there's, there's no issue. Okay, at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you all to have a seat. This is the discussion portion and um, of the, before the motions are made. And it's kind of like the courtroom, you know, I used to tell people, okay, once the arguments are done, they're done. <laughs> um, and so um, I appreciate your understanding in that regard. Um, I think for Commissioner Brown, that um, Commissioner Brown may have already stated a couple times how she feels about this issue, but just to be clear, before any motion is made by anyone. Uh, if you could reiterate that, um, I don't wanna uh, skip you or, or you know, assume that your previous comments are uh, specific as to what the motion should be. So could you uh, please address Commissioner Cohen's request for discussion? Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity, Chair. So when I think of a limitation, I think that it is in place to protect or to guard gaming, the reputation, and to monitor something that requires monitoring. But here, um, there's nothing that I have seen on the record before me. And so the record at this moment consists of an article in a newspaper that's nationally circulated, um, testimony that Mr. Diller has provided today. And notwithstanding the uncanny timing, I don't see anything that he's done as I sit here today that questions his integrity, character, or honesty. So it seems from the record, everything's you know, under oath, that he's been honest, he's been forthcoming, he's cooperated um, with any investigations, he's provided information and disclosure to the board. So the limitation in my mind isn't necessary because it's not helpful. It would be helpful to me if we had before us uh, somebody who had not been cooperative, who had not been forthcoming, who had concealed information, separate or apart from the article being blasted, obviously. But the second, uh, he thought there was an issue. He rallied counsel, I understand. He was forthcoming, he participated in investigations. So it doesn't seem necessary or helpful to protect or guard anything. Um, Mr. Diller is a very public figure um, because of the responses he's given today with some tough questions. Uh, he doesn't seem like he's hiding from anything. He admits freely that this appears to be a strange timing issue. But let's say I'm wrong. And let's say that there's some evidence that comes out as a result of the investigation. That is very easy for me um, and the commission and the board to address and there will be a disclosure and we can deal with that then. So the limitation doesn't help. It doesn't protect anyone. Everybody's watching him. Everybody's watching all of the applicants, but they have a self-policing duty and he's already done that. So it just doesn't make sense to me in terms of, and I don't wanna say we're tarnishing somebody's integrity or honesty or character, but it doesn't help. I mean, there was a, an instance where there was somebody before me um, who answered questions and I just wasn't quite sure that things were right, even when he was answering under oath. 
And so I said, maybe we could have you take drug tests because I don't know what was going on that day, but something was wrong, something was amiss. But I don't, I don't see any conditions or limitations that would assist anything in terms of monitoring or policing. And whatever the conclusions are that are reached, whether they're true or not, we have to accept those as true in the future and we can deal with those then. But I don't see how a limitation helps us at this time. And so it just, I think it's superfluous, the duties exist. And because of the conduct that's been exhibited by Mr. Diller to date in connection with this bad timing of events, um, I, I think maybe the inference that would come from such a limitation isn't fair under these circumstances based on the record I have before me. So I don't wanna overreach and assume and presume things that simply aren't before me. And um, I think the analogy to Mr. Wint's experiences that came to the light here um, and how they were dealt with, with alacrity and speed shows that we do have a system in place that gives me assurance that there's no reason to do um, anything above and beyond um, just a, a straight approval. But um, I uh, understand the concern about um, a limitation, I just don't think it's necessary, but because we have the discretion, I appreciate it. Um, I just disagree, respectfully. So I would like to ask um, the, either the, and I'm sorry, Ms. Brining, I cannot see if Darlene, Ms. Caruso is there or not. Okay. Um, she is chair. Okay, thank you. I would like to know, um, well, I appreciate the comments of Commissioner Brown and the other commissioners um, when we're talking about some potential in the future and how that would uh, be handled with uh, incredible speed and, and efficiency. Um, I guess my question would be how, you know, I, I don't have enough time on the board to know in the event that there was a complaint filed by anyone, SEC, DOJ, LMNOP, related to this transaction, let's just say hypothetically it happened. I know for a fact we have no access to the information of any uh, any any um, investigatory body at this time, um, and I am not familiar whether we would ever have uh, opportunity to have information that wasn't pu publicly made known even after an investigation had started. We would be relying on the applicant to give that to us, or what has been the experience of the commission and the board in the past. And I'm not saying he's going to get charged. I'm just saying, let's say hypothetically, there was some complaint filed um, by either entity or some other related to uh, this transaction. How procedurally um, would we, the board and the commission, get that information other than it's the applicant's duty to volunteer and they have and know what they know, but they don't know what they don't know, if you will. Is my question making sense? I know it was really long. Yes, Chair. I don't know that that's a question that I can answer. It's probably better suited for the board because the way that it would work is the board would make a determination based on any information that it obtained from any source, whether it wanted to proceed with discipline. And if the board wanted to proceed with discipline, they would conduct their own investigation. It would come to the attorney general's office for um, review and a drafting of a complaint. The complaint would then get filed with the commission the commission would then um, be able to proceed with its procedures as far as uh, whether the case needed discovery, et cetera. Um, and then it would get presented before the commission unless the settlement was reached. And so but I, don't, I don't know with regard to the SEC and how that information is obtained by the agents of the board, what that relationship is like, but that might be something that you could direct to the board. Is there any board member present that can speak to experience um, or an investigative um, or the chief that can speak to the experiences in the past about information sharing and that kind of thing? Uh, chief Hoffman here, uh, investigations division. Um, it all depends. Uh, the, our relationship with these agencies, um, it depends on our personal contacts with the agents conducting the investigation. Uh, they're under no obligation to give us anything, but sometimes we get stuff and sometimes we don't. Um, I think an investigation by the board that would lead to an order to show cause would be mostly based on any material that would be provided uh, in a public manner uh, by either the SEC or the DOJ. So what you're and saying is if they didn't give it to us, we wouldn't have it. 
That's what you're telling me, unless it was in the public. We would be relying, yes, we'd be relying on them to give it to us. In this case. In this we've case. We've had other yeah. cases. We had a, with, with the SEC, we had an FCPA action around four or five years ago that during which we cooperated. So it was a concurrent action, we'll call it. We, we, did, we, we brought a regulatory action and SEC brought its own action. Um, we had a BSA action that was, was cooperative. So we've had that experience. Um, this is not one of those so far. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to get at is if if there was some point in the future where there was some because I there's, you know, it's pretty obvious, you know, um, as a as a 26, I don't know how many years, 20, many years as a judge, <laughs> you know, there's no charge. Uh, there's no, you know, those those comments resonate with me as far as a presumption of innocence and there is no charge. There's not even a charge. The problem is that if there was a charge and we are left to, and, and there's you know, been some references to, to other circumstances that I, um, I'm not privy to the previous experiences of the board, but it seems to me that we would be, we would be at the mercy of the charging entity to give us information outside of what the applicant gives us. Otherwise we won't, I guess we would do our own independent investigation, but that might be kind of tough. Um, and so I wanted to get the investigation's thoughts on that and the board's thoughts on that since you're, you know, the points are well taken. If there's a charge later, we can deal with it. Okay, well, how hard would that be to deal with if you can't, if you don't have access to the information, I guess is what I'm asking you. Madam Chair, is there a distinction between the duty of the applicant to disclose a condition of the applicant to disclose any future charges within 48 hours versus a limitation. And I don't know if that's for Deputy Attorney General Freinig. I'm just trying to understand the distinction. Well, uh, there's a distinction in that in, in, in with a limitation, the burden would be on the applicant to come forward in, you know, if let's say we hypothetically had a limitation of, oh, two years. Okay, two years later, that person is, here before us on an application, not us, but whoever's here on an application, and maybe their appearance is waived because nothing's happened and there's nothing to do, and that person goes forward and, and goes forward to their licensing versus a condition. Um, the person's been found suitable, their, their condition, they report it, and then we, the board, not we, but the board, has to make a determination whether they're going to seek a discipline um, and, and an investigation. And uh, if I'm wrong, Tiffany, you, you can clarify, please. I'm sorry, Ms. Breinig. <laughs> uh, apologies, uh, Chair Tagliati, if I could just interrupt one second because you were, you were talking about something and it seemed like it didn't come up and I just wanted to throw it, uh, communicate it. Can that, I get an answer from Ms. Breinig real quick? Wait, can I, I can oh, you, do oh. not interrupt my question to counsel? Oh, sorry. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. No, you were correct. The limitation though um, is time and the condition is um, just that a condition that the applicant or licensee must do something. So they're um, distinct. They are. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, counsel. Thank you. Okay, uh, apologies for that, for that Chair Tagliati. Uh, That's okay. You're, you're talking about a conditioning uh, or limiting a license with a condition about a disclosure within a certain period of time or provide, or provide information. And we certainly can do that. We can, we can have that condition placed on it where Sir Diller could, could have the obligation to provide that information to the board. I'm not talking about any, any, anything really. I'm just asking because I don't know right. how it is that, you know, and I appreciate, believe me, you know, when this first came up, I was asked if you were going to waive the 120 days by certain, you know, by investigators and things, right? So this, 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 um, you know, this hearing, um, you know, that, that has been provided for the reasons that you've already stated. There is no charge. There is no uh, formal anything other than a subpoena and timing as of right now. What I'm trying to get at is because of my um, newness to the board, what would be the process if in fact, because you've made very uh, passionate, um, articulate arguments um, uh, commenting on stability and everything else of the commission and the state gaming, um, 
what would be available to the commission and the board in the event the, you know, that it happened. And what I'm hearing is it's potentially just what you're, what you know, and what you can give us and not necessarily what the SEC or DOJ or anybody else would, because we would be at their mercy. That's what I'm getting at. And I don't know that to be true or not true. I'm just asking because I don't have the, I don't have the background or uh, history or experience. So that's what I was getting at is it's not, I'm not predetermined. I'm just trying to understand what would that investigation entail if, if there was a, the unexpected for lack of a better term. And, and I'm being told, we don't really know. It would be if they chose to tell us. That's what I'm understanding um, Chair Gibson and, and Chief Hoffman is telling me. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe I, this is Chief Hoffman again. Maybe I can clarify a little bit. We would conduct an investigation and we would draw information from everything available to us. It would be from uh, the applicant and or licensee. And it would also be from any other resources uh, that would be available to us, including um, other law enforcement regulatory agencies. In other words, we would cast a wide net and get everything we could. Um, and then whether we get everything that, say, for instance, the SEC has, that's up to them. But that doesn't mean that we can't pursue other avenues of investigation. And Chair, if, if I may, just one moment, I'm sorry. And, and you are correct. Um, we can only give you that which, which we would have. Um, and that would be with or without a limitation, um, condition or not a condition. Hope's perfectly open to a condition uh, to give you whatever we have. We, uh, as you've seen, uh, Mr. Diller has been completely transparent, um, and we'd be more than agreeable to whatever type of time frame you want for turning over whatever we have. In my mind, it would be short, like 48 hours. I don't want any delay. Harry's awesome at getting things very quickly. Well, we got things very quickly just now, just before we even, you know, before this hearing today. And so I, I have to say, based on the history, there has been no withholding of information. And I reviewed information very, very quickly before this presentation. So that hasn't been an issue for me, which is why um, I assume the duty that has been used previously will continue. And that's why it's not a concern for me. Because so there's I, been no charge. I'm sorry, Chair. Proceed. That's okay. I just was gonna when when I don't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. I'll wait till you're done. No, I'm finished. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so if I could redirect and finish what I was saying to um, to Chief Hoffman. So you know, I think Chief, you're familiar with the the circumstances here. I rem I I asked uh, you to do the interview that was completed and. Um, with Mr. Diller volunteering um, to be present and be interviewed. And I, I guess my question to you would be, if um, what, what if any concerns would you have um, about if there was a charge by either the SEC or the Department of Justice, um, your ability to fully um, investigate that in the event that such a, such a charge occurred? or not, I guess that would be my question because I'm not an investigator and I certainly don't have 30 years of investigation experience. Like, and if, I, if I'm undercutting you, I apologize, but I know you have a, like decades. Only by, only by about six months. Uh, <laughs> okay, 30 years and six months of experience. Uh, yeah, well, as uh, hypothetically, as a licensee, uh, Mr. Diller and his company, um, we would have full jurisdiction over them and we would have uh, full access to all of their records and even their testimony um, under oath if we needed it. Uh, and again, we would uh, gather information from uh, other law enforcement and regulatory agencies. So we would be able to conduct a full investigation. But as the discussion, uh, per the discussion earlier, the burden would be on us to uh, prove something versus having somebody in an applicant status burden would be on them. So it would be the shift in the burden, but it wouldn't change the way we would conduct our investigation at all. 
uh, we have full access to anybody who applies and we have full access to anybody who's a licensee. Okay. If I could pose a question, Madam Chair. So, but what about access to materials that the law enforcement agency were to develop? That's up to them. Right. That's one, that's of, the, that's one of the concerns. Yeah, they're not obligated to, to give us any. But if, but if there was a need for, you know, hypothetically bank records or witness statements or, you know, the things that someone would look at, um, just like the SEC um, would for any trade, we, we would have the ability to, to pursue those independently. We could, we could get anything that is given to the SEC in the conduct of their investigation by uh, the licensee, if they're the licensee at the time. Uh, we could require them to copy us on it. We have, we've already been going through that route. Um, so okay. if it's coming from the licensee, we would have access to it. It would be what we wouldn't have access to necessarily would be something that was developed by another agency, such as their internal reports. Okay. Um, the other thing I, I would just comment on, it really doesn't have anything to do in particular with any motions or anything. It's just an observation on my part. I'm not particularly comfortable comparing one matter to another in the past and going forward. I mean, of course, is, is with my prior career, you, you, you do, it's very important to treat similarly situated persons the same. The problem is none of these circumstances are that similarly situated. They're all independent on their own facts. And quite frankly, the reason that no one's asked for a waiver uh, of 120 days and, and, and you got a hearing in the first place is because, uh, you know, you're, you have an 80 year old applicant with a pristine record and a very um, successful um, career and business acumen and all of the things that we as regulators would look to and want in our, in our jurisdiction. So that's why we're having this hearing in the first place. Um, right. So, um, meaning without being asked to do something and drag it out and wait for those entities to do or not do something. So that's, that's just my comment on that. Um, so I don't know if any of you have any follow-up for, uh, anybody else's comments or for the DAGs or for, uh, Chief Hoffman or the chair. Thank you, Chair Tagliati. And I just want to, uh, I go back to the fact um, that a gaming license is a privilege. And to me, uh, and um, Deputy Attorney General Bining, if I'm wrong, please correct me. My concern is that um, we have an unknown element to the Commissioner Brown's point that there's nothing that we can correct. I'm not, I don't see this as, a, as an opportunity for him to correct anything. I look at this as an opportunity uh, to let this process go forward so that we can determine whether this develops into nothing. And in which case, if he has a um, limited license, he would just come back in whatever period, you know, one year, two year, whatever period. And um, as somebody mentioned, his appearance could probably be waived and we could just go full forward with uh, providing him the privilege. If he is um, approved unconditionally at this point, then the burden changes completely onto the board and the commission to, to show, to demonstrate a reason. Once you confer that privilege without limitations, you have to demonstrate why that privilege should be revoked. I don't think that it's a burden that our system requires that we undertake. Yeah, they stand in very different positions as to their rights. Is that correct? Um, Deputy Attorney General Biding. Yes, Commissioner. Um, the only um, small part would be the burden would shift to the board at the commission to bring forth any kind of disciplinary act. Correct. So to me, I view the limitation again, like as I don't want to repeat myself, but I don't see that as in any way impugning uh, Mr. Diller's character. I see that as a way that we can go forward with giving him the privilege based on his prior exemplary record, um, you know, as a businessman. It's, and at the same time, allowing this process to conclude to a point where we can have um, that the answer to this binary question, you know, if, if nothing develops, we go forward. If it does, then, you know, we have that limitation and, and 
we can certainly revoke that limited privilege uh, at the the opportunity that uh, at the time that it comes up either for renewal or in advance of that if the board determines that it's necessary. Um, so th th I, I just wanted to clarify that my concern is because of the change in status. Uh, and I, I'm not comfortable conferring the unlimited privilege on the record that we have and with the unknowns that we have at this point. Excuse me, Chair Todd, I hate to keep interrupting your deliberation, but I, we wanted to ask if Mr. Levin could address the commission quickly. Sure. Just, uh, just for sure. Some comments. Thank you all again very much and, and very much appreciate your time on this and your patience. I just want to, just because a lot of this has, has come up and a few different things people have said, I thought it was important to say. I've worked with uh, Mr. Diller for 20, almost 20 years now, I mentioned. I've been in many situations with Mr. Diller over those 20 years in business situations uh, to a point that Commissioner uh, Kikeffer made. We've seen, we've been aware of public company transactions over the course of our boards for 20 years in probably dozens of examples where we knew things were going to happen before they happened. And we've had business decisions over the course of those 20 years that are uh, every manner of uh, thing you could imagine. And never once has Mr. Diller ever made a decision that would ever go anywhere near a line. And when I read about this story and I read about it, same as all of you, my first thought was, well, that's an unfortunate coincidence. Uh, and I say all that because I do spend uh, some portion of my time, 0% of my time uh, dealing with issues with Mr. Diller for Mr. Diller, not a single one as it relates to dishonesty. I do spend a decent amount of time dealing with sometimes with dishonesty, uh, and that can sometimes be a challenge for me uh, when it comes across too quickly or too clearly. Uh, the, but having witnessed this, I just would say very humbly, it would be such a disappointment that to get his time, capital, and creative energy into this entity, this uh, city, this state, this category. I think it's a, a tremendous opportunity that we have. I guess the one thing we could accuse Mr. Diller of is impatience. Uh, and I would hate to, uh, I would hate to lose that and uh, uh, see that happen in the case of uh, losing the opportunity to uh, uh, get Mr. Diller involved. If there ever was a business person uh, of character and creativity to to I knowing very little here but to have uh, uh, the opportunity to be involved here uh, I can't imagine who it would be other than uh, Mr. Diller. and it would be unfortunate to lose that all on a on a leaked Wall Street Journal story that's all I apologize thank you very much and very much appreciate everybody here thank you thank you for the insertion and I just had one further comment I just wanted to make because I appreciate the deliberation and, and the serious hard work that you're you're taking to, to work through these issues because that is why nevada is the gold standard and that is it is precisely because this does get delineated out in, in public in this matter in this forum but one thing i i am hearing from from every commissioner is that it doesn't seem like any anything is related to any any disparagement of mr diller there's no no finding of, of any issue with what's out here as to his own integrity at this point so I guess I, I just would implore that how, however you deliberate, come through with this. Of course, if it's a full approval, then it's a full approval. But if there's some sort of limitation, if we could have some acknowledgement that this is not something that's that's reflective on, on Mr. Diller individually, I, I think that would be appropriate because that is what, I, what I'm hearing everybody saying. So thank you. Okay, so I, Chair, I, I have a brief... I'm Sorry. If I could, unless the commissioner has a question, I'm done taking any any comments from anybody I have a else. Question I, for Chief Hoffman. Sure. It's thank you. If I may, Chair, a question for Chief Hoffman. Sure. I just wanted to tell the applicants that we're 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 going to do the deliberation now, and and that there's going to be no continuing to argue or comment on on it. That's what I was thank getting you, at. Chief Hoffman, have you been copied on disclosures in connection with the SEC um, investigation to date by yes. Mr. Diller? 
yes, we've been copied on everything. Uh, we've had 100% cooperation from uh, Mr. Diller and his attorneys. Thank you so much. I just wanted to make sure that's been the course of dealing. Um, the second this became public and an issue, just to make sure that that has already been handled and there's been cooperation and disclosure. So you have a, a matched file that the SEC does, at least from Mr. Diller, which is the source. That is, that is correct at 100% cooperation. Thank you so much for clarifying. Okay. Um, did anybody else have any questions for Chief Hoffman, Chairman uh, Gibson, Tiffany or Darlene, uh, Brian Nagel or Caruso or comments uh, before there's any uh, request for a motion? I, I do think we need to make it clear that what we're talking about here is whether or not to um, have a condition be a, uh, a time period where he would have to come back. That doesn't mean that he's not licensed. That doesn't mean that he's not going forward. It means he would have a time period and he would come back um, versus no, versus full suitability, someone um, with a condition of notification. I think the condition of notification would be, you know, required regardless, uh, just as we do with, um, you know, any kinds of questions that we have, uh, please answer this question if it comes up, right? Um, so that's what we're talking about. Um, just based upon Mr. Levine's comments, I don't want him to think that we're talking about something else, which is not coming to Nevada and not participating or being and working with MGM. So um, did you have any additional uh, comments, Commissioner? I'm just gonna run down the line there as I see you, Commissioner Keekeffer. No, Madam Chair. Um, Vice Chair Solis I, I don't have any additional comments, thank you. Commissioner Cohen? No, oh, I'm prepared for a motion. Okay, Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Chair, I have nothing further at this time. Okay, um, so who who is going to make a motion at this time? Chair Tagliati, I'm prepared to make a motion on non-restricted item number 17 as read into the record by Madam Secretary, uh, both subject to a two-year limitation. And again, that limitation is proposed not for any reasons relating to Mr. Diller's character, but simply to maintain the status quo to allow this investigation to um, proceed to completion. And hopefully we would have him back at, after that period to um, appear before us for a license with that in the limitation. So what I was thinking is, um, since since it appears that's going to, I, I would assume that that's as to IAC and Mr. Diller and not Mr. Levin, who is separate and a different person. Um, so uh, I guess if we want it, if you want to break it up, I can do so. Um, well, I don't, so. I don't know that there's going to, I don't know how this is going to go as far as agreement or not agreement and if there'll be a competing motion and that kind of thing. But I think for Mr. Um, and I, I'm sorry if I say it wrong, Levin versus Levine, Levin, um, I may be saying that wrong. Um, he doesn't, you're not proposing a, a condition or a, a limitation, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so perhaps why don't we address his matter first? individually, um, it would seem appropriate to do that. And then we can go to any, go to your motion. Sure, um, again, I mean, I can break it up. There's different applications. The application for registration is a publicly traded uh, corporation. I would move for approval of that um, without any limitation. With respect to the application for finding a suitability as a beneficial owner of MGM Resorts International, uh, as to Mr. Diller, um, I would move for approval of that without limitation. With respect to the application for finding a suitability as a beneficial owner, a control and beneficial owner, I would move for approval of that as to both Mr. Diller and Mr. Levine without limitation. For the application for suitability, for finding suitability as an officer and director, uh, I would move for approval of that as to Mr. Diller with a two-year limitation as to Mr. Levine without a limitation. And for the applications for finding suitability as director, I think that was it, right? Um, the director, the same. Uh, two year limitation on Mr. Diller, no limitation on Mr. Levine. So it's a very long motion, but 
that covers each of the different applications before us. Now, I have a, a quick question for the uh, Deputy Attorney General, Brian, uh, before we hear from anybody else about the vote um, or any counter motions or anything like that. Um, is there any, based upon the motion that we just heard, um, if there was a limit, and I apologize, I you know need to ask you this question, but can the applicant move to to address that sooner? Um, there's nothing that stops them from coming before us and saying, "Hey, it's six months, and nobody, <laughs> you know, here's this SEC letter and this DOJ this or that saying I'm, you know, not." under review or subject to subpoena or something like that. I, I don't know, can that be uh, addressed by the applicant or not? Is it just a firm two years? Um, the license would expire at the two year mark. Um, I would defer to the board. It's my understanding they can provide any additional applicant materials prior to that two year mark. So um, they could get the process started before the two year ends. No, what I mean is, Madam, let's Madam say Chair, they're, they're able to yeah. file uh, to replace limitation with, oh. with a full license without yeah, at any 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 time. I would I would put that on. Okay, I see. Yes, sure. So mm -hmm. that's what you're saying is if if it turns out that <clears throat> some indication that there's no further investigation or something to that effect, then the person not just him, but anyone in this position would be able to come back, correct? Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. Earlier than the, than the limitation time period? That's correct. And, and you give it a full hearing and, and I, make I recommendations. It, it goes Absolutely. through the regular, just it would eventually come back to the commission again, is what you're saying one way or another? Yes. I mean, the only question would be, would, would the chair at that time, and if it's me, would the chair at the time hear it? I would hear it. Oh, I see. So there is a there's a discretion on your part. There's some discretion, yeah, but I, th I think it would go forward if there was a some kind of support for it. Okay, I'm I just I'm not aware of that, so I appreciate knowing that. Okay, um, sorry Madam to interrupt. Chair, when is the appropriate time for a competing motion? Um, uh, now. Okay, I have a competing motion chair for approval without any restrictions of non-restricted item number 17 is recommended by the gaming control board and is read into the record by madam secretary okay um so i guess the question would be um we'll take a vote perhaps on the first motion um i guess i have to brush up on my robert's rules of order <laughs> <laughs> Hold on while I get the pamphlet. Um, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, if you could clear up the first motion made by Commissioner Solis Rainey first, that would probably be the easiest. Okay. Um, so I'm rather than do the I and, and nay, uh, I'm going to make individual call for a vote because I can't always hear um, the group. And then um, Presumably, if that passes, it would moot the second motion. If it doesn't pass, then we go to the second motion, correct? Yes, that's correct, Chair. Okay. Chair, so, before, before, you call for, before you call for the roll, could I ask yeah. a clarifying question? Is there a dichotomy or some sort of ambiguity in the two-year motion, uh, two-year limitation for Mr. Diller and not IAC? Because I, I believe you're, I, I'm just trying to, you want to give the IAC. The motion was to have no limitation on IAC or Mr. Levine and just the two-year limitation on Mr. Diller. That's and you're saying, you're saying because Mr. Diller is in, is that what you're saying, Commissioner Cohen? Is that yeah, I, I, yeah, just, just kind of, you know, uh, rumbling See, around in my <laughs> head. Uh, and I and I don't want to go with three motions because I think that's uh, that's I think a problem. Deliberate is. I mean, can you can you articulate what your concern is? I mean, I I think I know what you're saying, but yeah. Because but my, my my concern is um, again, Mr. Diller, for, for the world to hear, as the record sits before us, 
we have no concerns. And I'm saying this collectively. We have no concerns regarding your character or anything you've represented, you know, to this, to, you know, to the board or the commission. This is a scenario to protect everyone, you know, and the state and that on a what if. So don't, uh, no, well, you, assuming the, assuming the vote goes the way I, I think it's going to go. I'm sorry. Assuming, can, go ahead, Chair. I'm sorry. Could I, I can't hear the shout out from the audience. I can't hear that. I don't know what was said. I apologize. Mr. Diller said it's not fair. I see. I, I understand, you know, from where you're sitting, it's not fair, but assuming the vote goes away, I, I believe it'll go, you'll be licensed fully. You, you know, there'll be a limitation. And and everybody is saying here, hey, if if if, if it changes, come back early and say, hey, we, we got a letter. Hey, there's no charges. You know, I, you know, I just don't want anybody to think for one reason that, that you are suspected, you know, on, on this panel of any wrongdoing. What it is, it's, it's a record before us that's imperfect. That's all we're saying, it's imperfect. I couldn't tell you what's gonna happen a month from now, a year from now, and that's why I think that, you know, the motion is made the way it is. So again, for, for the world, for the world, we respect you, sir. You've done a magnificent job. You know, uh, you know, I, I watched your meteoric career, and I, and I said that earlier. You're a great man. An unfortunate set of circumstances, and your attorneys have said an, an intervening event has caused this problem. But with that, um, th that those are my comments. And can I just clarify? Did you? And I apologize if I'm not clear on your motion. Did you did you include a condition? I don't remember. <laughs> Apologies. I didn't include a condition because I uh, the motion is for a limited license. <laughs> okay, so if there was a, um, you know, everyone was talking about the reporting condition, including council saying that's not a problem. Um, one way or the other. A, you know. I apologize for uh, for cutting you off. If I did, no, um, no. I don't believe a condition is necessary because I believe that a licensee has an ongoing duty to report. So okay. I didn't include a condition for that reason, but I did include okay. a limitation for the reason stated. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there any other discussion on um, Vice Chair Solis Rainey's motion? So what I'm understanding is there's a motion for, um, as to all entities and individuals before us, for um, for being uh, approved, with the with the exception of Mr. Diller putting a two year um, uh, limitation on it, no conditions for notification because that's continuing, um, and that's the substance of the motion. That's correct. Okay. Does anyone have any additional comments or questions on this specific motion, on the, from the commission? All right. So at this time, I'm gonna call individually for a vote on the motion by um, um, tenure or time on, on the commission, starting with Commissioner Solis Rainey. Do you vote? Uh, what is your vote on your motion? Aye. Commissioner Cohen? Aye. Commissioner uh, Brown. Nay. Commissioner Keekheffer. Aye. Um, so that's three out of four, I mean, three out of five. Um, I vote aye, the motion passes. Um, so you're gonna need to prepare a, um, The document, Ms. Uh, Madam Secretary, that gives um, the details of the the approval, with uh, no commission, no conditions, and a two-year limitation. Um, and I will invite Council to come back in the event that there's additional information that they think is appropriate. Okay, Thank we're going to take for your time. 
Thank you, you so everyone. much for the excellent presentations today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I think now we we'll take a time uh, time for a break for the recording um, for the recorder, court recorder and reporter. Excuse me, that's uh, what I meant to say. And how long do you think would be appropriate to my colleagues? One of our appeals I'm is fine with just, I'm fine with five minutes. Whatever everyone needs. If five. there's if there's pizza here, ten minutes. <laughs> pizza well, here. Okay, ten minutes. Uh, one of sure, our, how about we come back at at three fifteen? Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Chair Tagliati, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Tell me when we're ready to go. <clears throat> The reporter is back. Okay, perfect. So are we, are we ready to start back? Yes, we are. Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, Madam Secretary, I think that brings us to our restricted items held out for discussion. Please read in restricted number one. Restricted number one is the application of JR Tavern Holdings LLC doing business as Fred's Tavern for a restricted gaming license and the applications of Richard Slaw and Stephen Ellis Jr. for licensure as a member and manager. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval with the conditions as noted on the agenda. Hello. Good afternoon, Chairwoman, members of the Commission, members of the Board, and Madam Secretary. My name is Serena Choi with National Licensing Services, and to my right is Mr. Stephen Ellis, and via Zoom should be Mr. Richard Slaw. I believe he's there somewhere, yes? Okay, thank you. I'm Good sorry. It's been a long see. morning. I apologize for interrupting you. Is he on Zoom? I believe he should. Oh, he just texted okay. us. Uh, in the chat that he has a problem with the Zoom. Somebody's texting us in the chat. Let me just see real quick. Uh, Mr. He says he's reconnected twice. Um, Would he be able to call in, Chairwoman? Yes. Here's the thing. He did mention he would be out of town, and, and I know either he or you requested, requested excuse me, a waiver of his appearance. The yes. thing is, um, because of the open meeting laws and the, the his, historical precedent to first time licensees, meeting with the board, putting eyes on, meeting the commission, putting eyes on so that they understand the significance of, of and the privilege and what, it's, um, what, what they're undertaking. I, I, I asked him to appear via Zoom, but I certainly don't have a problem if he's having technical difficulties to call in if he can. And I don't intend to um, give him a hard time if he wants a call-in number. He needs a call-in number. Can we do that for him? Or is that too difficult? Jesus has sent him a, um, an a additional link to try to zoom in. Um, the system isn't really set up for phone in. Um, it's easier if he tries to log in again. Can you try one more time and then we'll see where it leads us. He has not connected as of yet. Okay. Well, why don't we do this? I mean, uh, um, look, I, I asked him to appear via Zoom. He's literally on the Zoom app trying. <laughs> Poor fella can't get in. And he's chatting with us via the chat, which I don't think the commissioners can see. Uh, but I can because I'm uh, on the app. So um, I don't know what the commissioner's pleasure is. I would be comfortable um either you know we could go forward we could trail it to see if he can make those arrangements um i mean i am a little concerned because it's a first first um licensing but i will i will defer to any of you that have strong feelings 
he is trying to comply with my request to be present and it's just not working out as far as his uh chair it's commissioner brown maybe we can trail it so we can move on to the next item and then after the next item see if he's able to log in yeah they sent him a new link so let's see if he can log in well let's we'll we'll recall you one item from now all right thank you okay thank you great idea okay um so let's let's madam secretary please read in restricted number two actually i'm going to read in restricted number three restricted number two is the same applicant oh i'm sorry yes uh, please read in restricted number three. Restricted number three is the application of Double Dice RV Park LLC doing business as Double Dice RV Park Bar and Grill for restricted gaming license and the applications of Travis Shumway and Jonathan Lund for licensure as a member and manager. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval with the conditions as noted on the agenda. Mr. Shumway and Mr. Lund are appearing via Zoom. Okay. Um, and do you see them? <laughs> We're having some Zoom problems today. I do not see them, Chair. No. This is Commissioner Brown. You know, I had to be let in the room. Has that occurred for these folks? Yes. They're, they're being promoted as we speak. It'll just, there's a slight delay between. I um, see. And that occurs. So. Okay. Um, this is Jonathan. I'm on if you can hear me. Perfect. Yes, and we see you as well. Thank okay. you. Okay. And I also saw Travis had a chat that said, um, Travis. Says I'm a panelist. Can you hear me? Yes, we have you now. Sorry to, but you come up as Travis, but this is Mr. Uh, Shumway. Yes, we have you. But you're muted. You just went muted. There you go. Now you're not. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'll go on and off mute. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So at this time, we have everyone present. Um, Ms. Gaynor. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, for the record, uh, Jennifer Gaynor with Jay Gaynor Law. Uh, here on behalf of the applicant, as you can see, I have with me via Zoom, Mr. Travis Shumway and Mr. Uh, Jonathan Jack J.J. Lund. Um, both Mr. Shumway and Mr. Lund are successful uh, business owners uh, focused on the construction and healthcare industry. Uh, they are both new to gaming in Nevada, so they look forward to operating as part of our vibrant gaming community in the state. Um, they do understand the board would like them to have some additional assistance given uh, that they are new to gaming um, and they accept the uh, conditions of having a slot route operator for a year and uh, having a key employee submit their uh, application. Um, I will turn it over to Travis and JJ to introduce themselves and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Hey, I'll go for first. Uh, thank you for having us Zoom. Uh, I could have used a Las Vegas trip, but my wife definitely is very thankful that I got to stay home. So thank you guys. Um, again, my name is Jonathan Lund, uh, primarily a general contractor entrepreneur since I was 16 years old, um, constantly looking for new business adventures and, and different things to do. We're really excited to be a part of, of hopefully your gaming community and look forward to working with you and, and here to answer any questions you have for them. Thank you. Um, I'll start with Commissioner Solis Rainey, the way we've been kind of going today and just work our way down with any questions for you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Lund. Um, if you could maybe speak a little bit to how you, how you expect uh, to be involved with this new venture. Yeah, so we, we currently have been remodeling our the RV park um, slash store bar and uh, the location where the machines will go. So I've been out there a lot in the remodel process and getting to learn the operations of the business. Um, it's a lot to learn. Um, but again, I've just been trying to admit myself in it to get to be a big part of it. And we have weekly meetings with our team 
I mean, I'm on the, I'm on the phone with them daily. Uh, we have a long term time manager that has managed the property for a lot of years, over 10, over 15 years, I think actually that we're it, uh, really helps us out a lot. Um, just see myself in any part that I can to help uh, run a successful business out there. Is the park open while you're doing these renovations? Yes, we were able to do it in off hour operations as far as, you know, the people inside. Um, the remodel has been completed. Uh, still need to add some John Wayne pictures and some and some different decorations inside, but but the, the construction portion is all done. Okay, perfect. And is the longtime manager that you referred to the person that's going to be applying for a key employee license? Yes. Okay, perfect. So do you see that person being a day-to-day um, responsible for the day-to-day operations? Yeah, she actually lives on site. Um, some of the other employees have been there a long time as well, so they kind of know the drill, but Again, she's on site. She's she's there a lot um, and, and doing most of it. And how far is it from where uh, you live in Lehigh, uh, Utah, and I believe your partner lives in Blanding? How far is it from there, those locations to Elko? It's a three-hour drive for me. Um, we can get there in the private plane in about 50 minutes. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Thank you for appearing. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Cohen, anything? Not a, nothing. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Brown? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lund, for your appearance today. Just briefly, how much time do you intend to spend um, at Class Jack Construction versus the Double Dice RV Park Bar and Grill in terms of your allotment of time? Yeah, so great question. Right now, I'm, I'm pretty much allowing a, a full day a week um, to be on the double dice uh, time time frame you know as far as from the financials or being being on site I, I plan on about a day a week and sir what's the division of labor between you and mr. Shumway do you I assume you have different roles and you're wearing different hats could you maybe provide some specificity about that yeah no uh, just <clears throat> our personalities and our background is I've been a lot in the building, process I build um, apartment complexes and homes and develop land uh, so know a lot about the construction side of things um, Travis is very strong in I mean multiple aspects of business but he's going to be helping more on the administration side and I'll be helping on um, just upkeep and constant making the place nice and, and keeping up on it. thank you sir I don't have any further questions or areas of concern okay um Commissioner Keycover? I have no questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, did I, I just, I wanted to ask, um, I'll just ask you since we're talking to you right now, or I thought I saw that you're registered for the June compliance course. Is that right? Correct, yes. Okay, pay careful attention. Okay, yeah, I definitely <laughs> will. I've learned a lot in this process. You guys, the staff's been amazing and, and uh, learned a lot through it, but I, I definitely will pay attention. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're get, we're. It's, I'm just a little punchy because it's three thirty. <laughs> no, had... I know. I, I I mean, I've I've realized how big of a deal this is, and it is very important. And I've <laughs> I've come to know that through these meetings and when I was there last month watching all this stuff. So I, I am taking it very serious, and Travis as well. And and uh, we're excited. We're going to do a really good job. And you'll be proud of us. All right. Well, we appreciate that. Maybe now, um, since uh, Mr. Shumway is on, we can hear from him just a little bit about yourself, sir, and and then we'll pose any uh, questions we have. Sorry. Yeah, for the record, Travis Shumway. I really appreciate the Zoom call. I'm uh, coaching my son's t-ball game right well at 5 o'clock. We're having practice right now, so this is huge for me. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, it's a small town guy. JJ and I get along great because we have that in common, really similar. Um, trying to improve things and get better. How can I, what questions can I answer for any of you? Starting with uh, Vice Chair Solis Rainey, do you have any questions? I don't have any questions. Thank you. Commissioner Cohen? No questions, Chair. This is the first time I've been simultaneous with a t-ball game in my entire career. Uh, for, any, uh, 
So it means the world to me. I wasn't planning on it. I thought we were meeting at eleven. So I uh, I do apologize, <laughs> but you can't. I, I do okay. say families of fire. <laughs> okay, um, Commissioner Brown. Uh, Mr. Shumway, I just uh, wanted to thank you. I, I wish we could see you in person, but I completely understand and just wanted to say you've come a long way since you did your mission in Romania and you should be really proud of yourself. And I hope that you and Mr. Lund have success in your new endeavor. Thank but I have you. no Appreciate questions that. for you and no areas of concern. Commissioner Keekeffer. No questions, Madam Chair. Good luck in the game. Oh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, so at this time, if there's no additional questions, I think it's in proper form for a motion. Thank you, I move for appro approval of restricted item number three as read into the record by Madam Secretary and recommended by the Game Control Board. Okay, uh, any discussion on the motion? There no. being none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, it appears to be unanimous, gentlemen. Congratulations, and uh, thank you for your patience today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go back to, um, I'm gonna ask actually Madam Secretary um, to, to read in Restricted 2, since it will, <clears throat> I'll be recalling, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's already been read into the record, Restricted 1. Uh, so we'll read 2 into the record, and then we can proceed, uh, hopefully with both. Restricted number two is the application of RJ Tavern Group LLC doing business as Fred's Tavern for restricted gaming license in the applications of Richard Slaw and Stephen Ellis Jr. for licensure as a member and manager. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval with the condition as noted on the agenda. Okay, so um, was Mr. Slaw able, there he is. There he is, although he's muted. Um, can you hear me now? I can. Um, I'm told by our staff it was a Zoom issue. And so I appreciate your patience while we uh, hash that out. And I think you were not on when I explained that we um, appreciate you being here. Um, even if it can't be physically, we really um, like to put, you know, because of the open meeting laws and the fact that I don't know what commissioners are going to have questions for who, and we don't deliberate in advance, and we don't know those things in advance until we get here. Um, that's why we really needed to get you on the Zoom, and, and I appreciate your patience, okay? Um, so <clears throat> we left off, and um, I think we were just going to have a, a comments on <clears throat> your item. The applications, uh, whoever would like to speak first. We're here to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. <laughs> um, Len, I will start as I have all day with Vice Chair uh, Solis Rainey. Uh, thank you. I just had a quick question. There's uh, a difference in the ownership percentages between restricted item number one, which is JR, and restricted two, with, which is RJ. Is that just a matter of how much uh, you were investing in each Correct. location? I, I funded everything up to this point and plus adding more of the money down. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name's Steve Ellis. Okay. Thank you. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, I'm a, I grew up small community ranch kid. I went in the Marine Corps at 19 and I was medically discharged. I got out and went, I became a railroad welder and I, started in the oil field where I started from the very bottom clear to the top now and then now we're just trying to find uh, investments. Right and with respect to these uh, two locations are you going to be involved with the day-to-day -day operations? Absolutely. Okay how much time do you anticipate spending at each location? Seven days a week. Okay so you're, you're not going to maintain other employment? Well I am they're, get, they're setting up a process where I can work from home okay. doing that like three four hours a day. Okay. And then, but the rest of the time, uh, taverns. Okay. Um, I didn't have any other questions. Thank you for being here with us. And I, I also appreciate your patience. It's been a long day. <laughs> Thank you. Should we have Mr. Slop give us a little presentation um, or talk about himself a little bit before we go to the next person? Could we do that? Yes, please. Sir? All right, so if y'all can hear me, thank you so much for your time, and I'm glad I'm not an IT person, so uh, uh, I don't have to fight that. But my name's Richard Slaw. 
I've uh, been in the oil and gas industry for going on 34 years now in, in various realms of uh, safety and security. And uh, currently I'm the corporate security director for Kinder Morgan. I've known uh, uh, Mr. Ellis there since, I think since he was about 10 years old, I've coached him in baseball and, and we've just uh, joined a good friendship. And now it's time to look for some additional investment opportunities to maybe I can uh, uh, say farewell to the oil and gas industry and hello to the, the uh, bar industry. All right, thank you for that. Commissioner uh, Cohen or Commissioner Solis Rainey, because I realized I went to the other individual and didn't give you the opportunity. If either one of you have any questions, then I'll move to the other commissioners. I have nothing, Chair. Um, Commissioner Brown. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Slaw, could you tell me um, the division of labor that you will have between you and Mr. Ellis in connection with this new endeavor? Who's going to be doing what? So uh, uh, Mr. Ellis is going to take on more of the day-to-day -day, uh, operations since he lives right there in Las Vegas. And I'm going to be uh, kind of the uh, remote uh, uh, work from home type uh, accounts payable, uh, looking at uh, the budgets and, and uh, trying to help manage more from the HR type of side of, of manuals and that. So we're going to share a lot of the workload, but uh, unfortunately, Mr. Ellis is going to get uh, the brunt of what's there, boots on the ground. Thank you, sir. And then, uh, Mr. Ellis, I just had to ask you quickly, there was an issue about a disclosure um, or non-disclosure, I should say. Um, as you sit here today, do you now have a recollection of that incident in 2000? Yes. Okay. And can you tell me why it wasn't disclosed? I completely forgot about it, honestly. That okay. was just an oversight, and I deeply apologize for mm, disclosing. No, understood. And I and I know that there was a disclosure you made about a 2002 incident, so it's not that I don't think you were trying to conceal anything. It just seems like it was an oversight on your part. I just wanted that for the record. Yes. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. I have no areas of concern. Commissioner Keycover? Thank you, Madam Chair. My questions were the same as Commissioner Brown's regarding the disclosure issue. Um, I think the, the record does indicate you disclosed other um, other issues. So um, I'll have to um, take you that it was just an oversight. But um, so, you know, we, we really rely on um, your honesty coming forward and putting everything on the record um, that's uh, that's possible for you to do. So um, as, as you move forward, if you have future applications, um, make sure you can. Absolutely, yes, sir. Thank you. I think they both understand self-regulation and privilege, so yes. <laughs> okay, so gentlemen, I just have a, a quick question. Um, you're familiar with the recommendation, I mean, the conditions that are part of the uh, Gaming Control Board's recommendation for approval, the regulatory compliance seminar, the, you know, at least a year of slot route operate, those conditions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma and you yeah, understand- Just to add, oh, oh. I apologize. Go ahead. They have registered for the June compliance course and they do have golden for a licensed slot ride operator. All right, perfect. Um, so I'm just to be fair, since I said it before, listen carefully <laughs> the, at the compliance seminar. <laughs> That's how you stay out of trouble. Um, okay, so I just wanted to make sure that you understand the conditions and, it, and apparently you're 50% there on the conditions. So thank you for that. Um, and I have no additional questions or concerns. Um, at this time, it would appear it's ripe for a motion. Madam Chair, should I move separately or combine items one and two? I'm comfortable if you combine them. Thank you. I move for approval of, non, of restricted items number one and number two as recommended by the Gaming Control Board and is read into the record by Madam Secretary. And with the conditions on the second I, uh, restricted item? Yes, and with the conditions of set forth. Oh, I guess they're on both. Sorry, my bad. Okay, um, any discussion on Commissioner Brown's motion? There being none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 And it appears there were none opposed. Uh, so thank you all for your appearances and your patience today. We appreciate you being here and waiting uh, as long as you did. So thanks for that. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Secretary, could you please read in uh, restricted item number four? 
Thank you. Restricted number four is the application of Timbers LLC doing business as Timber Saloon for restricted gaming license and the applications of Michael Van Overbeck and Cheryl Webster for licensure as a member and manager. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval with the condition as noted on the agenda. I believe we have appearances from Carson City. Hi there. Hello, if I may. How are you? My name is Chris McKenzie, the law firm of Alice McKenzie. Here with me is Mr. Michael Van Overbeek and Cheryl Webster. Um, you may be familiar with them. This was, uh, uh, I don't want to rehash it too much, but it was a passing of uh, Miss Betty Larson. It's Mr. Van Overbeek's wife and Cheryl Larson's mom. Uh, there was, they were going to be third owners, succession planning, then she untimely passed away. So we're here now for seeking licensure, Timbers LLC, and each of them as managing members of the Timbers LLC. We're available for any questions. I will say, um, Mr. Van Overbeek, you look well. Oh, yeah. Last time I yeah. think I saw you, whether it was on video or in person, it was a neck brace and a big. Yeah, I'm doing a lot better. A lot better. Good. Glad to glad to see it and hear it. Um, so um, I I think what I'm going to do because I you know I, I know that it feels sometimes to applicants like you come come before us so much, uh, but because of the open meeting laws and because I don't know what other commissioners might wanna ask you at any given time and I don't get to sit around a fire with them and talk first, <laughs> I have to kind of just um, allow the you know process to play out, which means you have to come back a few times. And so we appreciate your patience and today knowing you waited a long time. Um, at this time, I would ask Commissioner Solis, uh, Vice Chair uh, Solis Rainey if she has any questions. I just have a couple questions. Uh, first of all, thank you both for being with us. Um, with respect to the property, uh, is is probate complete now? May I step yeah. up? May I answer that? This is Chris McKenzie for the record. Um, the, actually, the property was part of the trust, which is being administered. And so the only part oh, okay. of the probate was the, was the licensure of Betty Larson, which we're now not okay, passing perfect. as new licensure. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and just for clarification, in our records, it indicated that you were open from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Is that 8 a.m. to midnight? Yes. I think that might've been a typo. Okay, perfect. Um, Ms. Larson, I understand you're a retired nurse, uh, recently retired, uh, and thank you for yes, your service. Uh, it, um, oh, thank you. The records, the records indicated that you planned on working at the property Monday through Friday from two to five, and then it indicated um, Mr. Van Overbeek was uh, planning on working there from 5.30 to 9.30 a.m. and then 1.30 to 4.30 p.m. Who's responsible for the property during that um, middle of the day and end of day periods? Well, uh, the, some of those plans have changed um, as, as um, was noted, my stepdad had um, a neck injury and had to have um, neck surgery, also had back surgery. So actually what, and we were planning on doing this in partnership and that was the plan when my mother onboarded us. Uh, but um, what, what we're doing right now until he's well is that I'm actually going into the bar every, every day. I oversee the day-to-day um, operations in the morning and also in the afternoon. He does come by and, and see, um, you know, how operations are going. It's just a small tavern and, and is there for a few hours for supervision. But we also have, we have a bar manager that's there during the day as well um, that, that uh, will oversee when we're not there. But I'm there, I'm there every day as well as my husband. He helps me with the janitorial. And then I do all of, I do, you know, the, I do all the books and balance the till and, and um, do drops when they're needed and stuff like that while Mike is recovering. Okay. And how close are you to the property? How as close far, am how I? How close do you live? Yeah. How close do you live from 20 minutes. your home to your property? Okay. 20 so minutes. Something and comes up. Yes. And he's three minutes. Okay. So you're both relatively close in the event something came up when you're not there. Yes. Um, I didn't have any other questions. Thank you both for your appearance. Hey, Commissioner Cohen. No questions. Commissioner Brown. 
Thank you so much for appearing, both of you. I appreciate it very much. Just in terms of mechanics, quickly, I just wanted to confirm that um, each of you are to pay $60,000 into Mrs. Larson's trust for the acquisition. Is that accurate? It's already been done. All right, subject to approval, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate your patience today. It's, it's good to, counsel, did you have something to say? I would just say this is new, uh, new licensure. They've already purchased their interest in the LLC, and so the okay. LLC is submitting for licensure. All right, thank you. I don't have any other questions. We appreciate your time. Commissioner Keekepper. No, quite a, no, no questions, Madam Chair. Just to say that Timbers is a important part of the Carson City community, and uh, happy to see it got to this stage after some uh, ups and downs. So, thank you. All right. Well, uh, I um, appreciate again your appearances today, and I have no additional questions. Um, so at this time, I think it's in proper form for a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would move that uh, we approve uh, restricted item number four uh, as recommended by the Gaming Control Board and re read into the record by Madam Secretary. With the condition as noted on the agenda? Is that the, I can't remember, I'm sorry, I have the note here on the condition. Yes, with, with the condition that if an equity owner is no longer functioning as a key employee for this location, the key employee application must be filed within 60 days and thereafter be refiled within 60 days of any change and the person occupying that position. Thank you. And I usually ask, and I forgot to, your, your clients are aware of that, you know, the um, condition, obviously. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, any discussion on the motion? There being none, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. And it appears that there are none opposed. Thank you very much. Um, and we appreciate you today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you your time and much. consideration. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right. At this time, Madam Secretary, please read in restricted number nine. Restricted nine is the application of TLC Gaming Inc. for a transfer of interest. The recommendation of the Gaming Control Board is for approval. I believe we have a disclosure on this item. Thank you so much. Uh, in connection with this matter, Terry Cottle is adverse in two matters handled by Lewis Roke, the firm where I am a partner in which matters I have. Uh, not been involved. I have no pecuniary interest in the outcome of this agenda item, and I don't believe the independence of judgment of a reasonable person in my position would affect uh, would be affected by the relationship described on the record, and I therefore intend to participate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Uh, please state your name for the record. Thanks so much, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Madam Secretary. Alicia Ashcraft of the law firm of Armstrong Teasdale on behalf of TLC Gaming. With me here today is Mr. Terry Cottle. Uh, the item before you today is really still a straightforward transfer of interest of 5% from Mr. Timothy Logger to the 95, already existing 95% owner, owner, Mr. Cottle. Um, however, as you're aware, during the investigation on this transfer of interest, there was a compliance matter that came up uh, with regard to a key employee requirement on one of the locations. Um, that compliance matter was immediately addressed and matters put in place to make sure that going forward, uh, that didn't happen again. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions or go over. You know, it's late in the day, so I don't want to um, go into too much detail that's not warranted, but we're happy to answer any questions or give a summary of those measures. But again, measures have been taken to make sure that uh, going forward, uh, no issues arise of that nature again. Thank you. Commissioner Solis Rainey. I didn't have say quickly, I want to say oh, uh, my name, obviously, I'm Terry Cottle, and good afternoon, but Madam Chairperson and all the commission members. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Mr. Cottle, and I don't have any questions. Thank you. I have no questions either. Thank you so much for your appearance, and sir, I, I reviewed the record, and I noted that um, the compliance issue is not a team effort, and I'm echoing the sentiment uh, that was raised by Board Member Wat Watkin, uh, Watson at the time when the matter was referred back in January of 2022. And I know that he wanted to impart that you need a responsible person to address these compliance issues. And I do note that um, on February 21st, 2022, TLC Gaming submitted a compliance plan 
um, it's been submitted. So you understand the responsibility that you need a specific person or a group of people, but not a full, you know, somebody has to be responsible. I just wanna hear um, Mr. Cottle say that on the record. Uh, absolutely, thank you, Commissioner Brown. Point well taken um, that it, it, it is a team effort in that everyone works together, but to uh, uh, Dr. Watkins' point and yours here now, there's a hierarchy in place that there is a person responsible for ensuring um, that that uh, compliance item is appropriately addressed at all times. And then there are backups and supervision over that uh, to make sure, but but again, to Dr. Watkins' point and yours, yes, that is uh, assigned to a specific person to ensure that matters. I just want to hear him for the record that he understands that. Oh, yes, absolutely. He came all this way. He waited all day. I'd love to hear him speak. Uh, yes, uh, obviously, as my background, I respect, we respect very much internal controls and any kind of procedure. And we have followed the, the Gaming Control Board's recommendations as to uh, hopefully to avoid the confusion uh, involving the key employee and, and what the NGC Form 9 does or does not represent. But we are we understand this, the board's position. We're willing to do whatever. We've already implemented two things. We filed a new key employee application. And as my attorney has said, we created a compliance committee and that compliance committee now reviews all NGC 9s before they go out. And we understand the interpretation that the board has of the information on there that was a little maybe different than what we were interpreting. Well, thank so, you so yes, much. we do accept the change. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for making that representation on the record. I appreciate that. I don't have anything further. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Kikapper. I'm all good, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Well, sir, um, Commissioner Brown covered um, and, and I appreciate your answers to her uh, request. Um, that's covered as far as I'm concerned with her uh, inquiry to you, and I appreciate that. So at this time, it would appear that it's proper for a motion. Chair, I'm prepared to move forward for approval of restricted item number nine as recommended by the Gaming Control Board and as read into the record by Madam Secretary. Any discussion on the motion? There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 All right. It appears uh, that all are in favor and there are none opposed. Thank you, sir, for your appearance today and to council. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for coming and your patience. Okay, so this uh, moves us now to um, Madam Secretary, if you could please read in our next agenda item. Next for your consideration are four gaming employee registration appeals. Your first item is Tyler Warren, case number 21LV08907. Hello, hello. Yes, okay, after six hours, hello, hi, I think I got this. Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, Commissioners, how's everybody doing today? Good afternoon. I'm sorry Hello. I don't have my separate seven representatives to escort me, but it's just me. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, the way this works, um, and, and to the extent you already know this, and I'm, I'm repeating something you already know, please indulge me, uh, but we um, are confined to, you know, know about what um, is involved in your case from the record before be below. And so we've been, we have transmitted materials um, from, from the proceedings below. And so now is your opportunity to address the commission. And then um, there's a very realistic likelihood of questions potentially that you would uh, answer. And then, um, the commission will make a decision. So do you have any questions before we start as to the process since you get to go first and we have four today, you'll be kind of the first one of the day? No questions. Okay, so uh, at this time, do you wish to, to make a, a statement to us first? Yes, yes I would. Okay, please uh, go right ahead. Uh, first, thank you for this opportunity uh, to be able to, to present myself before you. Um, 
First off, I want you to know that I truly understand the severity of my actions that have brought me before you. And um, <clears throat> okay, so I have completed all requirements of uh, from the court. Um, I am no longer in constructive custody. Um, outside of their requirements, uh, I am currently in alcohol counseling. Uh, when I got laid off during the pandemic, uh, my drinking became very escalated and it was a serious problem for me. Um, in one week, it will be, I will be 20 months sober and I will continue to go to AA meetings two to three times a week. My girlfriend, who uh, currently is with me, uh, very supportive and forgiving. I thank God for her every day. Uh, without her, I wouldn't probably be here. Um, we are both in trauma counseling currently also, and that is going uh, very well. Um, so those are the facts. And I, what I'm trying to do to make amends of my uh, serious flaw. Um, so now I would like to personally address the commission. I understand that my integrity is in question. And um, during my initial phone call, the uh, agent who got addressed to my case, Agent Winterton, he was here, um, but I, um, I made a terrible mistake. Um, I lied on the phone call and I immediately regretted it totally. And um, it showed a lack of integrity, lack, uh, showed a huge, a grave lack of integrity. And I am extremely sorry. I have no excuse. I take full responsibility. My attorney told me not to talk to anybody. There was a lot of variables. I got caught off guard with the phone call and I panicked and I lied and I made the horrible decision to lie. And I am extremely sorry. That's not who I am. 20 months later, I work every day to make amends and get healthy and continue to be better. I do have integrity. I have integrity at home. I have integrity with my family. I have integrity at work when I am at work. If you resort to the letter I get from, uh, they uh, should be in evidence from uh, my casino operations manager. Um, he says that I model the highest values of the company. And uh, according to the letter, I'm an excellent employee and I must say, I love my job. I miss it. I miss, I love the gaming business. I miss the job I miss just the atmosphere. And I'm, I stand before you just pleading for a second chance and I will not let you down. And, and I will continue to work every day to show my integrity. That's all. Okay, thank you for your statement. At this time, I'm going to solicit uh, any comments or questions from uh, the commissioners, vice chair. I'm sorry, so I have... Madam, um, I just have one more important statement. Um, sure. I just want the record to be shown that I have two dogs and uh, one of them is blind. Okay. <laughs> Thank okay, you. That was all. Uh, Commissioner Solis. Thank you, uh, Chair Tagliati. Uh, I just had a quick question. You indicated that you're, you've completed your requirements. At the time of the board hearing, I think you still had six sessions. Uh, yes. Counseling. Yes. And you've completed those just in the last two weeks? Yes. No, not two weeks. No, it's been longer than that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking you appeared at the board meeting, but it was your hearing. So it was a few. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The case was officially closed April 4th. Yeah. Okay. And are you currently working? No, no. I've, uh, I've tried to apply to multiple jobs, but nobody is hiring. Have you, um, have you applied for jobs other than gaming? Yes, jobs? yes, non-gaming. That's uh, specifically what I've applied for. And with the uh, with the battery charge, it's it's been denied every time. What other work have you done uh, other than dealing? Uh, work, yeah. like just. Uh, yeah. What other types of jobs have you had other than in the gaming industry? Not gonna lie, gaming is all I know. Um, I've been in the business for ten years. I'm thirty one. Uh, as soon as I turned 21, got into gaming and just loved it. Um, I don't have any further questions at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Cohen. Just a couple of comments. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the felony, the, the, you know, the, the strangulation of, of, of Ms. Hibbett's very troubling. Extremely. Um, you lying to the board mm. agent, which you acknowledge is very troubling. Mm. So the question for us, you know, it really comes down to, A, do we believe, you seem like a very nice, you know, I don't know what goes on, you know, once you leave here, 
you know, are you going to AA meetings presently? Yes. Yeah. I still go two to three times a week. Um, and I know this isn't part of the record, but is your girlfriend, did she have a drinking issue too? Uh, no, okay. no. Um, so I think this happened in August of 21. Is that right? No. Uh, 2020. Oh, I'm sorry, 2020. September of, 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 of 2020. Um, when was the last time you had a drink? Uh, it's been 20, 20 months. 20 months? Yeah, so pretty much as soon as, it, when, as soon as that incident happened, the next day, I knew it was as serious as it was. Have you had any run-ins with the law since that time for any reason whatsoever? No, I've been clean as a whistle, sir. Okay, thank you. Sir, sure. I commend your, oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you for waiting. I know you've been here a long time and, and I commend, uh, it seems to me, your efforts to work hard on improving yourself. Um, can you tell me why there was such a gap of time between the incident on September 27th, 2020 and the arrest on June 16th, 2021? Um, there was a lot of um, gap. Um, Pretty much that was uh, trying to figure things out with the courts and uh, when to come in and like get things situated with my lawyer and just pretty much figure things out. That was kind of like a figuring out period, I would say. And what led to the, the, the events that transpired that evening that resulted in the strangulation? What, what led up to the yeah, events? What, what happened? Um, I think I was watching a sports game, um, was drinking with friends, um, and then... Uh, I don't know, just something, I was not in the right state of mind, uh, the pandemic, everything, you know, I was definitely just out of touch with reality, I would say, um, drinking has gotten way out of hand, um, and I don't know, I, I just, something just, just got to me, just triggered me when I came home, and yeah, and it was just downhill from there, and okay. I, I just, you know, just saw black, blacked out, and it was just all bad news. Thank you, sir, for uh, being honest and coming before us today. I appreciate your time. No problem. Thank you. Commissioner Keycapper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Was there a reason that you hadn't completed the um, domestic violence counseling prior to the hearing before the game control board? Um, because of the time frame, you can only do one class a week. Uh, so just it just happened to be that way. I, if I could do more, I would have done more, but by the, the just the way the date of the hearing and how many classes I had left, I couldn't do anything about it. Thank you. I'm sorry, did you say it was a six month class or a one year class? Six months, uh, six right? Six months. Six months, yes. You know, I don't know that I have any additional questions. Um, I will say this. Um, you know, the, what happened in your case is kind of my background in bailiwick, if you will. Um, I was a criminal judge for many, many years. And before that, I was a lawyer in the, in the practice of criminal law. And I'll say that there are a lot of studies um, and there's information that, you know, when you're, when, you know, on one hand, um, whatever it is about your background, um, and your, I guess, lack of criminal history speaks well as far as the district attorney being willing to offer you a plea bargain um, to a battery domestic violence misdemeanor as opposed to because, because of the significance of strangulation and what the studies show, those cases are taken very seriously by the DA's office because that's a heightened domestic violence right there, right? And so, um, you know, I, I'm not going to speculate that it's it's whether it's your stellar history or the, the uh, named victims preferences that were communicated to the district attorney's office. I can just solely say that um, the fact that you got a misdemeanor makes you a very lucky person, <laughs> very lucky person, at least in the outright. Usually you have to do um, something to, to get that kind of reduction. Um, that's just my experience. I can't put it aside. That's what I know to be true. Um, but, but you know, look, if, if this were about you being charming and having a great sense of humor, it'd be a lot easier decision, okay? <laughs> um, but, but for me, you know, um, 
I think this is going to be one of those things where maybe, maybe you're, you know, as far as I'm concerned, everything we do sets a precedent for other people and messaging and all of that kind of thing. And so that's kind of where I'm going to come down on, on this issue. But, um, but I certainly appreciate you answering all the questions being forthright and, and, um, and I don't take that lightly. I think that's important. So thank you for that. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? How do you pronounce your name for the record? Uh, Tyler Warren. Thank you. Yeah, no R. Sorry. So um, at this time, I believe um, it would be proper for a motion by one of the commissioners. Chair, if I may, I move to sustain the Nevada Gaming Control Board's objection of Mr. Tyler Wong's registration as a gaming employee. Okay. Is there any discussion on the motion? Really quick. Yeah, Madam Chair. And, um, could you do, could you lean a little closer to your mic, uh, Commissioner? I'm Keith? sorry, Madam Chair. I just need to speak up. No, I apologize. Um, I, I actually okay. think it's your mic. To be honest with you, you have a, a really deep, uh, resonating voice. It's your mic. There's something going on with okay. it. Okay. I'm not going to try to change my voice and make it different. <laughs> um, anyway, look, congratulations on getting sober and um, doing obviously what you need to do to get get your life in order. Um, I'd encourage you to reapply um, if, if if this motion is, is successful. Um, I just I'm of the opinion that not enough time has passed. Um, if if you were pushing so much up against the deadline that you couldn't even get all the requirements done before your appellate hearing, um, then maybe we just need to take a take one breath and um, try it again. So um, I hope you stay on the path that you're on, uh, and hopefully we'll see you again. Any, any other discussion? All right. If there's no di further discussion, I'm going to call for a vote on uh, Commissioner Brown's motion. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, sir, it appears it's unanimous um, that um, at, we decline your, um, we're sustaining the, um, um, the determination below and we're denying your appeal for lack of a better description. But um, this is one of those things where um, Commissioner Key Keffer really laid it out. You can come back and um, I, I, um, I wish you very good luck in the next year. So how do I go about that? Do I just come back next year or? Yeah, you'll, you'll be able to, um, you can contact the commission or the, uh, to determine when you're at, I think it's like exactly a year from, is it, I did this last time, Tiffany, <laughs> I mean, Ms. Brian, I uh, yeah, Yes, Chair, it's one year from today's decision that um, he can request reconsideration. So he can actually start that process earlier and then get the hearing the first available meeting after that one year period, correct? No, he must wait oh, oh. Um, one year from today's decision before requesting. Okay, so then presumably you would go on the next meeting after that, okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Madam Secretary, next agenda item uh, would be um, Elizabeth Blue. Um, I'm I believe you advised me that Ms. Blue ha had to leave before we could call her item due to a family uh, matter. Is that correct? That is correct. And she at the time did request that um, her item be continued to June, if at all possible. Okay, so um, let's do that so that she can have the opportunity to have us hear her appeal. And I think she was here for quite a while and I feel bad about that, but uh, we'll hear it in June. Thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, next agenda item, please. Next item is Juliana Knapp, case number 21LB08749. Good afternoon. My name is Mondana Divan Begi with Nevada Legal Services, bar number 14862, uh, on behalf of Ms. Juliana Knapp here. And that, that is Ms. Knapp? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Would you like me to spell my name for you? Sure. Thank you. Sure. Um, M A N D A N A 
last name Divan Beki, D-I-V-A-N-B-E-I-K-I. Sorry, so long, <laughs> Divan Beki. <laughs> Okay, so um, at this time, um, I'm sure you're, both you and your um, client are aware of the process since you just watched one of these hearings. And, um, and so if you, have, um, if, she would, if you have preliminary comments you wish to make, if she wishes to direct, address the commission directly, please do so. And then um, I presume that she'll make herself available for questions. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I would like to start, there are several issues with the decision of the board, and I'd like to start with that, if that's okay. Okay, so um, I know they base their decision on a statute and a gaming rule. Uh, I apologize if I'm a little all over the place. It's my first time doing this. <laughs> Sorry about that. But it's, um, they, the decision is based on NRS 463.33512C. And um, I find that a little overbroad in this case, uh, especially since the reasoning in the decision was based on the fact, um, alleged statements that Ms. Knapp made during the telephonic interview she had with the agent, Agent Tarkelson. And uh, I'm not sure if there was a misunderstanding of what was stated by Ms. Knapp or if uh, she couldn't communicate her statements well. I do have information on information and belief. I do, I do know that Ms. Knapp had a mouth surgery prior to that interview. And so some of the conversation might have been muffled. But aside from that, and I have documentation here if, uh, if you would like to see that that she did have her mouth surgery at the time before the interview, um, between the incident and the interview. And um, the other point that I would like to make, which is more to the point, is that at the interview, she allegedly stated that she knew Mr. Hanna was the person who actually won the jackpot when she never admitted that. Um, she did state that clearly at the previous hearing that was held with another attorney from our office, Ms. Shauna Bachman. Uh, however, we don't have any transcript of this interview, no transcript of the hearing, um, and we don't have the surveillance video to look at, but I've spoken with my client, and uh, I do know that she is telling the truth, so I'm led to believe that there must have been a miscommunication, a misunderstanding there. She did admit that uh, this event occurred, that Mr. Hanna was the person who won the jackpot. She did not admit that she actually knew that at the time of the incident. And I have information that Ms. Knapp actually called Ms. Davis, who was the co-worker who was off duty during that um, during the incident and who had won a jackpot that same day, the morning of, and who had come to the counter and who had given her ID and information. And uh, Ms. Knapp then filled out the document, the W2G form, and gave it back to Ms. Davis. Ms. Davis was the person who already won a jackpot earlier that day. However, that's not in the decision here. Um, that's just something when I spoke to Ms. Knapp, that is information that I received from her. And so um, there was no reason for Ms. Knapp to actually have any information, have any indication, have any knowledge, have any, uh, anything that would indicate that she knew that Mr. Hanna was the person who won that particular jackpot. Also, two people could play on the same system. Ms. Knapp was just behind the counter. She didn't actually look at the slot machine that Mr. Hanna or Ms. Davis were playing on, allegedly. And um, so two people could play uh, on the same machine and they could go back and forth. And there's nowhere in the, I don't have any information on the policies of Dottie's policies. However, I know from Ms. Knapp that um, she would be the only person who would sign off on that W2G form. However, based on my research of the rules in other jurisdictions and in Nevada, for any uh, jackpot payout that is above two hundred, sorry, that is above twelve hundred dollars, you have to have three people signing off on that. You have to have the verifier. You have to have the person uh, in Miss Knapp's position signing off on it. The verifier and uh, the supervise the supervisor for that. Um, uh, for that department. So, and we don't have any signatures to that. And based on information that I received from Ms. Knapp and that uh, she has a history of being at Dottie's for six and a half years, that never happened. 
She was the only one signing off these forms. And she never saw actually a name of a person who won anything. The machine was there, but she was not in front of the machine. It would have been Mr. Wandemu who would have seen that since he was on the floor. And Miss Davis was off duty and she could play um, because it had been over eight hours after her shift. And that was the policy. Sorry if I confused. Well, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You don't want to waste anyone's time. Um, I could yeah. get into more detail. I, you know, um, I would suggest that if you, you know, we're, we don't limit the legal arguments or the commentary by the uh, client. Um, so if you, if you feel like you need to elaborate on anything, you certainly can. I'm, I'm still back. Okay. I mean, to be honest with you, for being frank, I'm still back at 463.335 12C being vague. I, I don't know what's talking about. Are you challenging the statute? Are you saying the facts here don't apply to the statute? Like, I don't even know what that meant. So I'm way, I apologize. <laughs> way back. So, okay. Uh, Yes, I know the commission will want to hear from your client. At least maybe maybe I speak only for myself, but I'll want to hear from your client. Um, but and if they have if they're way ahead of me and they are completely clear on everything you just said, then I guess you'll do the the special tutorial just for me. <laughs> but you're going to have to be a little uh, you're going to have to break it up a little more. And you're going to have to explain to me how NRS 463.335 subsection 12 C is vague in this instance. Like, what are you talking about there? And then we can kind of move to your points, if, if you don't mind, if you could break it up a little bit. Not at all. I apologize about that. I wanted to just make a brief explanation of everything altogether. And then uh, thank you for the opportunity to break it down. So if you look at the statute on 12 C, well, 12, it reads the board may suspend or object to the registration of an applicant as a gaming employee for any cause deemed reasonable by the board. Um, the board may object to or suspend the registration if the applicant has, goes to seek, committed, attempted, or conspired to commit any crime of moral turpitude, embezzlement, larceny, or theft, or any violation of any law pertaining to gaming, or any crime which is inimical to the declared policy of the state concerning gaming. Um, and that's all the 12C states. So what I mean by the statute being overbroad in this case, as it pertains to the facts of our case. Okay. Uh-oh. So did I come? Okay. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, so the, if you read the 12C closely, there is actually no crime that was committed here. Miss Knapp was never arrested. She was never accused of committing a crime. Uh, so and, and that is actually stated in the decision itself from the board. The other issue I have with this is th that makes this overbroad is when it says or any violation of any law pertaining to gaming. And and then the decision that we have um, quotes 5.011 of the Gaming Commission regulation. And if we if we look at 5.011, and I'm looking at the decision itself. Sorry, one moment, please. OK, there we go. On page, well, number three, where it says relevant event. Roman numeral three of the decision, page two of the decision that says relevant event. Um, on the third sentence, regulation 5.0111A, first of all, there's no 1A, there's just one. Um, I'm not sure if they, they mean to cite to this one. If, if they meant to cite to 5.0111 and not like a 9A or some, something else, then um, it reads failure to exercise discretion and sound judgment to prevent incidents, which might reflect on the repute of the state of Nevada and act as a detriment to the development of the industry. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> a lot is going on there and a lot of uh, interpretations can come out of this one sentence that is in 5.0111. Uh, I'm not sure what this means. If, if, if it means that she didn't, Ms. Knapp did not allegedly exercise discretion and sound judgment to prevent incidents, which might reflect on the repute of the state of Nevada 
and act as detriment to development of the industry. It is uh, not factual. It's not based on substantial evidence here because um, I don't see any evidence in this de decision that 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 is actually something that I can look at and go, okay, yeah, Miss Snap actually lied about this event, or. Um, I'm not sure the statute seems to be overbroad when as it relates to 5.011. Okay, but you do understand being so general that it doesn't cover anything specific. You're you're kind of mishmashing all these arguments together. So let's break them up, shall we? So so as it goes to 463.335 subsection 12c when you say overbroad, um what you're really saying is there wasn't sufficient evidence of a crime and that 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 the uh finding here um is not appropriate under that statute you're not saying this that there's a statute that there's some failure in the statute or that it's you know because we don't we don't make constitutional determinations here and so if you're going to make a constitutional challenge to a gaming regulation you'll need to go somewhere else to do that Okay. Here, we just need to talk about the facts and the regulations that apply, unless the deputy attorney general tells me I'm wrong and that we have, the, you know, we undertake, you know, vagueness and overbroad and challenges to um, to um, due process challenges to not giving reasonable notice and opportunity to understand the nature of the, um, you know, basis for the discipline then we're just going to talk about how the facts apply to the statute unless she tells me I'm wrong which she's going to she's going to jump up any minute and tell me one way or another you are not wrong chair okay so you are stuck with the statute and the and the regulation before us and so are we so what we so I would just ask you and I'll guide you a little bit to assist us and your client to focus more on how the facts you know you always have the ability if there's an adverse outcome to go challenge the regulation in court and get you know relief there but here we we have to we abide by the statute and and the regulation and 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 if your argument is more focused on how the facts don't meet those here then that's something we entertain um i just I don't mean to cut you off but you can you could go on all day about the over broadness of the regulation and there's <laughs> nothing in, if, if, if every one of these people agreed with you it wouldn't matter because we're not here to address that today we have to have public you know we, we don't we don't so I'm just trying to help you I know I'm not trying Thank to be critical if that makes sense do I make sense right now because <laughs> it's been a long day yes, for you make sense. <laughs> okay okay um so I didn't mean to interrupt you please please if you could you know Keep that in mind and 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 go ahead. Apologize. Oh no, thank you. Thank you so much for making that clear. Um, well, so the facts of the case are that that they, they don't apply here. Is that Miss Knapp actually did not commit any crime here? She did not uh, uh, violate any rules of the establishment either. So um, she was fired, and the other two coworkers with her were fired as well. However, she's the only one who lost her license. And um, it is very odd because the person who would have seen the name of the winner of the um, jackpot would have been the person who works on the floor, which was Mr. Wandemu, Salamawit Wandemu, who's mentioned in the decision. And um, it would not be Miss Snap who was behind the counter. She was just given IDs. So, and then the decision goes on to state that uh, Mr. Hannah comes to Miss Snap and shows his ID, but it's actually for a different reason. It's to get a gaming card. And and a few minutes later, about three minutes later, the decision states that um, uh, Miss Davis, Miss Jasmine Davis, who was Miss Snap's coworker, who was off duty at the time, comes to the counter, gives her ID, and um, you know tries to get the payout for the jackpot. And that's all that was that was done there. And the decision of the board, though, gives the reasoning that Miss Snap should have at least known that just because um, Mr. Hannah walks over, gives his ID, and a few minutes later, Miss Davis walks up and gives her ID, Miss Snap should have just known that it was Mr. Hannah who won the jackpot and not Miss Davis. That is neither here nor there. There is no, uh, and as the decision points, there is no uh, sound 
to the surveillance video, but I have spoken with Miss Knapp and she never admitted to knowing that Mr. Hanna was the person who won the jackpot. In fact, Mr. Hanna frequented that establishment and Miss Davis was with Mr. Hanna apparently playing this slot machine. And Mr. Hanna allegedly was using Miss Davis's money. However, all of these facts were only known to Miss Knapp after the incident when she spoke with Miss Davis. So um, I don't know what happened at the interview. I wasn't there, but I did talk to Miss Knapp, my client. And uh, if anything was taken out of context, such as uh, I'm not arguing that she likely said these statements, however, not in the same sense that she actually admitted to knowing them at the time of the incident or admitted to any crime. And since then, she's been very adamant, too, that she never admitted to any crime. And um, so those are the facts before you at this time. But if you have any other questions, I welcome them at this time. Um, before we have questions, uh, can we... Or, or if you intend to have your client uh, speak directly to the commission, can we do that now so that we can then move to questions? Yes. Um, I, would I mean, you don't have to. Advice. I'm just telling you that if she wants to, now is the time. Would you like to speak? Uh, Miss Knapp would just have to slow down because she, she seems to talk really fast and sometimes okay. I get confused on what's going on. Well, coming on, so. from you, that means she's really, really fast. <laughs> so let's. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> I thought well, I was slow. <laughs> I just thought to myself, the court reporter is probably ready to pass out right now. Um, okay, so if you could keep in mind, believe it or not, but there's someone you can't see taking everything down. So um, go ahead and and uh, let us know what you'd like us to know at this time. My name is Juliana Knapp, K N A P P. I just wanted to, you guys to know that I never admitted to any crime I did. I didn't do anything wrong. I was at work. I, it was a normal day. We were busy, really busy. Um, Miss Jasmine was there all day playing. She had hit a couple jackpots earlier that evening. So it was like a normal thing. When she comes up and hands me her ID, I processed the jackpot. And that's all I did. I had my coworker, which was Salam. She worked on the floor, which she would have saw the machine. I was behind the counter. Okay, at this time, um, I'm going to, unless you have anything to add, counsel, I'm going to go ahead and yes. have the uh, commissioners ask questions. Do you have anything to add? Um, yes, I just wanted to make it a record that Ms. Uh, Knapp has been doing this for over 35 years, as it states in the decision, and she has never had even a single infraction. So on her record, as somebody with a license, uh, as somebody with a license in the gaming industry. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess I'll start with Vice Chair uh, Solis Rainey. Thank you, Ms. Knapp. Uh, thank you both for being here. And uh, Ms. Stephen, I'm going to butcher your name. <laughs> You're fine. Ivan uh, Becky. Ivan <laughs> Becky. Um, I appreciate your enthusiasm. This is a little bit different than a court proceeding. And, yes. um, you know, we, we we're confined to the to the record that is before us. You can't Add like new um, facts or evidence. You were talking something about the W2G, you know, having more than more than one signature in that on the form. That those are all things that were that are new, um, you know, to today. That wasn't oh. raised during her hearing, and that the the record that we're reviewing is the the hearing record, so it's closed. You can't add new um, facts, if you will. You were. And I'm referring to that. Uh, let me back up. Um, Ms. Knapp, you've been doing this a long time. On the W2G, yes. are you saying that there's more than one signature that you? I sign and the, and the winner signs it. Right. And that is there, that's all that's on the form, correct? Right. I was speaking of the rule of the policy. Sorry. Sorry? I, I wasn't, I, I thought I wasn't giving new evidence. It's just uh, the rule policy that I studied is that if, if somebody wins more than twelve hundred dollars in a jackpot and they're getting a payout um there's supposed to be at least three signatures on there did you look at the form um no okay there's no room for more. the form doesn't have it that doesn't mean dotties is actually complying with the law so no the it's a irs form. oh so dotties didn't create the form it's a form that the irs issues 
So I read that in the rules from the Nevada Gaming Commission regulations. It's yeah. sorry. Did you cite us to the regulation you're referring to? Uh, no, unfortunately. Apologize. Mm, not at this time. Sorry. Thank you. And Ms. Snap, is on, on the system that you use, this happened at Dottie's, correct? Correct. Okay. At the system that you used, was there something behind the bar that kind of flagged who which player's card was in? A machine? Yes, it does. And it was okay. Ms. Jasmine's on there. Okay. Did you, did you look at the card after that? That's the only card that you saw inserted into the machine, correct? It comes up on the Konami, and she hands me her um, her driver's license, and I make copies of those. Right, but on the Konami, when it shows which player's card was inserted, does it allow you to see the it's players? A, it said Jasmine Davis on there. I understand that at, at some point it said that. Does it have a history of it, or does, is, does it only show you the name that's there? Only the name. Okay. All right. Um, I just wanted to confirm because on the record, although, uh, you know, I, I, I know that you did have access to at least what name was in there at any given point. So if you looked at it after she switched, the cards were switched out on the surveillance, um, but you wouldn't have had knowledge of that at that moment. You right. would have only seen the final no, one would, that was in there. No. Um, so. And I did want to address a point that you made. I don't, again, I mean, that's, it's not a fact that's in the record, so I don't know that it matters, but Miss um, Knapp was terminated from Dottie's as were the other two employees. Uh, I don't know on what basis you're indicating that the other two people did lose their license. The reason that it came up with Miss Knapp is once she applied for another job and started working at another job, when she registered, you have to update your registration. When she registered, the board objected at that point. If the other people have not applied, at that point, at, at any given point, then you know they may not. You, they, it doesn't mean they're not going to be treated exactly the same. Okay. I just don't know what the circumstances are, and that's not part of the record. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, thank you. Um, just for the record. Um, yeah. Let me go back to the actual. Ms. Knapp, during the, your actual um, the hearing, uh, it says that um, you know you maintained that you didn't know about Hannah being the original winner, but you testified that you were only told by the slot floor, floor person. Is that the uh, is that the woman's Solange that you indicated? Yes, it is. Okay, that they told you that uh, Davis was the winner, so you didn't know that because Davis handed you the ID. That... Um, yes, Davis handed me her ID at the counter. But you told them that you believe that she was the winner because somebody told you that. Is that not the case? That's not the case now. Is that how it goes down? You got to match the ID along on the Konami. It has that person's name on there. And, and so I. That was your it. testimony. So I'm just asking oh, okay. you about it. Uh, you know that that you were told that that was the case. Um, <clears throat> sorry, can I? And I'm sorry, just getting, can you uh, just give me a second? With respect to the Konami Miss Snap, uh, you indicated during your testimony that you could not recall if Hannah or Davis's name was shown on the slot system. No, I always said it was Jasmine. I even told our security that when they questioned me. You testified that you didn't know which one it was and that you had the authority to change the name on the slot machine anyways to reflect the identification that you were provided. No. I do not. Uh, I don't have any further questions. Yes. Commissioner Cohen. First, your, your counsel, valiant effort. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you violated way too many 
internal rules. Uh, I'm not going to get caught up, you know, in, in the NRS criminal statute. You were presented with two different IDs. What's the first thing you should have done if this jackpot was on the up and up when you're presented with two, two conflicting IDs? You ever thought about calling Gaming Control Board enforcement? The two IDs you're talking about, one was for a game, they wanted a copy of their, of their card, their player's card, and that's what Hannah wanted. And Jasmine's ID was for the jackpot. That, that's really out there. So you have a person who's playing the machine, hit, hits, a, hits a jackpot. He has an expired ID. That's the first thing when you have an expired ID, you cannot complete a W2G. Right. You hold the money, you call gaming, you call enforcement, and until they come in with, with uh, an ID that is acceptable under the IRS code, so you violate it there. And then we get into this, you know, the $300 tip, and we get into he said, she said, you violated way too many rules and regulations of your employer for, for at least where I'm sitting to go ahead and say, Oh, she's a she. No, she deserves her card back. Let's give her another chance. You, you violated one of the worst things you could do in your position, which is pay the wrong person with intent. You, you're not going to convince me otherwise. I'm sorry. You know that. that anyway, but but thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Chair Tagliati. May I ask, add just one thing? Just yes. Okay. Uh, and just for the record, Miss um, Knapp, the. I guess the statement that you made that Mr. Hanna provided you his ID in order to get his player's card, that's just not credible to me. It, Go ahead. No, he didn't hand it to me. He handed it to Salam, and Salam handed it to me to make a copy of the player's card. Okay. That isn't credible when the surveillance tape indicates that Mr. Hanna's had his player's card, and he had it in the machine. I wouldn't have saw that. I wasn't on the floor. Okay. So she can't see any, Ms. Knapp cannot see anything that's on the machine. It, that's only for the person who's on the floor. Um, but as to Commissioner Cohen's comments, I appreciate that. However, uh, there is no intent. There's no proof of intent. Uh, intent is not just, you know, because somebody said from an interview that this statement was made allegedly, which was not under oath, by the way. And I know this is not a court proceeding, so I can't argue it's admissible or not, but it's basically hearsay. And I have to believe that that person is telling the truth. And uh, we came here with good faith that uh, there must have been a misunderstanding. There must have been a miscommunication of some kind, because even if we had the surveillance video today, it would clearly show that she is not culpable of any crime here. Of you know, of mixing up IDs. Hannah comes to the counter with an ID to do something completely different than getting a payout for a jackpot win. So why would she assume that she's actually get there to get a payout and go ahead and proceed with the IRS procedures and make a copy of it, call for someone else to pay him what, pay him what? He's not asking for money. He's not saying he won a jackpot. It's Miss Davis who comes three minutes later uh, and says, you know, I want a jackpot. I need my money and gets the payout. So th there is no, she's not an investigator. Her job duty is not to investigate the situation to figure out if th th this person is telling the truth or not. All she has is what's in front of her. And what was in front of her was Miss Davis's name. And the W2G form is was for Miss Davis. And we're bound by the record. I've heard enough. Okay, counsel, we're going to move thank on you. to questioning of your client without interruption now. Okay. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. Questioning for the client? Ms. Knapp, yes. uh, as you understand, we're bound by the record before. So any information that I've heard from your counsel or from you that's inconsistent with the four corners of the record before me, I'm not able to consider. So to the extent, extent you're changing your story today, I'm bound by the record. Um, is it true or not that you represented at any time that a man had hit a jackpot but was using a day shift bartender Davis's money? Yes or no? Did you ever make that representation? Yes, I did. It was Davis. They were gambling together. Did you ever um, tell anybody that Davis used her ID because the man's ID was expired? Yes or no? No. Okay, this is the record before me. This is your statement. 
Davis told you there was going to be a $300 tip, which you thought was cool. Did you ever make that statement to anyone? No. Okay. Well, this is the information I have before me on the record, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And I don't see um, the ambiguity under NRS 463-335-12C because it's clear that it talks about committed, attempted, or conspired to commit any crime of moral turpitude, embezzlement, larceny, or theft, or any violation of any law pertaining to gaming or any crime which is inimical to the declared policy of the state concerning gaming. I understand three people were terminated, yes or no? Yes. I am simply not comfortable at this time based on your testimony and your responses. I don't think you're forthcoming. I think there are way too many inconsistencies. I might have um, viewed you differently had you come clean and consistent with the record. But the record I have before me is so different from what I'm hearing from your attorney and counsel zealous advocacy. I appreciate it, but it's not helping based on the record. So I might have gone a different direction in terms of how I might have advised you in connection with today's proceeding because the record is so disparate from what I'm hearing today. And so I'm simply not comfortable overruling the um, recommendation and I, I'm inclined to sustain, but I'm happy to hear from my fellow commissioners and my chair to the extent I'm missing something. Commissioner Keekeffer, anything? Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I, I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Okay, um, I I'm not I'm going to make a comment, which is I I appreciate the hearsay suggestion. You know, first of all, this is in a courtroom, and there the rules of evidence are you know um, relaxed in these proceedings. But when when it's the opposing party's com, uh, statement, it's not hearsay by its definition. It's non hearsay. So that's just not a, a very compelling analysis. Um, but let's just set that aside for a second. Um, unfortunately, you know, this dental, this is, you know, misunderstood. I don't even understand. I don't know the argument. Is it that she misstated, was misunderstood because her mouth was swollen or she was under some medication that caused her to not know what she was saying? It's just not compelling in any event. And so um, I'm inclined to sustain. And if it's right for a vote at this time, um, I would entertain uh, someone making a motion. Thank you, Chair Togliati. I would move to sustain the objection of the name of the one. Any discussion on the motion? There being none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm sorry, ma'am, it's unanimous. The uh, It's been sustained. You can, uh, I think you heard from before, one year from today, uh, you can seek to address this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Madam Thank Secretary, you. next agenda item, please. Your last gaming employee registration appeal item is Babik Razihi Shivashvan, case number 21LB09272. Hi, my name is Bobak Razagi Shishawan. Uh, I'm 44 years old and I'm single. I live with my father. He is like 92 years old and, uh, and I'm taking care of him. Uh, sorry, I got... I've been working as a poker dealer since 2014 for the or say it's a poker and golden nugget. And in last October, they told me your registration is canceled and I appealed and then they told me you can, uh, and I went to the interview and they say, uh, um, sorry, my English is not perfect. Uh, Your English is good. We understand. Thank it's you. Just fine. Thank you. Uh, they told me you can appeal, and I uh, appeal, and this is my first time here. Um, and back in uh, in 2018, 
I was out of my medication. I'm uh, diagnosed with bipolar disorder, depression. And I stopped my medication and I was using marijuana. And uh, I was thinking that's good for me. And I continued and it made me a <clears throat> different person. And it wasn't me and I was uh, like, coming for some crime on that time. And uh, I did multiple crimes and they arrest me. Uh, but I'm right now in probation since 2020 and uh, mental health court, which is they gave me a counselor. I have a counselor um, every week I'm talking and my graduation, it's gonna be on June 2nd this year. And I just wanna say I was like a different person on that time and it wasn't me. And But most of my cases, uh, yeah, I have like three, four cases which is one of them a misdemeanor. The other one is a gross misdemeanor. Uh, they say they're gonna dismiss the case after your probation and 18 months it's over for my mental health court and my graduation on June 2nd. Uh, my probation officer said, as, as long as you finish your 18 months, uh, I'm gonna write a letter to the court to finish your uh, probation. But my cases is dismissed. Uh, I have like one uh, gross misdemeanor violation for uh, protection order and uh, the other one attempt for ext extortion, which is they are the gross misdemeanor, but uh, um, Two of the agents of the FBI called me last year. They said, we need your help about one person, which is she is from Iraq and I know her. If you cooperate, probably we dismiss your case. And I talked with my lawyer and my lawyer said, uh, if you cooperate with these people, your case is gonna be dismissed. Uh, that's all information and I'm sorry I did. And this is the only job I have every year for the World Series of Poker, which has helped me for my, pay my rent and my other things. I have a job, I am working now. Uh, that helps me a lot for um, my uh, rent and some of the uh, other bills. And sir? it helps also for my safe. I'm sorry. Sir, I'm going to go first. Um, just because um, I'm very familiar with mental health court. Um, I used to be a judge on that bench. I used to be the chief judge and assign mental health court, hear mental health court, participate in mental health court, um, deal with the budget for mental health. There's nothing about mental health court, I don't know. And what I do know is that is a very intensive program and while I applaud you that you may be released from it in June, that gives you very little track record off that super intensive program. And I'm not comfortable with your record and knowing you're in mental health court, not sustaining this. For me, this is the easiest decision I'm gonna make today. And I'm sorry if that upsets you and you know this is an emotional thing and you're trying to get your life back together and you're doing well, but you need some unsupervised, unstructured time to declare yourself, in my opinion. But I'm gonna open it up to my fellow commissioners so that they can be heard, starting with Vice Chair Solis Rainey, if she has anything. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Vers How do you spell uh, Rasagi. it? Rasagi. Rasagi Shishman? Yes. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, I also commend your participation in mental health court. I know it's not easy, um, but I, agree with Judge Tagliati, it's important that we see that you can maintain the same uh, level of um, compliance with your 
your medication protocol and with your counseling and such when you're not being mandated by a court to do that. So while it's commendable that you're doing it now, and I think it's great and encourage you to continue, I think we would like to see a period of time when you're doing that without the court supervision. So although I would be inclined to sustain the objection at this point, it's important that you maintain what you're doing, all the good things that you're doing so that you can build that record and you know, possibly come back at a later time. So how long do I have time to come Well, wait one second, we're not here yet. <laughs> yeah. We haven't made a decision. Yeah, we haven't made a decision. That's just my opinion. And, and I wanted to just stress that, you know, it's important. What you're doing is terrific. And I'm glad the mental health court is out there because I think a lot of citizens could benefit from it. But it's important that we see that you can do it on your own also. So for that reason, we haven't voted, we haven't decided, but assuming we, we didn't vote your way, you would have to wait a minimum of one year from today to ask for reconsideration. But we still, you know, everybody still needs to weigh in and then we'll sure. vote, okay? Thank you. I concur with my colleagues. Commissioner Brown, do you have any comments or questions? Keep up the hard work. Um, I, I'm really happy to hear you talk to us openly and be honest with us and tell us you were going through a hard time. And um, to the extent we vote um, the way I think we are going to vote, I do hope you don't give up and you keep going. And I look forward to hearing a good report from you in a year if you choose to come back um, to the extent that's how the vote goes so we can be proud of you and, and move forward. And I, I, wish you, I wish you luck. Thank you for your time. Commissioner Keekeffer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I agree. It's just too soon. Uh, but thank you. Um, good luck. Thank you. Does anyone have a motion? Thank you, Chair Tagliati. I would move to sustain the objection on Mr. Rosagi's to uh, gaming card. Uh, thank you. Is there any discussion on the motion? No. There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, was there anyone opposed? Sir, it appears that you have, uh, if you wish to seek a review of this in a year, you may do so, but for now we're sustaining, meaning we agree with the board's decision. But we do appreciate your professionalism and courtesy Thank and you. waiting seven hours to talk to us. And we, we Thank respect you so that. Much. Thank you. So for next year, I have to call commissioner and- Yes, you will put, you'll go through a process to put it on for a meeting. And you, you will call the commission and they will help you with the deadline. If you're too early, they'll tell you. And if you're, uh, it has to be a year from today. Okay, thank you so much. So sorry thank you waited you. so long. Thank you for your patience. We appreciate your time. Okay, I would like to bring to the attention of the commission um, a recording issue. Our recorder is going to, is, it becomes unavailable in about seven minutes. So um, I've been discussing with, uh, the Deputy Attorney General, um, our options. And I believe, and I'd like to inquire of her now, if I know it's being recorded on, you know, YouTube, for YouTube, um, what are your thoughts as far as continuing um, past five o'clock? Chair, just as long as um, the meeting is continued, is, is recorded, okay so if the court reporter needs to um, sign off at five as long as the meeting is still being recorded via youtube um, there are no issues okay according to um it it is being recorded so we do have that record okay do any of the commissioners uh have any issues are you comfortable going forward uh past five i, I anticipate we'll be going past five o'clock with just that recording are you all okay with that Yes, absolutely. I don't think this reg is going to take very long. Okay. Well, we also have a couple little other items. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So, uh, Madam Secretary, the next agenda item, please. Next for your consideration are proposed amendments to the Nevada Administrative Code regarding live entertainment tax, as noted on the agenda. Okay. Um, uh, Senior Dag Magal, can you please state your name for the record? Uh, yes, good afternoon, uh, members of the commission, Madam Secretary, um, Chair Pagliotti. For the record, I'm Senior Deputy Attorney General Ed McGaw, here today to present the proposed amendments to 
NRS or Chapter 368A of the Nevada Administrative Code. This addresses the Nevada Live Entertainment Tax. I will speak very fast. Forgive me. These draft um, amendments oh, have been don't addressed. don't speak oh. very fast. Our court re our oh. court reporter is shot. <laughs> court, okay. Court, don't do that to her. We we're good to go. Okay. Please don't do that to her. Okay. Just okay. Speak. I will talk Floor. my normal rate. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, these draft amendments have been assigned the Legislative Council Bureau file number R029-21. If the, if the commission approves them today, they will be sent to the Legislative Council Bureau and placed on the Legislative Commission agenda. Once approved by the Legislative Commission, the amendments will become effective. To create a brief record, I'll quickly go through the changes. Section one amends 368A.510 to reduce the number of copies of certain internal audit reports that must be submitted to the board from the two down to one. And section two repeals NAC 368A.460, which requires certain information be printed on admission tickets or posted at the place of sale of the admission this provision was rendered moot by the legislature when it removed the statutory requirements for this information in Senate Bill 7 of the 2021 legislative session. With that, I conclude my presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, um, I'm advised that now is the time that we must allow for any public comment. And so at this time, we're happy to hear comments of the public as well as any other comments of the commissioners. Um, comments of the public will be limited to three minutes as a reasonable time, place, and manner restriction. Uh, if any questions are asked of the member of the public, um, that would not uh, reduce the time of the three minutes. So at this time, I'll go to Carson City. Is there? Can you tell me if there's anyone present in Carson City to uh, speak to this matter? There is no one in Carson City. Okay. How about Las Vegas? There is no one here in Las Vegas. All right, then that closes the public comment section on um, on this matter. So uh, I'll go to my uh, fellow commissioners um, to ask any questions you uh, wish to ask. Perfect. Uh, Senior Dag McGaw, I just had a quick question, uh, just procedurally. I think this is the first one I've seen where it's a LCB draft. So when we take act on this, like move to adopt it, are we moving to adopt it? Or are we moving to recommend adoption by the LCB? Uh, you would be moving to adopt it. Okay. And then the Ledge Commission, once they approve your adoption, I guess would be a way to phrase it. Okay, but so it would be effective when they approve it. Yeah, they are basically need to do one final review. And it, it is Perfect. Thank possible. you so much. I just hadn't seen one. Perfect. Anybody else? It doesn't seem too controversial to me. Thank you. It's for a change. All right. All right. I think then it's in proper form for a motion. Uh, thank you, Chair Togliatti. I would move for approval of the revised proposed regulation uh, with LCB file number R029-21 uh, as uh, presented in the draft dated April 12, 2022 to be effective upon action by the LCB. All right, any discussion on the motion? There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, it appears there are none opposed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda, if they're still there, are the administrative reports. Let's start with, Chair. is Chair Gibson still there? I can't see, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Chief Hoffman here, I'm covering for him. He had to step out. Okay. And he just, he just wanted me to let you know that uh, we're gonna have a one day uh, June board meeting on June 8th. We have seven non-restricted items. None of them are too controversial. Um, new casino opening up in Sparks, which is great. Uh, and then we have 14 restricted items, just one minor area of concern. Uh, restricted will start, is scheduled to start at 11 a.m. And um, is that because of the seven non-restricted? Yes, it looks like the uh, non-restricted is pretty light, so we're we're starting restricted. We have the uh, we want the option of starting restricted earlier. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I appreciate it. Anything from uh, the attorney general's office today? Nothing today, chair. Thank you. Okay, Madam Secretary, let's close with our last agenda item: public comments. 
Um, and I can go ahead. This item is placed on the agenda to give the public an opportunity to comment on gaming related matters. I'll first go to Carson City. Anyone wishing to make a public comment, please step forward to the podium. No one's there, correct? Correct. Anyone in Las Vegas? No one in Las Vegas. All right, that will close our public comment section. This concludes the Nevada Gaming Commission meeting for the month of May. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Madam Secretary, can you can you call me so that we can talk about the orders? Um, since I'm normally there to sign them and I'm not signing them now. Absolutely. Is there a possibility right the vice chair could sign them on my behalf or should I, should you, we make other arrangements? I can also use your electronic signature if you um, approve me to do so. I approve you to do so. I will do that and forward you copies once of what I have signed on your behalf. Okay, thank, thanks for being willing, vice chair. <laughs> Thanks, guys.